April 1941. In a field in western Ukraine, a satisfied Soviet pilot counted bullet holes in the aircraft he'd just shot down. The twin-engine German aircraft had civilian markings, but the military bearing of the pilots was obvious. The smell of burning plastic was further cause for suspicion. It came from a smoldering pile of photographic film, which the Germans had hurriedly tried to destroy. In the spring of 1941, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were allies, but everyone knew it could not last. German reconnaissance aircraft flying 33,000 feet above the Soviet Union usually passed unnoticed. But on the 15th of April 1941, engine trouble forced one Junkers 86 to lose altitude. It was quickly intercepted and shot down. Under interrogation, the Junkers pilots said they'd lost their way flying to Krakow in German-occupied Poland. It wasn't very convincing. They'd been shot down near Rovno, more than 200 miles from Krakow, deep inside the Soviet Union. The pilots were from the elite Rovell High Altitude Reconnaissance Squadron. They had been secretly photographing Soviet territory for months in preparation for the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Ten days later, a top-secret report arrived in Moscow from Major General Tupikov, the Soviet military attaché in Berlin. His report made two conclusions. Number one, the Germans are planning war with the Soviet Union. Number two, they plan to attack soon, definitely before the end of the year. In the spring of 1941, neither Tupikov nor other Soviet agents could say exactly when the German invasion would come. Stalin's best spy, Richard Sorgier, had claimed that the invasion would begin around March, after the harvest was sown. Then, he said, the end of May. When that passed, he said the second half of June. The reports from Soviet agents were confused and contradictory. In short, no one in Moscow was certain if or when the Germans would invade. In later years, it was rumored that the German invasion plans were on Stalin's desk almost as soon as they were signed. But in reality, no such plans were stolen. Masses of information was received from the Soviet intelligence network, but only a few reports received proper analysis. Many valuable ones got lost in the Soviet bureaucracy. Five months earlier, in December 1940, Hitler had issued Führer Directive 21. It ordered German forces to prepare for the invasion of the Soviet Union. Codename, Operation Barbarossa. Now, German troops were streaming eastwards, taking up position along the Soviet frontier. Hitler would later claim that the Red Army had been massed along the border, poised to invade Germany. Thus, he claimed Operation Barbarossa was a preemptive strike, a legitimate act of self-defense. But this was classic Nazi propaganda. Hitler wanted others, particularly in the neutral countries, to believe his invasion was justified. But few were fooled. In private, Hitler was more candid about his reasons for invading the USSR. It is only the possibility of Russia entering the war, he said, that now gives the English hope. If that hope is ruined, the English would have to make peace. Operation Barbarossa was an ambitious invasion plan, relying on the blitzkrieg tactics that had proved so effective against the French and British the previous year. The attack was to be spearheaded by four panzer groups. Their tank and motorized infantry divisions would seek to make rapid advances deep into enemy territory, leading to the encirclement and destruction of enemy armies on the frontier. The four panzer groups were commanded by generals von Kleist, Herpner, Guderian and Hoth. The ultimate goal was the capture of Moscow and the whole of European Russia. 
German strategists believed that their military superiority would lead to victory in three to four months. For the invasion, German forces were divided into three formations. Army Group North was to advance towards Leningrad. Army Group Center towards Moscow. And Army Group South towards Kiev and the Donetsk Basin. Army Groups North and South each had one Panzer Group. Army Group Center had two, including 3rd Panzer Group, commanded by Hoth. Colonel General Hermann Hoth had distinguished himself in the campaigns against Poland and France. He was 56 years old and referred to affectionately by his soldiers as Papa Hoth. Unlike Russia, where many senior officers had been killed in political purges, Germany could call on a wealth of experienced commanders. Most Soviet generals were in their 40s. In contrast, Guderian was 53, Herpner 55, and von Kleist 60. Panzer Group command staffs arrived at the Soviet frontier during the winter of 1940. At first, only staff officers and signal troops were sent. The tanks were not to arrive until the very eve of the attack. By keeping his tanks in the west, Hitler wanted it to look like he still planned to invade Britain and prepared only defensive operations in the east. And so, an invasion army quietly assembled on Russia's doorstep. In 1941, the Wehrmacht was at the height of its power. Its divisions had been brought to full strength. Morale was high after victory in the west. The last few months had been spent in intensive training for blitzkrieg operations. In contrast, the Red Army was dispersed across the Soviet Union, with many of its units still at peacetime strength. The forces at the border spent much of their time listening to political lectures. It would take two or three weeks of redeployment to properly reinforce them. And there was little preparation for defence. After all, the Red Army always expected to attack. Furthermore, Stalin was in no rush to fight a war against Nazi Germany. He knew the Soviet Union was not ready. In 1939, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union had signed an alliance. But Stalin harbored no illusions. Intensive military construction was underway in the USSR. The Red Army had grown from a strength of one and a half million troops to five million. In the summer of 1941, Soviet armed forces were still in the midst of reorganization and expansion. Fortifications were still being built, airfields overhauled, and new units formed. Until these preparations were complete, Stalin was desperate to stave off any conflict with Hitler's Germany. But the reports from Soviet intelligence were becoming more ominous. In early June 1941, the Germans started moving armoured and motorised divisions towards the frontier. This no longer looked like preparations for a defensive operation. Eight days before the invasion, the Soviet state news agency TASS printed a report in one of its newspapers. It read, in the British and foreign press in general, there are rumors circulating about an imminent war between the Soviet Union and Germany. Soviet official circles believe that these rumors are absolutely groundless. It was an invitation from Stalin to Hitler to settle their differences through negotiation. But in reply, there came only deathly silence. Stalin finally ordered reinforcements sent to the frontier. Even now, three days after the TASS message, Soviet spy Rikard Sogier reported the invasion has been delayed until the end of June. Stalin hoped once more that war could be put off. But it was too late. The invasion was now less than one week away. On the 22nd of June, the Red Army was formed in three echelons, stretching from Poland to the Dnieper River. Most Soviet troops were only just beginning to move west to face the Nazi threat. In contrast, German forces were massed on the frontier, ready to strike. 
At the start of the invasion, in the Baltic republics, 21 Soviet divisions would face 34 German divisions. In Bielorussia, 26 Red Army divisions faced 36 German divisions. In Ukraine, 45 Soviet divisions would meet 57 Wehrmacht divisions. The Red Army was outnumbered, and although it had more tanks and aircraft, they would prove to be of little value. On the 21st of June, German High Command transmitted the signal Dortmund. It confirmed Operation Barbarossa for the next morning. Tanks, armoured vehicles and trucks moved to jumping off positions. That evening, German officers summoned their men to read them a proclamation from Adolf Hitler to his troops. It declared, the fate of the German Reich is now in your hands. In the days to come, German soldiers were to be guided by directives such as those from General Herpner. Your struggle must pursue the objective of turning today's Russia into ruins and must be carried out with extreme severity. But not all soldiers wanted to be part of this so-called crusade for civilization. Sapper Alfred Liskov, a secret communist, made for the border. He crossed the Bug River and surrendered to Soviet border guards. Stammering with excitement, he told them at dawn the next day the Nazis would attack. Before the sapper was dry, his words were on their way to Stalin. Similar information came from a Soviet agent in the German embassy, Gerhard Kegel. On the morning of the 21st of June, he reported that the war would begin within 48 hours. In the Kremlin, General Zhukov, Marshal Timoshenko and General Vatutin managed to persuade Stalin that action was needed. A directive placed all troops in a state of readiness, but with a warning that the Germans may be trying to provoke them. The orders reached frontline units just after one o'clock in the morning. In Minsk, General Pavlov, commander of the Bielorussian military district, arrived at his headquarters in the middle of the night. Waiting for him was a report from the town of Grodno near the frontier. It read, ammunition has been distributed. We're taking up defensive positions. Commander of the Third Army, Vasily Kuznetsov. Vasily Ivanovich Kuznetsov had been conscripted to fight in the First World War. He later rose to command a rifle regiment in the Russian Civil War. When the Second World War began, he was 47 years old and would endure its hardships from the first day to the very last. The warnings about an invasion didn't surprise Kuznetsov. His troops had been listening to the roar of engines from across the border for many hours. It could mean only one thing. The first Germans to cross the border were from the Brandenburg Regiment, an elite German special forces unit. With a mixture of trickery, stealth and surprise, the German commandos secured key bridges across the Bug River. The Luftwaffe was already airborne. They were heading for major Soviet cities in the west and airfields identified by German air reconnaissance. The Soviet Air Force, its aircraft parked in neat rows, had no idea of what was about to hit it. As German pilots made their final approach, they were the first to see the sun rise on that fateful day. At 4 a.m., their bomb doors opened and destruction rained from the sky. Russia's great patriotic war had begun. Dawn 
on the 22nd of June 1941. Soviet airfields were under attack. One squadron commander, Captain Berkel, was quick to act, ringing the alarm and getting his men into the air as fast as possible. Where Soviet fighters did manage to get airborne, they found the unmaneuverable German dive bombers were easy prey. Milnov airfield in Ukraine became a graveyard for German bombers. Here, the German Edelweiss squadron lost seven aircraft. But these were token victories in a disastrous day for the Red Army Air Force. Some airfields survived the first German strikes, but then the Luftwaffe hit them again and again. In the course of five or six German air raids, most Soviet air bases in the West had been put out of action. In the air, although the Soviets had many good combat aircraft, their pilots lacked the combat experience of the Messerschmitt fighter pilots. Major General Kopitz, air commander of the Western Front, made an aerial inspection of the damage to his airfields. After landing, he shot himself. At the end of the first day, the Soviet Air Force had lost 700 aircraft in Belarusia, half its strength. In Ukraine, 300 planes were lost, one-sixth. And in the Baltic, about 100 planes, or one-tenth. The first German onslaught was overwhelming. The Red Army Air Force had been decimated. It would be many months before it was able to play its part effectively in the war. German ground troops began their advance at 4.15 a.m. Hoth tanks advanced between 50 and 70 kilometers on the Baltic front, capturing key bridges at Aliatusa and Makinia. Hoth wrote, all three bridges across the Niemann River were captured intact. This was completely unexpected. German generals quickly began to dream of the great prize. Hoth recalled, everyone longed to get on the road to Moscow as soon as possible. For the moment, Hoth's panzer group attacked in the direction of Vilnius. The aim was to envelop Soviet armies in Belarusia from the north. But not everything went according to plan for the Germans on the first day. At one point on the frontier in Belarusia, events took an unexpected turn for both sides. At the 19th century Russian fortress of Brest. The fortress was supposed to have a garrison of just one battalion, but units from two Soviet divisions, totaling about 7,000 soldiers, were stationed here when the invasion began. On the morning of the 22nd of June, the fortress came under sustained air and artillery attack. Many soldiers took shelter within its walls, where they became trapped by the bombardment. The Germans had expected the fort to be taken in just a few hours. But instead, a bloody siege began, which was to last several days. The fortress garrison defended every inch of ground, fighting on in small, isolated groups, some of them refusing to surrender. After four days, the Germans had captured the outlying fortifications. The Red Army garrison retreated to the citadel. 400 survivors, led by Major Gavrilov, fought off seven or eight attacks a day. On the 29th of June, the Germans began a two-day assault on the fortress and finally captured the citadel. By now, the defenders were running out of food and water, but still they fought on. It was a full month after the invasion when the Germans finally captured Major Gavrilov. The doctor who treated him recalled that he was almost unconscious with exhaustion, without even the strength left to swallow. 
But an hour before, Gavrilov had been fighting furiously, throwing grenades that killed and wounded several Germans. Despite the heroic resistance of Major Gavrilov and his men, it was simple enough for Guderian's panzer group to bypass the Brest fortress and cross the Bug River. One advantage held by the Red Army seemed to lie in their huge number of tanks. They had about 10,000 tanks in the Western military districts. But for Red Army light tanks, like the T-26 and BT-7, it was to be a very short and very bloody war. The T-26's front armour was just 15 millimetres thick. The BT-7's was not much better, at just 22 millimetres. Both were extremely vulnerable to German guns. What's more, their 45 millimetre guns weren't powerful enough to pierce the armour of modern German tanks, except at point-blank range. The poor design of Soviet shells meant that many simply shattered on contact with German armour. For the Red Army, the first tank battles were a terrible shock. On the second day of the war, Red Army tanks met a German panzer division near Prushanyi. The battle turned into a massacre. More than 100 T-26 tanks were destroyed in just a few hours of combat. On the third day of the war, in a battle near Voinitsa, about 150 T-26 tanks were destroyed. The next day, Soviet T-26 tanks counterattacked near the town of Porchile in the Baltic. At the start of the day, the Soviet 28th Tank Division had 130 tanks. By its end, just 50 remained. The pride of the Red Army lay wrecked and smoking across the German invasion route. The German army had 4,000 tanks and self-propelled guns for the invasion of Russia. Half of them were the virtually obsolete Panzer I and II light tanks. Only 1,400 of them were the new Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks. Each German Panzer division had 200 tanks and more than 2,000 command and support vehicles. A Soviet tank division had almost twice as many tanks, but fewer support vehicles. Events would prove that the Germans had got it right. Without enough support vehicles to keep them supplied with fuel, ammunition and spare parts, hundreds of Soviet tanks would be abandoned en route to the battlefield. German tank crews went into combat convinced of their own superiority. But a nasty surprise lay in store. German tanker Gustav Schrodeck of the 11th Panzer Division was in action near Radikov. He recalled, we sent the first shell into them, it struck the turret. The second shot was another hit, but the lead enemy tank kept advancing. What was going on? We had always joked that all we had to do was spit at a Russian tank and it would blow up. Other reports began to arrive of a new model of Soviet tank that seemed to be immune to German guns. Near Razeny, these new Soviet heavy tanks shrugged off multiple hits before bursting into the German position and crushing guns, trucks and vehicles. The only effective way to stop these monsters was with the powerful 88mm anti-aircraft guns. The new Soviet tanks were called T-34 and KV-1. They were names German soldiers would come to dread. As fighting raged along the frontier, Kuznetsov's third army near Grodno was the only one that managed to bring artillery to bear on the advancing German troops. Kuznetsov's troops fought the German 9th Army to a standstill. German General Ott wrote, stubborn resistance by the Russians has forced us to fight by the rule book once more. We could afford to take certain chances in Poland and in the West, but not now. Kuznetsov was also the first Soviet commander to launch an armored counterattack. 
The Soviet 6th Mechanized Corps had almost 1,000 tanks, including 350 of the new T-34s and KV-1s. The decision on where to counterattack had to be made very quickly. When a concentration of German tanks was reported near Grodno, where Kuznetsov's 3rd Army was fighting, General Pavlov decided that that was the place to strike. It was a catastrophe. The 6th Mechanized Corps was virtually wiped out. Most tanks ran out of fuel or broke down because supply depots had been destroyed by air attack. When the remaining tanks were encircled by the Germans, the crews blew up their vehicles and retreated. It also became clear that there was only German infantry near Grodno. So while the 6th Mechanized Corps made its doomed counterattack, Hoth's panzers advanced unhindered on Vilnius. German control of the air meant Soviet commanders in Bielorussia had no access to air reconnaissance. So largely working in the dark, Pavlov estimated that he faced only one or two German tank divisions. But on the third day of the war, a German reconnaissance unit was ambushed near Slonim. After the battle, a German staff officer's map was found and sent to Pavlov's headquarters. After one glance at the map, Pavlov realized his terrible mistake. Instead of one or two tank divisions, the whole of Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group, five Panzer divisions and two motorized infantry divisions, was advancing on Minsk and Bobrusk. All of Pavlov's forces were about to be encircled. Pavlov immediately ordered all his troops to retreat eastwards, but it was too late. Guderian's panzers burst into Slonim, blocking the only good road from Bialystok back to Minsk. In Bielorussia's landscape of marshland and dense forest, controlling a single road like this could be decisive. Other lines of retreat simply didn't exist. German panzer groups seemed to be advancing at will. Their commanders tried to find weak points in the enemy line and burst through them, moving fast and threatening the enemy with encirclement. To maintain momentum, they simply bypassed areas of stubborn resistance. These were dealt with by infantry divisions that followed in their wake. Armoured cars and motorised infantry in trucks and motorcycles accompanied the panzer columns. Reconnaissance units led the way and were the first to engage the enemy. Finally, close cooperation with Luftwaffe ground attack aircraft made this, in 1941, an unparalleled offensive force. Guderian and Hoth, commanding 2nd and 3rd panzer groups, were advancing on Moscow. But now they received new orders. Minsk was the new priority. Both generals were outraged. They saw Moscow as the grand prize. But both reluctantly diverted their tanks towards Minsk to help complete the encirclement of Pavlov's doomed army. Minsk had been bombed since the first day of the war. From its ruins, huge columns of black smoke rose, obscuring the sun. Now, Hoth tanks were approaching to seal its fate. First, they would have to fight their way through a line of Soviet fortifications. But when one of Hoth's divisions broke through the line, it was immediately counterattacked and its forward units cut off. Hoth's panzer group, as he later described, had to break through Soviet fortified positions situated on the highway amidst heavy fighting. But the tried and tested tactics of the Wehrmacht now proved their worth. A German tank platoon normally deployed in a V formation, with its two prongs facing the enemy. This allowed German tanks to attack on a narrow front, 50 or 60 tanks across a 1,000 metres. In 1941, a Soviet division's order stated that anti-tank guns should be spread evenly along the front. This meant 50 German tanks would only face between 5 and 10 anti-tank guns. 
The German tanks overwhelm these guns by weight of numbers, then turn right and left to attack the rest of the line from the side and rear. What made the situation even worse for Soviet troops was their inadequate weaponry. Their staple 45mm anti-tank gun could only penetrate the front armour of German tanks at very close range. Using superior tactics and weaponry, the Germans broke through the Red Army defences around Minsk after two days of fighting. As German troops entered the city, Dmitry Pavlov, commander of the Soviet Western Front, could only watch helplessly as the trap closed. Like British and French generals before him, Pavlov had been overwhelmed by the speed and fury of the German Blitzkrieg. But he did get one important decision right. As soon as he saw the German plans for encirclement, he ordered a retreat to the east as fast as possible. It gave many soldiers a fighting chance of escape. It was with that hope that his men now fell back towards Minsk. But for most, there was to be no salvation. One week after the German invasion of the Soviet Union, more than 300,000 Soviet soldiers were encircled around Bialystok and Minsk. Some Red Army units were able to fight their way out of the pocket through lightly held German positions to the southeast. Others, including the remnants of Kuznetsov's Third Army, tried to make their way back to Soviet lines through the swamps and forests. The rapid German advance meant Red Army lines were now far to the east. Most would spend weeks walking through the forests before they reached their own lines. Around Bialystok and Minsk, the many thousands who did not make it out faced death or captivity. They fought on, launching desperate counterattacks in a bid to escape the encirclement. They inflicted heavy casualties on the enemy. But finally, two weeks after the invasion, resistance in the pocket came to an end. 290,000 Soviet soldiers entered captivity, a fate from which few would return. General Pavlov, commander of the Western Front, his chief of staff, Major General Klimovskir, and commander of the 4th Army, General Korobkov, and several other officers were all arrested on charges of cowardice and criminal incompetence. Under NKVD interrogation, Pavlov denied his guilt, citing the enormous difficulties he had faced. But Stalin needed scapegoats. The trial's outcome was never in doubt. They were all sentenced to death. Pavlov was shot that same day by the secret police. To the south in Ukraine, the Red Army's southwestern front managed to evade mass encirclements in the first week of the war. The Germans advanced between 150 and 170 kilometers before the disaster at Minsk forced the Red Army to pull back to the Dnieper River. German high command was in high spirits following these early victories. Surely it was thought the Russians can't survive the loss of so many men, tanks and aircraft. Soviet collapse had to be just around the corner. Franz Holder, head of the German general staff wrote, it would be no exaggeration to say that the war against Russia has been won in the first 14 days. The Germans' next objective was Smolensk, but this would not be so straightforward. For a start, German forces had been concentrated for the early battles on the frontier. Now their forces were spread out from the Baltic to southern Ukraine. Secondly, Soviet reserve armies had begun to reach the battlefield. They played no part in the early fighting, but now stood ready on the banks of the Dnieper and the Davina. Guderian and Hoth's panzer groups started rolling east once more. Their mission was to advance far ahead of the main force and join up east of Smolensk. But soon, Guderian's second panzer group came under attack from fresh Soviet armies arriving from the east. After ferocious fighting, Guderian was forced onto the defensive. Soon, Hoth also had to switch to defence. 
a Soviet counterattack forced his men to give up Veliki Luki. It was the first Russian city to be recaptured from the Germans. The speed of their advance had left the German panzer groups isolated. Not until the main force of the German army caught up could their advance resume. Army Group North had also run into trouble. The assault on Novgorod had ground to a halt. Moreover, the German 8th Panzer Division became encircled near the city of Salzi and had to fight its way out. A German officer recorded in his diary, we have no sensation of entering a defeated country as we had in France. Instead, we have resistance, permanent resistance, no matter how hopeless it is. By August, the Red Army had somehow managed to stabilize the situation. A front line was re-established, allowing thousands of stragglers to catch up with the retreating army. After struggling through forests and marshes for a month, the remnants of Kuznetsov's army finally reached their own lines. There were many such stragglers trekking east in the summer of 1941, in groups of a dozen to a thousand or more. Meanwhile, Guderian was preparing a fresh assault on Moscow. On the 21st of August, his units were at their start positions near the city of Starodub. But the same day, Hitler issued a directive that shocked his army group commanders. General Holder would describe it as the decisive moment of the entire campaign. Army Group Center was refused permission to advance on Moscow. Instead, Hoth was ordered north to reinforce the assault on Leningrad. Guderian was ordered south to assist the encirclement of Soviet troops in Ukraine. Guderian immediately flew to Berlin to demand an audience with Hitler. In person, he forcefully made his case that now was the moment to strike at Moscow. In his memoirs, Guderian wrote, I pointed out the serious consequences that would surely arise if operations in the south dragged on too long. If that happened, then it would be too late to assault Moscow that year. Hitler and the army high command remained adamant. Summer was already drawing to a close as Guderian's panzer group struck south against the flank of the Soviet southwestern front. If he could reach the German-held bridgeheads across the Dnieper River, the Red Army forces defending Kiev would all be trapped. After his escape from the Minsk encirclement, General Kuznetsov had been put in command of the 21st Army. His troops were right in the path of Guderian's second panzer group. The Soviet high command had to make a choice, to fight it out along the Dnieper River and risk further massive encirclements if the line was breached, or retreat further east to buy their troops some breathing space. In the end, it was decided that Dnieper was too strong a position to abandon without a fight. A close watch was kept on the German panzer divisions. But in August, they seemed bound for Moscow. The main threat to the southwestern and southern fronts seemed to be from von Kleist's first panzer group, far to the south on the lower reaches of the Dnieper. By August 1941, the Red Army was chronically short of tanks. Its mechanized units had been annihilated in the opening battles of the campaign. Kuznetsov's 21st Army, for example, had just 16 tanks remaining. Kuznetsov's weakened 21st Army was brushed aside by Guderian's troops as they smashed their way towards Lokvitsa, 125 miles east of Kiev. Guderian was about to cut off all the Soviet troops defending the Ukrainian capital. It seemed high time to order the troops of the Soviet Southwestern Front into retreat. But the Soviet High Command hesitated, waiting for the latest information from the front. The Germans, meanwhile, strengthened their bridgehead over the Dnieper River near the city of Kremenchuk. There, they built an enormous floating bridge, half a mile long. Von Kleist's first panzer group raced to Kremenchuk at full speed. 
The tanks crossed the Dnieper under the cover of darkness and rain and joined up with Guderian's forces at Logvitsa. The Soviet high command had hesitated too long. All troops of the southwestern front in the Kiev area were now trapped. For the Red Army, the unfolding disaster at Kiev set a bleak record. It was the largest encirclement in the history of warfare. An estimated 532,000 troops were encircled at Kiev. Only 15 to 20,000 would escape. The fighting in the Kiev pocket dragged on until the end of September. The Red Army's chronic shortage of tanks was revealed by how many were captured at Kiev, just 50. Meanwhile, German Army Group Center, having been stripped of Guderians and Hoth tanks, fought off large-scale Soviet counterattacks near Smolensk. In these desperate battles, the Red Army Guards units were born. For the bravery shown amidst heavy fighting around Yelnia, the 100th Rifle Division was awarded the title of First Guards Rifle Division. General Hoth later wrote, we sustained heavy casualties, especially amongst the junior officers. The losses were higher than during previous attacks and were only partially recovered through replacements. According to the German General Staff's timetable, the Soviet Union was supposed to collapse in just one more month of fighting. But to exhausted German units on the front line, their final objective seemed more and more remote. The Red Army was also desperate. With the encirclement of so many troops at Kiev, the Soviet High Command was forced to throw every available unit into the front line. And now, with the final crushing of the Kiev pocket, Guderian, Herpner and Hoth's panzer groups once more turned towards Moscow. Of these panzer generals, Guderian would be removed from command in just a few months. Herpner would be dismissed by Hitler for cowardice and disobeying orders. Only Papa Hoth would keep his job. Meanwhile, offensives near Moscow, battles around Stalingrad, and a return to Belarusia all lay in store for General Kuznetsov. In 1945, his men would lead the attack on Berlin and on the Reichstag itself. And on the 1st of May 1945, soldiers of the 150th Division of General Kuznetsov's 3rd Assault Army, Alexei Berest, Mikhail Yegorov, and Meliton Kantaria would hoist the hammer and sickle over the Reichstag. But for now, the war was just three months old, and in a few days, the battle for Moscow would begin. A German motorcycle unit raced through western Ukraine. Suddenly, it came under a hail of machine gun fire. The survivors scrambled into cover. The Germans thought they'd run into the rear guard of the retreating Red Army. But it was soon clear this was no rear guard. Stop! Zurück! Da ist eine Festung! 
The machine gun fire came from a concrete bunker disguised as a farmhouse. The German motorcyclists had run into the Stalin line. By the 1930s, fortress walls had given way to fortified lines, which featured concrete gun emplacements, heavy guns in turrets, and anti-tank obstacles. The French built the Maginot Line, the Finns built the Mannerheim Line, and the Germans, the Siegfried Line. The Soviet Union built its own defensive line on its western frontier. Foreign newspapers dubbed it the Stalin Line. In reality, it wasn't a continuous line, but a series of fortified zones. The sheer length of the border meant, in some places, the defences consisted of just a few machine gun positions. Old tanks were recycled to provide gun turrets. The line was 13 years old when the Germans invaded, and in most places lacked modern anti-tank defences. After the Soviet invasion of Poland in 1939, the Stalin line was stripped of men and weapons. They were moved to new defences, being built far to the west along the new frontier. When the Germans attacked, the Stalin line was hurriedly reoccupied. In the first weeks of the war, the German blitzkrieg seemed unstoppable. Soviet generals hoped desperately that at the Stalin line, the invaders could be stopped and then thrown back. The first German formation to engage the Stalin line was the first Panzer Group. It was led by one of the Wehrmacht's most experienced commanders, Ewald von Kleist. In 1941, von Kleist was 60 years old. He had commanded a cavalry regiment in the First World War. Now, he was Germany's senior Panzer General. In 1940, his panzer group had played a crucial role in the fall of France, breaking through French positions at Sedan and encircling the Allies at Dunkirk. At the end of the war, von Kleist was arrested by the Americans and extradited to the USSR. He was found guilty of war crimes and died in prison in 1954. The Stalin line did not overly concern von Kleist. His men were well trained in storming enemy fortifications. German assault teams were made up of infantry platoons, reinforced with combat engineers and light artillery. In an assault, German infantry would try to outflank enemy strongpoints in order to isolate them. The bunker could then be attacked from the rear, using explosives to blow a way in. Another tactic was to fire a flamethrower in through the observation slits, killing everyone inside. Von Kleist's tanks reached the Stalin line at several points simultaneously. On the approach to Kiev, the fighting raged for three days. 14th Panzer Division was in the thick of it. As it prepared to assault Soviet positions, it came under air attack. Then the infantry began their assault on the Stalin line.
Bit by bit, the Germans fought their way through the Soviet defences. On the 8th of July, they broke through to the Zhitomir Highway. They broke through again to the south at Ostropol. The road to Kiev, capital of Ukraine, lay open. But now, the advance ran into well-camouflaged Soviet gun positions. Each bunker had to be taken out by heavy artillery. Next stop was the Ukrainian city of Berdychev. Red Army survivors were once more in retreat. The Stalin line had held up von Kleist's panzer group for just four days. When news of the breakthrough reached General Mikhail Kirponos, commander of the Southwestern Front, his only comment was, we are going to pay dearly for this. Mikhail Petrovich Kirponos had been declared a hero of the Soviet Union, the state's highest award for his leadership during the Soviet-Finnish War in 1940. In 1941, he was put in charge of the Kiev Special Military District. Kirponos was a resourceful, brave and energetic commander, but many envied his rapid promotion. On the morning of the 9th of July, von Kleist's tanks reached Zitomir. The Chief of Staff of Army Group South signaled Berlin. It is imperative that we go on and try to take Kiev by surprise using the Third Army Corps. But Hitler had other priorities. He ordered von Kleist to swing south to help encircle Soviet forces around Uman. Von Kleist was given just a few days to take Kiev. The Ukrainian capital was in grave danger. The chief of staff of the Southwestern Front received a visitor, a major who brought news of the German advance. The Soviet command rushed all available reserves to Kiev. Paratroopers, tank crews without tanks, NKVD police units, naval infantry, all arrived to help defend the city. The Soviets knew the first German thrust would come along the Zhitomir Highway. And where it crossed the Irpin River, they were ready to meet it. The Germans had reached the Kiev fortified region, the last section of the Stalin line and it was ready to welcome the invaders. Von Kleist had reached Kiev, but his panzers needed infantry to break through the city's defenses. And the infantry had been left far behind. Von Kleist was out of time. He had orders to move south away from Kiev to encircle Soviet forces around Uman. Meanwhile, German infantry were fighting their way through the Stalin line to the southwest.
Here, their advance was supported by the new assault guns. They had been deployed to help get Army Group South through the Stalin line, where it protected the Ukrainian city of Vinnytsia. The German assault guns were the brainchild of Erich von Manstein. In 1935, he had written to the Army General Staff. The assault guns should act in conjunction with the infantry. They shouldn't charge like tanks or attempt breakthroughs. They should support the infantry by destroying enemy strong points. They shouldn't operate en masse like tanks, but be deployed in individual platoons. They must be able to rapidly neutralize enemy gun emplacements. In 1940, the German army received its first assault gun, the Sturmgeschütz or Stug III. It was built on a tank chassis and armed with a short 75 mm gun. It had a low silhouette and thicker armor than most tanks. Head-on, it was almost impervious to the standard Soviet anti-tank gun. During an assault, the Stug's role was to get in close to enemy gun positions and knock them out by firing directly through the observation slits. The Stug III became Germany's most produced armored vehicle of the war. But in 1941, only a few were in service on the Eastern Front. Red Army defenses around Letichev were pounded by German artillery and assault guns. The German 4th Mountain Division War Diary described the attack. After three hours of artillery softening up, mountain troop assault teams and engineer squads went forward. Fertig. By 9.30 p.m., all objectives had been taken. The Stalin line had been broken once more. Other Red Army units would soon be outflanked unless they withdrew. The breaching of the Stalin line at Letichev was regarded as a disaster by the Soviet Front Command. Marshal Semyon Bedyoni was commander of the southwestern direction in Ukraine. This put him in charge of two fronts, the Soviet equivalent of an army group. He now sent a surprisingly frank report to the Stavka, the Soviet high command in Moscow. Number one, restoring the situation to its state before the enemy breakthrough with current forces is not possible. Number two, further resistance by 6th and 12th armies in their current position may result in them being surrounded and destroyed within one to two days. Semyon Mikhailovich Budyonyi, Marshal of the Soviet Union, was a Bolshevik legend and a close ally of Joseph Stalin. The son of poor peasant farmers, he had risen to command the first Red Army Cavalry Corps in the Russian Civil War. Budyonyi was a dedicated cavalryman, firmly convinced that tanks could never replace horses. As such, he was distinctly out of touch with the realities of modern warfare. Budyonyi asked the Stavka for permission to withdraw 6th and 12th armies towards the Dnieper River. Permission was given. At first, everything seemed to go smoothly. General Huber, commanding the 16th Panzer Division, looked on. Not able to do anything. We can only watch the brown convoys lose us and go east. Franz Halder, chief of the German general staff, shared his frustration. The enemy has again found a way to withdraw his forces from under our nose. Using fierce counterattacks and great skill, they're able to escape intact.
But this time, there would be no escape. In accordance with the Führer's orders, von Kleist's panzer group now turned south to cut off the retreating Soviet armies. On the 3rd of August, the trap closed at Uman. The encircled troops fought on for nearly two weeks, but they had no chance. The two army commanders, Muzichenko and Ponadelin, were among 103,000 Soviet prisoners. Most would die of starvation or disease in the so-called Uman Ditch or other rudimentary German prisoner of war camps, where the men received no shelter and little food. Major General Ponadelin, however, survived German captivity. At the war's end, he was freed by Soviet troops. But then, he and his subordinate, General Kirillov, were arrested by Smersh, the Soviet counter-espionage service. After a five-year investigation into their conduct, Ponadelin and Kirillov were found guilty of cowardice and treason and shot. Lieutenant General Muzichenko, commanding 6th Army, also survived the German camps. He too was arrested by Smersh at the end of the war. But Muzichenko was cleared of any wrongdoing because he'd been badly wounded when captured. He was reinstated and allowed to resume his military career. After the victory at Uman, von Kleist's panzer group dispersed in a general advance eastwards. In the port of Nikolaev, they captured great prizes. An unfinished battleship, a cruiser, and two submarines. German tank crews described a forest of cranes and submarines lying on their sides like giant fish thrown onto the shore. But their commander, von Kleist, was uneasy. To his mind, they were miles from where they should be. His tanks had advanced hundreds of miles, their progress marked by the graves of comrades and their burnt-out tanks. But they were further than ever from what von Kleist believed would prove the decisive target, Moscow. After a 300-mile march, the infantry of the German 6th Army had finally arrived outside Kiev. In support, flamethrowers, heavy artillery, and Stug III assault guns. On the 30th of July, 6th Army began a concerted attack on the city's southern defenses. From this direction, they would not have to fight across the Irpin River. The Red Army was slowly forced back. Many units became cut off in their bunkers, but they fought on. Bunker 131, near Kremenisha, repelled attack after attack. Its commander, 19-year-old Lieutenant Yakunin, had been an officer for just six weeks. Finally, the Germans blew their way in. No prisoners were taken. The neighboring bunker, number 127, held out for three days. Its machine guns only fell silent when they ran out of ammunition. When the Germans blew their way in, they found two men dead and three badly wounded. The wounded men were carried into captivity.
On the 4th of August, the Germans intensified the assault on Kiev. On the left flank, near Vitoposhtova, the Germans captured a series of bunkers. The next day, they fought their way through to Kiev's second defensive line. But every step forward came at a heavy price. Franz Halder, chief of the German general staff, was alarmed. Army Group South are taking heavy losses in Kiev. Sixth Army loses up to 1,600 men per day. Red Army losses were also severe. Militia battalions were formed and sent forward to plug gaps in the line. These men had received only a few weeks training. Most hadn't received their army papers yet. When they were killed, they had to be identified by party papers or the names on student exercise books. On the 6th of August, through a thick morning mist, the Germans began their attack on Kiev's second defensive line. The fighting ebbed back and forth, but finally, Halder's diary entries could record real progress. The fortified line around Kiev has been breached. German infantry had entered the suburbs of Kiev, Pirogova, Michalovka, Golosivo Park, and the city's two technical colleges. Da links is the Flugplatz Schulani. Es haben Schulani genannt. So eine Bezeichnung, verdammt noch mal. <laughs> es ist Französisch, oder wie? Mm. Rechts ist der Zugang zum Dnieper und zur Brücke. The Germans were just a few miles from the Dnieper bridges. To the west, they'd nearly reached the Giuliani Airport, held by General Rodintsev's 5th Airborne Brigade. With their leather flying helmets, Soviet paratroopers looked a lot like pilots. In 1941, they were being used as elite infantry. They were well-trained, and their morale was high. Атаковать будем по команде. Полный рост. Бегом. Не останавливаться и пулям не кланяться. Раненых подберем потом. Вопросы есть? Напряг. The brigade commander, Lieutenant General Alexander Ilyich Rodintsev, was an experienced soldier who'd already been awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union for his service in the Spanish Civil War. He was personally brave and popular with his men. Eighteen months later, his role in the defense of Stalingrad would make him a household name in the Soviet Union. In 1943, he was given command of the 32nd Guards Rifle Corps, which he led all the way to Prague. As the sun set on the 9th of August 1941, Soviet artillery opened fire near the airport. Ten minutes later, Rodintsev's paratroopers attacked. At first, the Germans thought they were being attacked by pilots from the airport, a last desperate move by the Soviets. But they soon realized their mistake. <laughs> by 
By sunrise, the paratroopers had thrown the Germans back almost two miles. More importantly, they had bought Kiev time. Every day, more reinforcements arrived in the city. That very day, Red Army reports recorded the arrival in the city by train of the 284th Rifle Division. The bitter fighting on the Stalin line and around Uman had at least slowed the German advance. And each week, the Red Army raised fresh divisions in the east. The city's reinforced garrison was reorganized as the 37th Army. It launched a large-scale counterattack. By the 14th of August, they'd liberated many of the city's southern suburbs. Bunkers 205, 206, and 207 were relieved after being cut off for several days. Kiev's two inner defensive lines had been re-established. Then, in late August, Soviet intelligence reported a decrease in enemy activity around Kiev. During the battles outside the city, life in Kiev continued much as normal. There was electricity and running water. Trams and buses still ran. Information about the course of the war was tightly controlled. Few realized just how precarious the situation was. Meanwhile, a Junkers transport aircraft arrived at a secret airfield in East Prussia. On board, General Guderian, commander of the Second Panzer Group, made final preparations for his meeting with Adolf Hitler. Guderian had come to the Wolf's Lair to persuade the Fuhrer that he was making a strategic blunder. Hitler was concerned at the slow progress of Army Group South, which was supposed to capture the rich farmland of Ukraine. Stubborn Soviet resistance in the South had created a dangerous bulge in the German front line, which exposed the southern flank of Army Group Center. Hitler was also alarmed by air raids on his Romanian oil fields, launched from bases in the Crimea. So Guderian's second panzer group was being sent south to encircle Soviet forces defending Kiev. Guderian opposed the plan. Moscow, he insisted, was the key objective. This diversion to Kiev wasted valuable time and resources. And soon, the Russian winter would be upon them. Hitler listened patiently to Guderian, but he was not going to change his mind. My generals know nothing about the economic aspects of war, he declared. The discussion was over. Guderian was going south to Ukraine. Meanwhile, 150 miles southeast of Kiev, the Germans were about to cross the Dnieper. They encountered only light resistance. This toehold across the mighty river became known as the Kremenchug salient. The Soviet high command did not regard the salient as a priority. There were no bridges, so only German infantry had got across. It was the tanks that worried them. Now, those tanks were on the move again. General Yeremenko's Bryansk front was ordered to strike at Guderian's flank as he moved south. But Yeremenko had only a few obsolete tanks. They stood no chance against 2nd Panzer Group.
On the 10th of September, Guderian reached Romney, 130 miles east of Kiev. As the threat of encirclement grew, the Soviet Southwestern Front requested permission to retreat. But the Stavka High Command hesitated. They still hoped to stop Guderian and save Kiev. 180 kilometers still separated the two prongs of the German advance. And the southern pincer at Kremenchug held only infantry. It could be contained. Von Kleist's panzers were still far to the south. Red Army forces retreating from Kiev would be highly vulnerable as they pulled back. This was what had happened at Uman. They would not make the same mistake again. The strategic arguments ran back and forth. But the fact was, Stalin was not prepared to abandon Kiev to the enemy. The 37th Army, 100,000 strong, would hold the city. On the 11th of September, General Keponos, commanding the Southwestern Front, spoke to Marshal Shaposhnikov, chief of the general staff. He wanted permission to withdraw the 37th Army from Kiev and use it against the German forces threatening his rear. Shaposhnikov told him this could not be permitted. He must find other troops. A few hours later, Kiponov's superior, Marshal Budyoni, contacted Moscow with the same request. The enemy's plan to surround the southwestern front from the direction of Novgorod, Siversky and Kremenchuk is obvious to everyone. But Yoni requested they either withdraw all forces to the east or evacuate Kiev, freeing up troops to defend a reduced front. But the Stavka was inflexible. Kiev must be held. Their orders read, you are not to evacuate Kiev or destroy any bridges without Stavka authority. Marshal Budyoni was removed from command. His place was taken by Marshal Timoshenko. Instead of pulling back, more troops were being sent into the Kiev salient. One by one, German tanks drove onto a 2,000-meter-long bridge that floated over the Dnieper River. With the help of German combat engineers, von Kleist's panzer group crossed into the Kremenchuk salient, and Soviet intelligence had no idea. As the sun rose, von Kleist made his move. The Soviet command expected a strike from the north. But now, the fatal blow came suddenly from the south. Von Kleist and Guderian were about to encircle the entire Soviet southwestern front. On the 13th of September, Kiponos's chief of staff, General Tupikov, painted a bleak picture. We have nothing to counter the enemy who has already reached Romney and Lochvitsa. Their advance cannot be resisted. It is a matter of a couple of days before the catastrophe occurs. Once again, Keponos recommended retreating from Kiev before his forces were cut off. But Marshal Shaposhnikov replied, I think this encirclement is a delusion which exists chiefly in the minds of commanders of the Southwestern Front and 37th Army. But on the ground, encirclement had become a reality. On the 14th of September, German 1st and 2nd Panzer Groups linked up near Lokwitze. They had surrounded 532,000 Soviet soldiers. Two days later, a colonel from Stavka flew to Kiev to give Kaponos his new orders. Now that it was too late and the trap had closed, he finally had permission to withdraw. 
But the new orders contradicted Stalin's directive about Kiev. Kiponos knew other generals had been executed for making mistakes in similar situations. He demanded written confirmation. He would not leave the city without it. Stavka confirmation came just before midnight on the 17th of September. Kiponos immediately gave the order to evacuate Kiev. 48 hours later, the Red Army left the city and crossed to the east bank of the Dnipro. NKVD Colonel Majirin was with them. It was a surprisingly warm day. At about 11 in the morning, the Nazis started firing furiously into the city's suburbs. Then they advanced on the bridges. On a signal, the Darnitsia Bridge was blown up. The Navodnitsky Bridge had been covered in tar and was now set on fire. Having destroyed the bridges, the 37th Army retreated towards Yagotin. But there was no escape. In five days of fighting, the southwestern front was chopped up into smaller and smaller pockets of resistance. Some Red Army units held out for 10 days, but they were under attack from all sides and without supplies. Some bands of soldiers tried to escape east through the German lines. They were hunted through the ravines and woods by German motorized columns, supported by tanks. More than half a million Red Army soldiers became prisoners in what had become the largest encirclement in military history. Fewer than 20,000 escaped. Even Front Commander General Kirponos did not get away. He was killed by shell fragments while leading a breakout attempt. His chief of staff, Vasily Tupikov, Front Commissar Bermistenko, and most of his headquarters were also killed. Guderian described the Battle of Kiev as a great tactical success. But what, he wondered, was its strategic significance? The Germans were still looking for the knockout blow. Guderian and many German generals firmly believed it could only come at Moscow and before winter. But was there still time? The Germans entered Kiev on the 19th of September. Five days later, NKVD agents dynamited the buildings chosen by the Nazis as their administrative headquarters. Acts of arson and sabotage continued for several days. They destroyed department stores, the circus on Karl Marx Street, and the Continental Hotel, which housed the German army headquarters. Great fires raged across the city. Kreschatek, the city's main street, was almost entirely destroyed. No one tried to put the fires out. They raged for four days. The Nazis used these events as their pretext to round up the Jews of Kiev. On the 28th of September, a proclamation went up around the city. It ordered all Jews to come to the junction of Melnikov and Detarevska Street at 8 a.m. the next day. Jews, it said, were to be relocated. The next morning, 
more than 30,000 Jews arrive from across the city. Supervised by German SS troops and Ukrainian collaborators, they were marched down Melnikov Street to the Babi Yar Ravine on the outskirts of town. Near the ravine, men, women and children were told to undress and put clothes and valuable belongings into separate piles. Then they were led to the ravine in groups of ten. Two machine guns waited on the far side of the ravine. Over two days, the Nazis murdered 33,771 Jews here. The bodies were buried in the ravine. For 103 weeks, every Tuesday and Friday, the Nazis brought people here for extermination. Jews, Ukrainians, Russians, gypsies. Babi Yar was used for executions for exactly two years, the 29th of September 1941 to the 29th of September 1943. By summer 1943, the Nazis had begun to cover their tracks. Prisoners from the neighboring Siretz concentration camp were made to dig up the bodies and burn them. Historians estimate that between 100 and 200,000 people were murdered at Babi Yar. These massacres were the first indication of the kind of new order that the Nazis planned to bring to the Soviet Union. The war in the East had become a war like no other. This was now a struggle for existence. For the Soviet Union, there could only be victory or annihilation. The 13th of July, 1941. Soviet DB-3s dropped their bombs over the Romanian city of Ploiesti and turned for home. The target was hidden by low cloud. But the high explosive had found its mark. Romania was Hitler's main source of oil. Now, just three weeks into the German invasion of the Soviet Union, this crucial supply line was under attack. The Uniria oil refinery burned for several days. The flames could be seen for many miles. Romanian oil facilities were hit again and again by bombers of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet, based in the Crimea. The 
the Crimean Peninsula had barely been mentioned in German plans for the invasion, but now it was giving Hitler growing cause for concern. On the 23rd of July, 1941, Hitler issued Directive 33, which gave increased priority to the operations of Army Group South in Ukraine. On the 12th of August, he gave orders to occupy the Crimea, which, because of its air bases, he declared, posed a great threat to the Romanian oil-producing regions. The Soviet bomber crews had caught the attention of the Fuhrer. German forces were now heading south to deal with them. The first weeks of the war were disastrous for the Red Army, but in one arena, they had reason to feel more confident. The Soviet Black Sea Fleet was a force to be reckoned with. It included one battleship, five cruisers, 16 destroyers, and 44 submarines. There was no fleet to rival it in the Black Sea. It was commanded by the 42-year-old Vice Admiral Filip Otjebrisky. Otjebrisky joined the Russian Navy in 1917. An ardent communist, he'd gone as far as to change his name from Ivanov to Otjebrisky, meaning October, the month of the revolution. He'd commanded the Black Sea Fleet since 1939. In the summer of 1941, Stalin issued many orders forbidding units to surrender and demanding they hold their positions to the last man. Most had little effect, but at the Black Sea port of Odessa, it was a different story. The defense was led by the independent coastal army, which would soon be under the command of General Ivan Efimovich Petrov. Petrov began his military career as a private in the Red Army. By 1941, he was a major general, commanding the 25th Chapayevskaya Rifle Division, named after its legendary Civil War commander, Vasily Chapayev. Within weeks, Petrov would be promoted to command of the Independent Coastal Army at Odessa. The first battles for the city were fought on the 5th of August, against the advancing 4th Romanian Army. The Romanian generals thought that Odessa would fall quickly. But Soviet soldiers and civilians had been put to work building new defenses. They had dug more than 100 miles of trenches and anti-tank ditches. Odessa would mount a stubborn defense, holding out for many weeks while it was kept supplied by the Black Sea Fleet. In September, Romanian troops broke into the city's suburbs and began shelling the harbor. Soviet Marines launched a fierce counterattack. Supported by amphibious landings behind the Romanian lines, they routed two enemy divisions. The siege lines were driven back more than 5,000 yards. As the coastal army prepared to carry the siege on into the winter, it received dramatic new orders. Soldiers and their commanders who have fought for the city bravely and heroically shall be evacuated with all speed to the Crimea. Von Manstein's 11th Army had crossed the Dnieper and was about to cut off the entire Crimean Peninsula. Erich von Manstein came from a Prussian family with a long history of military service. He was seriously wounded in the opening stages of the First World War, but went on to become a highly experienced staff officer. In 1940, he devised the plan which led to the fall of France. He came to be regarded as one of the best generals of the war. Von Manstein was poised to break through Soviet defenses at Perekop, the gateway to the peninsula. The cities of the Crimea would be exposed, including the main Black Sea naval base at Sevastopol. To try to save Sevastopol, Odessa would be sacrificed. Leaving behind a small rearguard, approximately 90,000 soldiers were evacuated over the course of 17 days. 
they left leaflets addressed to the civilian population. We're leaving our beloved Odessa, but not for good and not for long. Those miserable killers, those fascist brats will be thrown out of our city. We will be back soon, comrades. On the 16th of October, the last ship left Odessa. That evening, the Romanians entered the city. German troops advanced through the Crimea, heading for Sebastopol. As they rested, shells suddenly started falling amongst them. Dozens of vehicles caught fire. They were under fire from the massive guns of Battery No. 30, dubbed by the Germans Fort Maxim Gorky 1. Batteries number 30 and 35 were the fulcrum of Sebastopol's defences. Each battery had two turrets, each with two 12-inch guns. They had originally been built for battleships and had a range of 26 miles. Construction of the batteries began in 1912, but because of the turmoil in Russia, they weren't completed until 1936. Electric engines were used to load and aim the guns. A light railway carried the half-ton shells from the magazine to the guns. Only the towers, protected by 400 millimeters of steel plate, were visible above ground. The rest of the battery was housed in an underground complex, 130 meters by 50. It included storage rooms for ammunition, electric generators, sleeping quarters, even kitchens and infirmaries. The battery was commanded by Major Grigory Alexander, as the Germans continued their advance, Soviet troops retreated south through the mountains, along the Yalta Highway and to Sebastopol. Marines, supported by the heavy coastal guns, held up the German advance. They bought crucial time for reinforcements to reach Sebastopol. They included the Coastal Army under General Petrov and Fleet Commander Vice Admiral Ochebrisky. Sebastopol's defences were divided into four zones. The first covered the harbour at Balaclava. The second, the highway to Yalta. The third, the central and eastern approaches. And the fourth, the road from Bakchisarai. Wounded soldiers and civilians were hurriedly evacuated by sea. On the 6th of November, the steamer Armenia left, bound for the Caucasus. In the chaos of the evacuation, many passengers were not entered on the ship's register. The next day at noon, she was attacked by a German torpedo bomber. The Armenia sank in just four minutes. From an estimated 7,000 passengers, an escort vessel picked up just eight survivors. Franz Halder, chief of the German general staff, 
recorded in his diary that the assault on Sevastopol would begin on the 8th of December and last no more than five days. But summer rains intervened to delay the assault. Von Manstein had decided to make his main attack against Sevastopol's North Shore. At first sight, the Yalta Highway seemed more obvious. The open country on either side of the road was better suited to German tanks. That was why the Soviets were hastily fortifying the area. But von Manstein knew that if he took the North Shore, his artillery would dominate the harbor. With no more supplies arriving by sea, the city would be doomed. Realizing that Sevastopol could not hold out on its own, the Soviets planned to land troops at Kerch, on the eastern tip of the Crimea, and at Feodosia. The landings would be led by the elite 79th Naval Infantry Brigade. They would seize the ports and clear the way for the infantry that followed. Two days before the landings, the Germans began a brutal assault on Sevastopol. They made rapid advances. The Stavka High Command received an urgent message. Should further attacks be of the same pace, the Sevastopol garrison can hold out for no more than three days. Desperate measures were required. The 79th Brigade immediately boarded warships and set sail for Sevastopol. At Sevastopol, warships worked in 20-hour shifts, bombarding German positions from within the harbor. The Germans were finally halted at Fort Stalin. This was the name the Germans had given to a hilltop position held by the 365th anti-aircraft battery. It was not a real fort, although the position had some concrete emplacements for its four 76mm anti-aircraft guns. The Germans had nicknames for all the Sevastopol defenses. They included the GPU, the Cheka, Siberia, or Molotov. Some of these defenses dated back to the Crimean War of the 1850s. Grigory Zamakovsky was at Fort Stalin. A detachment of sailors was formed to defend the battery and I volunteered. We fought the German infantry right by the battery. Hand-to-hand -hand combat inside the barbed wire. It was cruel. Most of our detachment was killed. Such sacrifices brought Sevastopol time, but the situation remained critical. The Germans could break through to the North Shore at any hour. It was where all reinforcements and ammunition were landed. To break the stranglehold, the Kerch landings would go ahead. Advanced detachments landed at Kerch on the 26th of December, but they were able to secure only a few small bridgeheads. Four days later, a risky nighttime landing was attempted at Feodosia. A Soviet submarine laid navigational buoys along the route. Then it turned on its searchlights to guide in the attacking force. A small raiding party led the way. They captured the lighthouse and switched it on. Now, the rest of the landing force steamed in. But one last obstacle remained, the boom that blocked the harbor entrance. Feodosia's boom was a floating barrier made of rafts. A Soviet submarine had made a nighttime reconnaissance of it just a few days before. It had been tightly shut. A boat was supposed to blow up the barrier, 
but its commander had suffered a failure of nerve. He was two hours late and then withdrew without orders. It was a dereliction of duty for which he would later be arrested and shot. The entire operation was in jeopardy. Only then was it discovered that the boom had somehow been left open. The first Soviet craft surged into the bay. The signal went up. The landing party stormed ashore. The German commander, Count von Sponeck, believed his forces were about to be cut off. He ordered a retreat. The Germans abandoned the Kerch Peninsula. For his decision, von Sponeck, a holder of the Knight's Cross, would be court-martialed and shot. The landings had exactly the effect the Soviets had hoped for. Von Manstein was forced to suspend his assault on Sebastopol. He even had to give up ground. He described the moment in his memoirs. It was perfectly clear that it was necessary to move troops from Sebastopol to the endangered areas. Any delay would be fatal. Von Manstein's 11th Army recaptured Feodosia on the 18th of January. The Soviets withdrew to a new defensive line across the Akmene Isthmus. The loss of Feodosia prompted the Stavka High Command to send its own representative to the Crimea. The man they chose was Army Commissioner Lev Mechlis. Usually the Stavka sent a senior general, but Mechlis was a pure party man, a fanatical Bolshevik with no military expertise. His presence undermined the front commander, General Koslov, and threatened chaos in the crucial days ahead. Over the Black Sea, nine German torpedo bombers began their attack run. The transport ship Svanetti was returning from Sevastopol. She carried wounded soldiers and refugees. Her skipper successfully dodged five torpedoes. But she couldn't escape them all. In 1941, in the Black Sea, the Germans sunk 23 Soviet ships and damaged 26 more. Luftwaffe air attacks were proving lethal. Most dangerous of all was Werner Baumbach, commander of KG-30. This was an elite bomber squadron that specialized in attacking ships and had recently transferred to the Black Sea from the Atlantic coast. Without adequate fighter protection, Soviet shipping was highly vulnerable. In just two months, German aircraft destroyed one-third of the transport tonnage available to the Crimean Front. For the new year 1942, Hitler's main strategic objective was to capture the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus. But first, he would have to eliminate Soviet resistance in the Crimea. Otherwise, his southern flank was exposed. Orders from the general staff stated, The main task of Army Group South is to recapture the Kerch Peninsula and take Sevastopol, to free up forces for further advances. To achieve this, von Manstein was reinforced with the newly formed 22nd Panzer Division. 
He would also be supported by the 8th Air Corps, commanded by Wolfram von Richthofen. This unit was considered the best in the Luftwaffe when it came to close air support. The German offensive was codenamed Operation Bustard Hunt. Meanwhile, in the Kerch Peninsula, Soviet soldiers were digging a second and third line of trenches. The commander of the 44th Army had given orders to construct defenses in depth. But under pressure from Commissar Meckles, General Koslov put an end to such preparations. Instead, the men were told to prepare for the big advance. Neither Koslov nor Meckles were discouraged by earlier Red Army disasters. Their offensive was set for the 20th of May. Meanwhile, a Croatian Luftwaffe pilot had defected. He warned of an imminent German attack. General Koslov expected the attack to come along the main highway, where he'd positioned the 51st Army. Half his tanks were also dug in along this route. An advance along the Black Sea shore was considered unlikely, so only the weak 63rd Rifle Division covered this route. The German assault boats approached through an early morning mist. For a while, the landings were held up by Soviet engineers with flamethrowers, but only until they ran out of fuel. Then, the barrage began. German artillery targeted the minefields in front of the Red Army positions. They blew lanes through them, through which infantry and assault guns could advance. Meanwhile, the 8th Air Corps pounded Soviet defences from above. Once the Germans broke through the front line, they met almost no resistance. Kozlov had spared his men the trouble of digging. Now they had no protection on the open steppe. Chaos and panic soon took hold. On the second morning of the battle, von Manstein sent in the 22nd Panzer Division. He was, on a smaller scale, re-enacting the plan of envelopment which had led to the fall of France. After breaking through to the Soviet rear, German tanks turned north, trapping the Soviet 47th Army. It seemed that the battle would be over in mere hours. But on the 9th of May, Soviet armor fought back, led by the heavy KV tanks. Late at night, Kozlov and Meklis called Stalin. They proposed to withdraw to a new defensive line known as the Turkish Bank. But Stalin was not optimistic. If you manage to reach the Turkish bank in time, we'll consider that quite an achievement. Soviet units withdrew along the shore of the Sea of Azov, covered by their tanks. But the Germans were the first to reach the Turkish bank. They followed on the heels of a retreating Soviet column hidden in the clouds of dust. The Germans launched an immediate assault and smashed through the line. Now, the Crimean front was ordered to retreat to the last positions around Kerch itself. In the open terrain, the Red Army was exposed to air attack. The losses were terrible. A 
At the outskirts of Kerch, the Germans were briefly held up as T-26 light tanks made desperate counterattacks. The guns of the Black Sea Fleet joined in, but unlike Sebastopol, Kerch had no powerful coastal batteries. The Germans entered the city, driving Soviet survivors to the eastern tip of the peninsula. Their only hope now lay in evacuation by sea across the six-mile-wide Gulf of Taman. Every available boat or barge was pressed into service. Dunker's fleet, the soldiers called it. But here, there was to be no miracle of Dunkirk. In the face of a merciless German air onslaught, 120,000 troops got away. Many more did not. There weren't enough boats. Most of those who tried to swim for it were carried away by the current. As the Crimean front collapsed, Soviet casualties reached 160,000. The 6th of May, 1942. The German bombardment of Sebastopol was in its fifth day. A heavy shell had smashed through the roof of one of the turrets of Battery No. 30. It was soon repaired, but one gun remained out of action. Enormous shells were raining down from the German lines, two meters in length and weighing more than two tons. They came from two giant mortars, Thor and Odin. The 600 millimeter guns had been built to take on France's Maginot Line. Now they had come to Sebastopol. Their shells could smash through three and a half meters of concrete or 450 millimeters of steel plate. The mortars took 10 minutes to reload. But the Germans had brought even bigger guns to Sebastopol. The railway gun Dora had a caliber of 800 millimeters and remains the largest gun ever to be used in action. It was manned by an artillery battalion of 500 men, which included transport units, gunners, a camouflage unit, and a field kitchen. Its firing position was prepared by 1,000 miners and 1,500 laborers. Assembly and preparation for firing took six weeks. Dora fired 48 shells during the siege. Only one hit was recorded. It destroyed an ammunition store 27 meters underground. Dora was in action for 13 days before being disassembled and sent to Leningrad. At that moment, 11th Army contained nearly 1,000 guns of all calibers. Von Manstein believed it was a record. In general, during the Second World War, Germany never used as much artillery as it did during the siege of Sebastopol. But as the siege went on, ammunition would become an increasing concern for both sides. For the defenders of Sebastopol, there was no place left to run. There weren't enough ships to evacuate the garrison. The orders were to hold out at all costs. There were few illusions about what this meant. A 
An immense German bombardment began on the morning of the 7th of June, 1942. Thor and Odin fired 54 shells at battery number 30, but they failed to destroy the turrets. The Luftwaffe flew 1,400 sorties. The firepower seemed overwhelming. But the German infantry, advancing along the Belbeck River, were only able to advance a few hundred meters. It cost them dearly, more than 2,000 casualties. Witnesses described the whole horizon being alive with fire and smoke. The German onslaught was unsustainable. Von Richthofen's bombers were running low on bombs. His pilots had strict orders to make every one count. The artillery magazines were almost empty. Herr Oberst, die Kanonier berichten, die Munition für Büchsen, Karl und Gamma ist zu Ende. On the night of the 9th of June, General Petrov committed his reserve, the 345th Rifle Division. Supported by fire from batteries 30 and 35, they were able to stem the German advance. But four days later, disaster struck. As the transport ship Georgia arrived in the harbor, bringing reinforcements and ammunition, she was hit by two bombs. Massive explosions quickly sent her to the bottom. The loss of men and 500 tons of ammunition was a devastating blow. Vice Admiral Otjebriski signaled the Stavka. The shortage of men and ammunition puts us on the verge of catastrophe. On the 13th of June, Manstein was able to report the capture of Fort Stalin, which had held up the German assault the previous winter. It had not fallen until three of its four guns had been put out of action. Von Manstein convinced Hitler this was the crucial breakthrough. He persuaded Hitler to give him three more infantry regiments and not to redeploy the 8th Air Corps to Kharkov. The main German summer offensive towards Stalingrad and the Caucasus could not start until Sevastopol fell. Its garrison's bitter resistance was holding everything up. But step by step, the Germans were closing in. On the 17th of June, the Germans attempted to storm battery number 30. The minefields were destroyed by artillery and the infantry were able to reach the turrets. The gunners withdrew underground. They held out for four more days before battery commander Major Alexander gave orders to blow up the turrets and the generators. The next day, the Germans broke in and captured the survivors. Alexander and a few others escaped through a storm drain. But while dressed as a civilian, he was pointed out by a local collaborator. Major Alexander was taken to a prison in Simferopol, tortured and shot. The Germans had reached the North Shore. It meant no more supplies or reinforcements could be landed at the harbor. The cruiser Comintern, en route to Sebastopol, had to turn back. But at Kazacha, Kamishova, and Streletska Bay, submarines and small craft could still land. Douglas DC-3s of the Moscow Special Aviation Group were used to ferry out the wounded. Grigory Zamakovsky witnessed the scene. Thousands of wounded lay at the airfield. One aircraft could take just 25 people. A pilot would point to those that were to be taken. How many eyes looked at them with hope and pain? At most, the aircraft could bring in a few dozen tons of ammunition per day. 
but Sebastopol needed hundreds of tons per day. On the 26th of June, the submarine S-32 was en route to Sebastopol, carrying fuel and mortar shells. Southwest of Yalta, it was attacked by German aircraft. The explosion was seen 20 miles away. Soviet defenses in the north had collapsed, but the city was not about to surrender. In the south, the German 30th Corps was held up by Soviet defenses on the Sapun Heights. In his memoirs, Manstein indicated his main concern. The obvious way out of that situation was to redirect the main blow to the southern side. But redeploying an infantry division from the northern sector to the south would have taken many days, giving the enemy time to rest and reorganize. Once more, Manstein had lost von Richthofen's air corps, which had finally been redeployed north. Perhaps Sevastopol would make it after all. The sailors were building a jetty for large ships as fast as they could. It would be complete in just a few days. Reinforcements and ammunition could start to pour in once more. At 2 a.m. on the 29th of June, the Germans launched 130 assault boats from Sebastopol's north shore. Under cover of smoke and heavy artillery fire, they crossed the bay and landed on the southern shore. Suddenly, the Germans were behind Sebastopol's two remaining lines of defense. Von Manstein had caught the Soviets off guard. Crossing the bay had been considered too high risk. The same night, von Manstein launched an attack along the Yalta Highway over the Sapun Heights. These twin blows led to the total collapse of Soviet defenses. Small units fought on, but were increasingly isolated and short of ammunition. Stalin ordered key personnel to leave by plane. That evening, Vice Admiral Ochebrisky left for the Caucasus with 232 others. Other senior officers made their escape by submarine. As they boarded, in full view of hundreds of soldiers and sailors, a riot looked likely. Shots were fired injuring a marine officer walking behind General Petrov. That night, the submarine left for the safety of Novorossiysk on the eastern shore of the Black Sea. Some commanders chose to stay with their men. Chief of Staff Kobalyuk of the Coast Guard declared that he would die with his unit. Colonel Mikhailov gave up his seat on the last plane and was killed near Sebastopol. General Rupsov, commander of an NKVD border detachment, also remained and shot himself rather than be taken prisoner. General Petrov tried to shoot himself on board the submarine but was prevented by those around him. Those left behind felt doomed and betrayed. As many as 80,000 men, many of them wounded, now faced death or the horrors of a German prisoner of war camp. But some refused to give up. They took to the last remaining boats or built rafts from whatever was at hand. One group of sailors built a raft from a truck and 12 inner tubes. Еще одна есть. Вроде целая. 
За час управимся. Может, успеем уйти? У меня мешок криса есть. А Савчук за водой пошел. Many rafts were sunk by German fire. But this one made it to the open sea. After a few hours, it was met by Soviet patrol boats heading for Sevastopol. After taking the survivors on board, the ships approached the coast. But heavy German fire meant they couldn't even get close. At dawn, the patrol boats picked up another boat carrying 12 more survivors. Then they turned back to Novorossiysk. Two years later, these soldiers would return to Sevastopol as victors. In May 1944, it would be German soldiers desperately building rafts, hoping to sail them to Romania. The Red Army would come to settle the score and exact a bloody revenge for the defeat of 1942. September 1941, 10 weeks after the German invasion of the Soviet Union. Now Moscow itself was braced for the German onslaught. Barricades and anti-tank obstacles blocked the streets. Windows were taped up to reduce the danger from flying glass caused by explosions. And at night, the city was immersed in total darkness. Lit windows helped the enemy, warned the posters. Stalingrad, for the moment, was safe in the Russian heartland. Bandaged soldiers on the city streets were the only visible sign of battles that raged many miles to the west. In the workshops of the Stalingrad tractor factory, tank production was round the clock. The enormous losses suffered by the Red Army that summer had to be made good. That summer, hundreds of tanks had been abandoned because their crews couldn't fix simple mechanical failures. Now, tank crews began their training inside the factories. They were taught every mechanical detail of their new tank and how to fix them if they broke down. One of the commanders of these newly formed tank brigades was the 40-year-old Colonel Mikhail Katakov. Katakov began the war as the commander of the 20th Tank Division. But its obsolete tanks had proved cannon fodder for the Germans in the summer of 1941. Katakov and the remnants of his division had been lucky to escape encirclement. In late September, his brigade's new T-34 tanks were loaded onto trains. Mikhail Katakov and the 4th Tank Brigade 
were going to Moscow. Moscow had already had its first taste of war. The first German air raid came exactly one month after the war began, on the 22nd of July, 1941. German pilots were told, you've bombed England, this will be much easier. If the Russians even have anti-aircraft guns, there won't be many of them. They don't have searchlights, balloons, or night fighters. But these illusions were soon shattered. The skies over Moscow were defended by thousands of anti-aircraft guns of all calibers. Soviet night fighters attacked German bombers caught in the searchlights. Barrage balloons rose to 2,500 meters, and in pairs as high as 4,500 meters, much higher than over London. The risk of flying into their steel cables forced German bombers to fly at much higher altitudes from where they were much less accurate. But inevitably, some bombers got through. The Belaruski rail terminal, the telephone exchange, and army supply depots were all hit. The Kremlin itself was hit by six incendiaries and one 250-kilogram high-explosive bomb. It pierced the roof of the Grand Kremlin Palace and the ceiling of the Georgievsky Hall, but it failed to explode. On the night of the 12th of August, a 1,000-kilogram bomb landed in Nitskyevorota Square, making a crater 12 metres deep and 32 metres across. But German bomber crews were made to pay a heavy price for these successes. A total of 134 air raids were made on Moscow. More than 1,500 bombs and 45,000 incendiaries were dropped on the city during the war. The biggest raid was on the 29th of October, 1941. More than 300 bombers took part. Bombs hit the Bolshoi Theater, the Moscow State University, and the Central Committee of the Communist Party. 47 German planes were brought down that day. Hitler's invasion plan called for the capture of Moscow in the first three to four months of the war. But fighting around Smolensk and Kiev had held the Germans up for two months. The assault on Moscow was not ready to begin until the 30th of September. The Soviet high command, the Stavka, expected the Germans to attack along the highway from Smolensk to Vyazma. Red Army units under General Rokossovsky began to dig in along this route. But the Germans were planning a surprise. General Herpner's 4th Panzer Group had been secretly redeployed from the Leningrad front to join the attack on Moscow. To conceal this maneuver, the Panzer Group left its headquarters radio operator near Leningrad. Each radio operator working in Morse code has a distinct style of transmitting based on their rhythm, just as each pianist has their own unique style of playing. Experts can pick out individual radio operators just by listening in to their transmissions. When the Soviets intercepted radio messages near Leningrad, which they knew came from the radio operator of 4th Panzer Group, they assumed Herpner's forces were still in the area. But all they were listening to was one lone radio operator. Commander of the 4th Panzer Group, Erich Herpner, was an old-fashioned general, known as the Old Cavalryman. Nevertheless, he'd been one of the first generals to understand and embrace the principles of armoured warfare. Three German panzer groups now targeted Moscow, led by Herpner, Guderian 
and Hoth, who was replaced in October by General Reinhardt. The German plan was to force a final decisive battle for Moscow in which they would encircle and annihilate the remnants of the Red Army. The operation was codenamed Typhoon. The offensive began near Bryansk. Red Army troops were ready to defend the town itself, which lay at the center of the local road network. But on the 30th of September 1941, Guderian's panzers attacked much further south. Heinz Guderian had a reputation as the father of German blitzkrieg, based on his early writings on the theory of offensive, mechanized warfare. He was also a bold and energetic field commander who often quarreled with his superior officers. In three days, Guderian's tanks had encircled the bulk of the enemy forces opposing him. In two more days, his troops had reached Oral and were advancing on Tula. In a desperate attempt to halt Guderian's advance, the Soviet high command took a bold decision to reinforce Oral by air. Giant Tupolev TB3s and Lisunov Li2s landed at the deserted airfield. The Germans, recovering from their surprise, opened a withering fire on the second wave. Nevertheless, 6,000 men plus equipment and ammunition was landed. The troops immediately went into action against the advancing Germans. Soon, T-34s from Colonel Katakov's 4th Tank Brigade also began to arrive after their 500-mile train journey from Stalingrad. Tank brigades replaced the Soviet mechanized corps that had been destroyed that summer. A mechanized corps had contained 36,000 men, 1,000 tanks, plus guns and other vehicles. It was a huge and unwieldy formation. The new, more mobile tank brigades had just 3,000 soldiers and 91 tanks. Katakov now had a chance to test the tank ambush tactics that so far he'd only been able to practice on the training ground. First, the tanks had to be concealed, using buildings, bushes, or uneven ground. Several alternative positions were needed for each tank. Dummy positions were also built to confuse the enemy. A T-34's gun could destroy any German tank from a range of one kilometer. But the key to success was patience and discipline. Katakov told his men, the crew in ambush may open fire only at point-blank range when a hit is guaranteed. This means a range of 200 to 300 meters. When taking on a German panzer column, Soviet gunners would target the lead tank first, and then the rear tank. With the road blocked in both directions, the rest of the column became sitting ducks. One member of Katakov's brigade was the Soviet tank ace Dmitry Lavrinenka. In 28 engagements, he destroyed 52 German tanks, believed to be the most by any Soviet tank commander in the whole war. The tank ambushes proved to be highly effective. Oral fell to the Germans, but Katakov's tanks bought time to reinforce Tula. As Red Army paratroopers reinforced the southern flank, the Germans launched their main thrust in the center. German Army Group Center rapidly outmaneuvered and defeated the Soviet reserve and western fronts securing the highway from Smolensk to Vyazma. Operation Typhoon was in full swing. The fate of Russia hung in the balance. The Germans had broken through on the road to Moscow. On the 4th of October 1941, 
General Konyev told the Soviet high command that his forces were about to be cut off. But he received no order to retreat. The Stavka seemed unable to accept that another major disaster was unfolding in front of them. Hitler, meanwhile, was convinced of final victory. He addressed the crowds at the Sportpalast in Berlin. Huge events are now unfolding on the Eastern Front. We have launched a large-scale operation that will lead to the final elimination of the enemy in the East. Once again, the Stavka's order to retreat came too late. More than half a million Red Army soldiers had become encircled around Vyazma and Bryansk. The divisions and regiments that did escape the encirclement began a headlong retreat. With bitter humor, they referred to this maneuver as the Scarpa March. It was becoming all too familiar to the Red Army soldiers who'd survived the summer. Enemy air superiority had a particular impact on Soviet morale. The 43rd Army reported, German bombers attack without mercy. They make raids in groups of 20 to 25 aircraft. Survivors are left senseless. One aircraft was especially feared by the soldiers. The Junkers Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber was the airborne artillery of the German Blitzkrieg machine. By attacking targets in a steep dive, it was able to deliver its bombs with pinpoint accuracy. The aircraft would then circle and attack other targets with light bombs and machine guns. These sustained attacks sowed chaos and destruction ahead of advancing ground troops. The bulk of German Army Group Center was needed to encircle the Soviet armies of Generals Konyev and Budyoni. But several divisions, led by SS Panzer Division Das Reich, began moving east. These troops had been given the honor of being the first to enter the Russian capital. The Germans were just 205 kilometers from Moscow, and the road ahead was almost clear. The Red Army rushed a battalion of paratroopers to the area. Armed only with machine guns, rifles, and Molotov cocktails, they fought ferociously to hold the bridge over the Ugra River. By the end of the day, from 430 men, just 29 were left. By the time a tank brigade arrived to help them, the signpost read 180 kilometers to Moscow. The Germans had advanced just 25 kilometers. Despite such fierce resistance, the Red Army faced a catastrophe. It had suffered huge losses over the course of the summer. The enemy was at the doorstep of their capital. Reinforcements were on their way from the east, but Stalin desperately needed more time. In this, the darkest hour, he sent for General Zhukov. After arriving at general headquarters in Moscow and quickly appraising the situation, Zhukov drew a simple, stark conclusion. The defensive front in the West has been destroyed. A huge gap has appeared in our front line, and there is nothing to fill it as there are no reserves. The roads leading to Moscow are open. Hitler's confidence seemed well-placed. But there was a small window of time for General Zhukov. Soviet troops encircled near Vyazma were fighting on, meaning for a short time only a few German divisions could be spared for the advance on Moscow. Zhukov's immediate task was to halt this German advance and restore Moscow's defenses before the full weight of German Army Group Center fell upon them. The Majeska defensive line, 120 kilometers from Moscow, was the last obstacle between the Germans and the capital. 
in early October, everyone not fighting who could lift a shovel was helping to build the Majeska line. Zhukov planned to fill it with troops, but the only spare ones he could find were officer cadets from Moscow's military schools. It was a sign of how desperate the situation had become. The Majeska line was more than 200 kilometers long. It could not all be held by teenage cadets. Seven rifle divisions were being formed near Moscow, but realistically, these raw recruits could only fend off the Germans for a few hours. The Stavka had to take one of the war's many hard decisions. In besieged Leningrad, there were already serious food shortages. The Stavka had gathered reserves to launch a counterattack that would lift the siege and end the city's suffering. But just hours after the disaster at Vyazma, this operation was canceled. The reserves were ordered to reboard the trains. They were now bound for Moscow and the Majeska line. The elite SS Das Reich Division was spearheading the German advance on Moscow. Its troops were well-trained, experienced, and had the best equipment. Near the battlefield of Borodino, where the Russians had fought Napoleon in 1812, they met the Soviet 32nd Division. These were fresh troops, hurriedly redeployed from the Far East. Their headquarters had been symbolically sited where General Kutuzov's headquarters had stood in 1812. The first German tanks appeared on the Moscow-Minsk highway. Near the village of Yelnia, the road descended into a deep hollow as it crossed the river. Soviet pillboxes housing anti-tank guns overlooked the crossing from the opposite bank. When the German tanks reached the bottom, the Soviet guns opened fire. There was no space for the tanks to turn around or get off the road. The German panzers were knocked out one by one. The SS troops included fascist volunteers from France. Field Marshal von Kluger addressed them before the battle, reminding them how, under Napoleon, Germans and French had fought side by side against the Russians on this very field. The next day, the French Legion plunged into battle, but in the face of Soviet armored counterattacks, it suffered devastating losses. The unit had to be withdrawn from the front line. Zhukov's orders were clear. Hold fast at the Majeska line. Every day they held out allowed more time for reinforcements to reach Moscow. The German advance was now measured in hundreds of meters, not miles. The Das Reich division suffered massive casualties that included most of its officers. The Germans tried to blast the defenders out of their positions. Ivan Makuka, a cadet from the Podolsk Artillery School, recalled the experience. Direct hits on our pillbox caused blast waves that knocked us off our feet and left us bleeding from our eyes and ears. The reinforced Germans renewed the assault. Kaluga fell on the 13th of October. Borovsk three days later. The 32nd Division was forced to retreat from Borodino. In ferocious fighting, the enemy's advance was halted once more at the Protva and Nara rivers. A staff officer of the German 52nd Panzer Corps reported, the recent fighting to take Russian positions was the fiercest of the entire campaign. 
Our tank losses have risen dramatically since the start of this operation. For the Germans, the honor of being the first troops into Moscow had turned into a nightmare of blood and smoke. All possible measures were being taken for the defense of Moscow. All the major roads into Moscow were mined, including those leading to Kiev, Old Kiev, Mozhesk, Zvinigorod, Leningrad, and Dimitrov. The bridges were also mined. Obstacles were placed across the rail tracks. In total, more than 150 minefields surrounded the city. Meanwhile, Soviet troops encircled near Vyazma and Bryansk continued to resist, much to the surprise and frustration of the German planners. Twenty-four German divisions earmarked for the attack on Moscow had to be held back to fight the encircled Red Army units. Von Funk, commander of the 7th Panzer Division, reported that combat following the encirclement of the Russians was some of the heaviest the division ever experienced. Some of our Panzer Grenadier platoons were wiped out to a man. It took a full week for the Germans to crush the resistance inside the pocket. Of 580,000 men encircled near Vyazma and Bryansk, 130,000 were killed or missing in action, and 370,000 were taken prisoner. Only 85,000 men broke out of the encirclement. Front commander Yerimenka was seriously wounded and evacuated by air. Major General Petrov, commander of the 50th Army, and Major General Rakutin, commander of the 24th Army, were amongst the dead. Amongst those captured were Lieutenant General Yershikov, who died in a German prisoner of war camp. Major General Vishnevsky, liberated by the Red Army in 1945. And the wounded commander of the 19th Army, Lieutenant General Lukin. Lukin survived the German camps and was liberated in 1945. When Stalin heard the news, he said, tell Lukin my words of gratitude for Moscow. Stalin wrote on Lukin's file, loyal man to be restored in rank. He was not always so generous to those who'd surrendered to the Germans. It was mid-October. As the bulk of Army Group Center completed the destruction of the encircled Soviet armies, the autumn rains began to fall. The roads soon turned to rivers of mud. The German troops complained that it was impossible to conduct offensive operations in these conditions. But muddy roads were a handicap to both sides. Colonel Katakov recalled, even T-34s could foul their tracks and become stranded in the mud. Staff cars had to be towed by tanks or carried on trucks, otherwise they would never get through. Many German officers later blamed their failure to take Moscow entirely on the weather. But in private, many admitted that the German high command had badly underestimated Soviet determination and the scale of their reserves. For now, the German offensive was literally bogged down. In Moscow, news of the German advance threatened to cause panic on the streets. On the 15th of October, the Central Committee of the Communist Party was evacuated, as well as most of the ministries and foreign embassies. The next day, many shops and factories stayed closed. Workers were left on the streets with nothing to do. Rumors began to spread. 
On the orders of Commissar Lazar Kaganovich, the Metro stopped running. It was rigged with explosives so that it could be blown up if the Germans entered the city. Trams stayed in their depots. The roads leading east to safety were blocked with cars. The Luftwaffe stepped up its air raids. The streets were awash with rumors of spies and saboteurs. The situation demanded urgent measures. Alexander Sherbakov, first secretary of the Moscow City Committee, went on the air. He assured citizens that Moscow would not be abandoned. The NKVD secret police would patrol the streets and restore order. Checkpoints were set up everywhere. People trying to leave the city with valuables were closely scrutinized. Looters and scaremongers were sentenced by military tribunals and shot by firing squad. And posters went up across the city announcing a concert by the film star Lyubov Oliver. The posters had their desired effect. If Russia's biggest celebrity was in town, the situation couldn't be that bad. In fact, at the beginning of November, the Moscow front was relatively stable. But there was no room for complacency. The cry was not a step back, and it was rigorously enforced. On the 4th of November, an order was read out to the officers of the 133rd Rifle Division. Its commanders, Gerasimov and Commissar Shabalov, were to be executed by firing squad for disobeying orders to hold the town of Ruza. They had retreated without authorization. Stalin knew his own movements would be crucial. He chose to remain in Moscow and inspect the parade held every year to mark the anniversary of the revolution. All preparations for the parade were made in complete secrecy. Even the units taking part weren't told in advance. And at the last moment, the start time was brought forward by two hours. At 10 past eight on the morning of the 7th of November, every radio station in the Soviet Union broadcast Stalin's speech from Red Square. It was a supreme act of state theater. No other parades were held in Moscow until the end of the war. To hold one in 1941, the hour of greatest danger showed the world Stalin and the Soviet Union's determination to fight to the bitter end. The troops seen here parading through Red Square would go straight on to the front line. There they would take part in some of the bloodiest and most decisive fighting of the entire war.
Muscovites had been fully mobilized for the defense of their city. They built fortifications and made weapons. The dynamo and Kalinin factories produced mortars. Automobile factories now made submachine guns. By the 5th of November, Muscovites had made donations to the defense fund worth more than 80 million rubles. They had given eight kilos of gold, 377 kilos of silver, and 1.4 kilos of platinum. But now, with the ground frozen hard, German Army Group Center received orders to renew its offensive. Moscow was not just the spiritual heart of Russia. It was also the transport hub for the entire Soviet Union. All the major road and rail networks converged here. If Moscow fell, the Soviet Union would be almost defenseless. By the time Army Group Center renewed its assault, the city's defenses had been considerably strengthened. Reinforcements continued to arrive from the Far East. Katakov's tank brigade was one of the units sent to guard the approaches to Moscow. Like an increasing number of Red Army officers, Katakov could now consider himself a combat veteran. Understanding the role of air reconnaissance in German success, Katakov wrote, tank tracks and footsteps in deep snow can clearly be seen from the air. This isn't taken into consideration by our soldiers, who walk around their positions creating a network of paths that can be seen from above. Katakov recommended changes to standing orders to reduce visibility from the air. The Red Army was slowly learning its craft. Guderian's 2nd Panzer Army resumed its advance through the city of Tula towards Kolomna. 3rd and 4th Panzer groups had been redeployed to the north. Their objectives were the crossings over the Ivankovo Reservoir, with the aim of encircling Moscow from the north. The simultaneous assault of two Panzer groups caused Soviet defenses to buckle. But the line did not break. The Red Army retreated and dug in again around the town of Klin. Katakov recalled, we retreated with heavy hearts. Every single kilometer yielded to the enemy brought the fighting closer to Moscow. We passed road signs reading 60 kilometers to Moscow, then 55, then 53. South of Moscow, Guderian bypassed Tula but ran into determined resistance from General Belov's dismounted cavalry units. By the 30th of November, German observers could see the spires of the Kremlin. Motorcyclists from Herpner's 4th Panzer Group reached Kimki, a Moscow suburb less than 15 miles from the Kremlin. According to one account, the intruders were all killed. In another, they were forced to beat a hurried retreat. It would prove to be the high watermark of the German invasion. In his memoirs, Guderian wrote, the offensive on Moscow failed. All the sacrifices and efforts of our valiant troops had been in vain. As a result, the army's strength and morale was greatly undermined. Just as German reserves were stretched to the limit, the Stavka was gathering fresh divisions to unleash a devastating counterattack. One army prepared to hit Reinhardt's panzer group 
from the flank near Solnezhnogorsk. Another was aimed at the flank of Guderian's panzer army near Stalinogorsk. Another army would roll back the Germans from the immediate vicinity of Moscow. On the 29th of November, Zhukov phoned Stalin to request that he give the order to begin the counteroffensive. Stalin issued the orders that evening. As German soldiers struggled to cope with the plummeting temperatures, as low as minus 30 degrees centigrade by night, they could at least take comfort in the latest intelligence reports. The enemy's combat capabilities in this area, they claimed, are not sufficient to conduct any large-scale counteroffensive. But sunrise on the 5th of December brought a terrible shock. Fresh Soviet tank brigades and infantry divisions launched a full-scale assault along the whole front. They tore across the frozen landscape, forcing the Wehrmacht into retreat and fighting fierce battles against a desperate rear guard. Hundreds of German vehicles, having run out of fuel or antifreeze, lay abandoned at the roadside. Many German soldiers now thought of nothing but survival. General Schall recalled, more and more soldiers abandoned their weapons, but could be seen leading livestock or perhaps dragging a sleigh loaded with sacks of potatoes. Soldiers killed in air attacks were left unburied. In the south, Guderian was also in full retreat. With a heavy heart, he wrote, on the 6th of December, I ordered our troops to cease all attacks and begin a retreat to our original lines. The pursuers had become the pursued. The call, not a step back, became the battle cry, forward. There was to be no mercy for the invader. Meanwhile, Field Marshal von Bock was echoing Soviet orders of just a few weeks before. A commander may only order a withdrawal with the permission of his army commander. A division will not retreat without my personal authorization. To add to the suffering, the troops were experiencing the coldest Russian winter in 140 years. A German doctor's diary recorded, a Russian can live in this wilderness. He can make a stove out of a pair of empty jerry cans. Our men only know how to warm themselves by burning precious petrol. The Wehrmacht faced the same fate as Napoleon's army, total ruin. They had been forced back more than 100 kilometers from the gates of Moscow. It was the first large-scale repulse of German forces in World War II. Footage of thousands of German prisoners and their wrecked vehicles was seen around the world. Hitler blamed defeat on a failure of will amongst his top generals. Field Marshal von Brauchitsch was sacked as commander-in-chief of the German army. His successor, was Adolf Hitler. Von Bock was replaced as commander of Army Group Center by Field Marshal Gunther von Kluger. Guderian clashed with the high command once more and was relieved of command. For ordering a retreat, Herpner was sacked and stripped of his decorations. In 1944, he was hanged for plotting against Hitler. However, Hitler's demands that the army stand fast and offer fanatical resistance had effect. The front line was eventually stabilized as the Germans dug in and fought the Red Army to a standstill. Meanwhile, the Soviet Supreme Command launched an offensive along the entire front, from besieged Leningrad in the north to the Black Sea in the south. Outside Moscow, the Red Army tried to break through to Vyazma 
and cut off Army Group Center's main supply route. Stalin hoped for a grand encirclement. The German High Command fed in fresh divisions from Western Europe. As they reinforced the front line, the lead elements of the Soviet encirclement themselves became cut off. Two Soviet armies, General Belov's Cavalry Corps and thousands of paratroopers were trapped around Vyazma. Their attempts to fight their way out ended in failure. As 33rd Army was surrounded and crushed, its commander, General Yefremov, committed suicide rather than be taken prisoner. Maslenikov's 39th Army and the paratroopers dispersed to fight on as guerrillas. Only part of Belov's cavalry corps managed to escape, galloping through the forests to rejoin the Soviet front line. The Red Army still had much to learn. Zhukov told his officers, if you want to keep your commands, I insist that you stop ordering criminal frontal attacks on well-defended enemy positions. You should attack along ravines, through forests, or where there is some cover from enemy fire. By April 1942, the disruption to Soviet industry meant the Red Army was running out of tanks and ammunition. Its losses, exacerbated by its own tactical blunders, had been enormous. As the spring thaw began, the Soviet counteroffensive was called off. Germany had entered a war of attrition against the Soviet Union, its spirits raised by the successful defense of the capital. In the battle for Moscow and in the Soviet counteroffensive, the Germans suffered 400,000 casualties. They had lost 1,300 tanks and 2,500 guns. By comparison, in the conquest of Poland, they had suffered just 44,000 casualties and in the defeat of France, 154,000. At the Nuremberg trials, Field Marshal Keitel, chief of the German High Command, was asked when he knew that the invasion of the Soviet Union had failed. He replied with one word, Moscow. Six weeks into the war, near the town of Staria Rusa, German soldiers pondered a strange contraption captured in recent fighting. It was an artillery system, but not like anything of their own. Each truck carried a crude-looking frame onto which rockets were loaded. The Soviet counterattack here had been supported by dozens of these rocket launchers. It had helped to stall the advance of the entire German Army Group North, striking towards Leningrad. They had bought time 
time that would prove crucial. The BM-13 multiple rocket launch system, given the girl's name Katyusha by the troops, was a rail launch rack on a truck chassis. Gears elevated and rotated the launcher rack into the correct firing position, as determined by an artillery sight. The rockets were very inaccurate and would rain down over a wide area, but the Katyusha made up for this with a fearsome rate of fire. One Katyusha could launch 16 rockets in less than 10 seconds. Firing en masse, they could devastate a massive area in the blink of an eye. Leningrad, Russia's Baltic seaport, was a key objective of the German invasion. From here, Soviet submarines and the Baltic fleet threatened Germany's supply of iron ore, which came by sea from neutral Sweden. The plans for the German invasion stated that the assault on Moscow could proceed only after Leningrad and its naval base at Kronstadt had been captured. Hitler, with growing confidence in his own military genius, was increasingly involved in strategic planning. He was now determined that, if necessary, the armoured forces assaulting Moscow should be diverted to Leningrad. Army Group North, advancing on Leningrad, had been stopped at the so-called Luga Line in July. This 175-kilometre line of fortifications had been hastily built by soldiers of the reserve and citizens of Leningrad. In August, Army Group North was reinforced with tanks and dive bombers from Army Group Center. They crashed through the Luger line and encircled the troops defending it. The Red Army fed its new KV heavy tanks into the battle. They were produced in Leningrad itself at the Kirov factory. The front armour of a KV-1 was 75mm thick. The German 37mm anti-tank gun barely made a scratch. But early in the war, fuel shortages and poorly trained crews who didn't know how to repair their vehicle meant many KV-1s and other Soviet vehicles ended up abandoned at the roadside. On the 19th of August, a company of KVs commanded by senior Lieutenant Kolobanov took up an ambush position near the town of Krasnogvardis. Kolobanov picked the position himself, overlooking the highway as it wove through the marshes. When a column of German tanks appeared, his tanks took out the lead and rear vehicles and proceeded to destroy all 22 enemy machines. After the battle, Kolobanov's crews counted 156 marks where German shells had hit their tanks but failed to penetrate. After hearing reports about the KV tanks, Hitler once more demanded the capture of Leningrad and its factory that was churning out these monsters. But there weren't enough KV-1s to stop the Germans everywhere. While one German corps was held at Krasnogvardis, others broke through near Lyuban and Tosna. On the 30th of August, the Germans cut the railway and the highway connecting Leningrad with the rest of the country. Finnish troops, allies of the Germans, approached from the north. The city's electricity supply began to fail, but still no civilians were evacuated, an act which might appear defeatist. 
On the 8th of September, the Germans captured Schlieselberg on the shore of Lake Ladoga, the final act of encirclement. It was the beginning of a siege that was to last 882 days. When the siege began, the city's population was more than 2.5 million, including approximately 400,000 children. The city contained 300,000 refugees from the Baltic republics and surrounding area. The city's supplies of food and fuel were sufficient for just 30 days. Soviet counterattacks aimed at lifting the siege were all unsuccessful. The German encirclement near Schlieselberg was only about 12 kilometers wide. This sector was the focus of Soviet attempts to lift the blockade. That summer, Soviet counterattacks had robbed Army Group North of valuable weeks. It was time that could not be got back. Now the attack on Moscow would rob Army Group North of its best units. In his diary, the commander of Army Group North, Field Marshal von Lieb, wrote, 11th of September, desperate shortage of time. The Army High Command demands seven mobile divisions be handed over to its control on the 15th of September. His tanks were on their way towards Moscow. It was a desperately needed respite for Leningrad. The same day, General Zhukov was appointed commander of the Leningrad Front. His deputy, Major General Fedyaninsky came with him. Ivan Ivanovich Fedyaninsky spent most of his military career in the Russian Far East. In 1939, he was made a hero of the Soviet Union for his bravery fighting the Japanese at the Battle of Kalkin Gol. In 1941, he commanded a Soviet rifle corps in Belorussia, where he was badly wounded. Zhukov's appointment immediately inspired the defenders of the city. There was new confidence that Leningrad would be saved. With characteristic energy, Zhukov began to organize the city's defenses. Artillery was to be the key, and his secret weapon would be the massive guns of the Red Banner Baltic Fleet. Powerful naval gunnery halted the first German offensive just seven kilometers from the city. The 12-inch guns of the coastal fort of Krasnoya Gorka also served to hold the German army at bay. The shock waves from their exploding shells were powerful enough to hurl German tanks into the air. But where the German army had failed, the Luftwaffe might still succeed. Three months into the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Army Group North was held up outside Leningrad by the heavy guns of the Soviet Baltic Fleet. So Field Marshal von Lieb turned to his dive bombers to sink the enemy warships. Their first victim was the old battleship Mara. Two 1,000 kilogram bombs struck her bow, causing her forward turret magazine to explode. She quickly sank to the bottom of the bay. Three warships were sunk in total, depriving the city's defences of 35 powerful guns. Around the city, 1,500 loudspeakers broadcast Leningrad city radio. Now it was also used to issue air raid warnings. When there were no radio programmes, a metronome was put on the air. Slow ticking meant all clear. Fast ticking meant take cover. 
it became known as the beating heart of Leningrad. Above the city, German bombers were met with heavy anti-aircraft fire. But the Luftwaffe only made a few large-scale raids. Shelling by German heavy artillery proved much more lethal. Signs went up on street corners with the warning, citizens, this side of the street is more dangerous during shelling. The Germans didn't target Leningrad's tallest buildings or church spires. They were needed as reference points by the artillery spotters, who instead guided shells onto the city's bridges, houses and shops. Leningrad was truly a city on the front line. Monuments were protected by sandbags and wooden screens, but many would not survive German bombardments. On the city's outskirts, the Germans captured the Catherine Palace and the Grand Petergoff Palace. Both were looted and destroyed. The world-famous Amber Room was shipped to Germany. Today, its whereabouts remain a mystery. On the 8th of September, German bombers targeted the wooden Badayev warehouses, where the city's food reserves were stored. The glow of the fires could be seen across the city. Soon everyone knew that the flour and sugar supplies had been destroyed. But the situation was even worse than many feared. The city needed a thousand tons of food every day to prevent starvation, but less than 200 tons were getting through the blockade. The little that could be brought in by air was nowhere near enough to feed the city's population. The main supply route into Leningrad now lay across Lake Ladoga, 50 kilometers of open water. But the lake was notorious for its strong winds and sudden storms. It was why, in 1718, Peter the Great had ordered the construction of the Ladoga Canal along the lake's southern shore to provide a safe waterway to the city. But the Germans had reached the southern shore of Lake Ladoga, cutting the canal and rail links into the city. The people of Leningrad had to build a new port from scratch on the lake's western shore. In the first week of the siege, barges were unloaded straight onto the beach. It was the beginning of a supply route that would come to be known as the Road of Life. Food rationing had been introduced at the start of the war. Leningrad workers received 800 grams of bread a day. Their dependents received 400 grams. By the beginning of October, it had been reduced to half that amount. It wasn't nearly enough to sustain those required to do physical work. At the end of November, the city was on the brink of starvation. Bread rations were cut further, 250 grams for a worker, 125 grams for everyone else. The quality of the bread was falling too, as the authorities turned to unlikely ingredients to increase its bulk. Bakers used burnt flour recovered from the ruins of the Badayev warehouses. They used oats intended for the horses, soya, barley, and even cellulose from the Goznak paper mill. People often had to queue for hours in the freezing cold to receive these meagre rations. In November, 11,000 died from starvation, 350 each day. The medical staff could only look on helplessly. The early winter led to hopes that Lake Ladoga would quickly freeze solid, allowing trucks to bring in supplies across its frozen surface. But the ice took time to harden. The Soviets had hoped to establish a road bridge across the ice using the shortest route. But this would put convoys within range of the German artillery batteries on the southern shore. Slowly, the ice thickened, 
On the 20th of November, across 180 millimetres of ice, the first horse-drawn sleighs crossed the lake. Two days later, the first trucks crossed. It was a perilous crossing. The two-ton vehicles carried much less than their full load. But several still crashed through the ice, disappearing into the frozen depths. Drivers stood on their running boards, ready to leap clear if the ice began to crack. On their return journey, the same trucks were used to evacuate as many civilians as possible. The road of life was 30 kilometres long. It included garages, rest stops and field hospitals. There were several alternative routes, depending on the ice, and driving conditions. To defend the road, two defensive lines were constructed on top of the ice, eight kilometres from the German-held shore. They included machine gun nests and ice trenches. The road was also protected by anti-aircraft guns and air cover. But German bombs and shells still claimed many victims. In the first week alone, 52 trucks were lost. Despite these extraordinary efforts to keep the city supplied and to get the civilians out, 53,000 Leningraders died in December. Most from starvation. There were reports of people dropping dead in the street without warning. Each day, burial detachments had to remove a hundred corpses from Leningrad's pavements. The diary of one Leningrader recorded how despair gave way to apathy. People now die in a very simple manner. First, they lose interest in everything. Then, they lie in bed and never rise again. They die as if falling asleep, and the surrounding people, half dead themselves, pay them no attention. Many drivers on the road of life made two trips every day, one by day, one by night. Dozens of trucks were wrecked in traffic accidents, more than were destroyed by German aircraft. So the order was given for vehicles to start using their headlights. Trucks that crashed through the ice sank so fast that for several minutes the ghostly glow of the headlights could be seen at the bottom of the lake. Almost 300 trucks were lost in the first month of the road. But they had kept the city alive. Hundreds of thousands perished from starvation in that first winter. The scale of the suffering was almost beyond imagination. More than a million would die before this, the most devastating siege in history, was finally over. Leningrad, encircled by German and Finnish forces, witnessed hundreds of civilian deaths every day. But these were not collateral casualties. Hitler had decided that Leningrad should be wiped off the map. Secret orders entitled The Future of Leningrad stated, after Soviet Russia has been defeated, the further existence of this population center is of no interest. In this war for existence, we have no interest in keeping even part of this great city's population. For the Soviet Union, it was vital that Leningrad be held at all costs. It was an important industrial city with many factories and the home base of the Baltic fleet. 
Its loss would mean the loss of the northern port of Murmansk, where the Arctic convoys arrived carrying military aid from Britain and America. And for many, Leningrad remained the cultural and spiritual capital of the USSR. Its fate was watched by people from across the Soviet Union. They came to see their fate entwined with that of the city. The Soviet High Command decided to breach the encirclement at its thinnest point, the schlieselberg sinyavina corridor. Here, only 10 kilometers separated troops of the Red Army's Leningrad Front from the front line of the Volkov Front. But it was heavily defended with three lines of fortifications. On the night of the 19th of September, a small force led by Captain Vasily Dubik crossed the Neva River in fishing boats. His men quietly landed on the far bank and took the German trenches by surprise. With this foothold across the river, a Soviet Marine Brigade moved rapidly to reinforce Dubik's position. This strip of land, called by the soldiers the Nevsky Piatachok, the Neva patch, would become legendary. Two German parachute regiments, redeployed from Crete, were amongst the reinforcements sent to crush the Soviet bridgehead. They were plunged straight into the ferocious fighting. They failed to eliminate the bridgehead, but had squeezed it until it was just two kilometers long and 500 meters deep. In October, this tiny strip of land was the only hope for lifting the siege of Leningrad. All Red Army reserves were on their way to Moscow, where another desperate battle raged. The struggle at the bridgehead was brutal, attritional warfare. German shells swept back and forth across the whole area, forcing the Soviet soldiers to dig deep to find cover. Another attempt to break through was planned for November. By now, bread rations in the city were down to 125 grams. They weren't much more for frontline soldiers. One commander conducted an exercise to test the strength of his men. Most were exhausted after walking just 400 meters. In a speech at Munich on the 8th of November, Hitler declared, Leningrad has nothing to count upon. It will fall sooner or later. There are no forces to raise the siege. Leningrad is doomed to die from starvation. At the beginning of November, the Red Army got tanks across the Neva and captured more German trenches. In turn, the Germans fed in their own reinforcements. In November, the Red Army lost 5,000 men, killed in the Neva patch. The Germans, too, suffered heavy losses. The tiny bridgehead had become a slaughterhouse. In Leningrad itself, 4,000 were dying every day from starvation. On some days, this figure rose to 7,000. January 1942 became the worst month of the entire siege. Non-workers had their food ration stopped entirely. The electricity supply failed. Water pipes froze solid in temperatures of minus 30 degrees centigrade. Furniture, wooden fences, anything that would burn was used for firewood. One Leningrader, Yelena Skriabina, wrote in her diary, death has become a phenomenon observed at every turn. When you step outside in the morning, you stumble over corpses lying in the gateway and in the street. The dead bodies lie there for a long time because there's nobody to dispose of them.
Even in the worst months of the siege, the people of Leningrad still went to work. The Kirov factory, just four kilometers from the front line, didn't stop producing tanks for a single day. Half-assembled tanks were even used to fire on the enemy from the factory floor. The Leningrad Institute of Plant Industry was dedicated to the research of commercial crops. It contained the world's largest seed bank. 28 institute workers died from starvation during the siege. But the plant breeding collection containing several tons of crops, rice and potatoes remained intact. In February 1942, the food situation gradually began to improve. The ration was increased to 500 grams for workers, 400 grams for office workers, 300 grams for children and non-workers. The revolting additives to the bread were used less and less. People now received their rations on time and almost in full. On the 16th of February, meat in the form of frozen beef and mutton was distributed amongst the population for the first time in months. Things were starting to look up. So far in the war, the Red Army's prospects of lifting the Leningrad siege had been limited because the fighting around Moscow had sucked up all available reserves. But by January 1942, the German army was retreating from Moscow. Now, a large-scale operation was possible at Leningrad. Soviet divisions on the Volkhov River prepared to assault the flank and rear of German Army Group North. Swampy, broken ground meant that tanks were of little use. The success of this offensive will be down to the infantry and the artillery. Meanwhile, General Fijininsky was put in command of the 54th Army, tasked with breaking through to the besieged city. The Germans turned the high railway embankment near the village of Pogostye into a formidable earthwork. Red Army losses were horrendous. Their progress, minimal. The second shock army, under General Klekov, attacked German positions near the town of Lyuban, to the south of the fortified corridor. But in their haste to raise the siege, the Stavka High Command ordered attacks that were not properly planned and lacked proper artillery support. One divisional commander, General Antufeyev, reported, after crossing the river and climbing the left bank, our infantry came under intense machine gun and mortar fire. Our artillery couldn't suppress the enemy fire. It couldn't even make a proper ranging and didn't have enough ammunition. The survivors had to return to their starting positions. Red Army units had advanced 30 kilometers through the frozen forests and swamps. It was the same distance again to reach Leningrad. The threat of encirclement hovered over the German troops. The logical decision seemed to be to order a retreat, but Hitler had forbidden any more retreats. Field Marshal von Lee, commander of Army Group North, asked to be relieved of command. General von Kuchler was now in charge. Von Kuchler concentrated on holding key roads and railways. This approach was the German salvation. Army Group North was able to keep its units resupplied and reserves could be moved quickly to threatened areas. Meanwhile, the lead units of the second shock army had to be supplied by the only road that ran along a corridor just five kilometers wide between the villages of Zamosia and Spaskiopolis. The forward units were short of ammunition, food and fuel. The Soviet offensive was called off in February. Now the men prepared to defend the ground they'd captured. But it wasn't easy digging in in the middle of a swamp. 
and the supply problems meant many soldiers began to suffer from malnutrition. In March, Hitler demanded that von Kuchler encircle the Soviet troops that had dented the German line. The operation was codenamed Wild Beast. A simultaneous assault by five German divisions effectively sealed off the Soviet penetration. The Soviet Second Shock Army was virtually cut off from the rest of the army. Just a tiny corridor, 1.5 to 2 kilometers wide, was left open. All that remained was for the Germans to crush the encircled Soviet units. But first, they launched a fresh assault against the Neva patch. By April, a thousand Soviet soldiers were dug in there. The Germans waited until the River Neva was full of drifting ice, making it impossible for the Soviets to reinforce the bridgehead. Then they unleashed a torrential artillery barrage. The last sign of life seen from across the river was a crude banner bearing the single word, help. Meanwhile, the encircled Second Shock Army received a new commander, Lieutenant General Andrei Vlasov. By the beginning of May, the Stavka had decided to try to extricate the remnants of this battered force. But the day before the planned withdrawal, the Germans attacked. The Soviets fought desperately to hold the perimeter as units began to withdraw through the tiny corridor back to the front line. But it was slow progress, and four days later, the Germans finally cut off the Second Shock Army. A Soviet artillery officer recorded conditions inside the pocket. The entire area was swept by German fire. The dead and wounded lay all around. Some were delirious. Others cried out for water to drink. Some even asked us to shoot them because they couldn't do it themselves. The Germans didn't attack. They kept us trapped like an animal in its lair and bombed and shelled without mercy. The last soldiers to escape slipped out under cover of darkness. By the end of June, 10,000 had got away, but the Germans had 30,000 prisoners. Amongst them was the commander of the Second Shock Army, General Andrei Vlasov. Vlasov agreed to cooperate with his German captors and became a willing tool of Nazi propaganda. He wrote pamphlets entitled The Appeal of the Russian Liberation Committee to Soldiers and Commanders of the Red Army and Why Have I Taken Up the Struggle Against Bolshevism? In them, he appealed to Red Army soldiers to join a new anti-Bolshevik Russian Liberation Army. Vlasov helped to recruit Russian prisoners of war to fight against Stalin. General Vlasov became so notorious that Russians referred to all Soviets who sided with the Germans as Vlasovtsi. But most had no allegiance to General Vlasov. The so-called heavies were Soviet prisoners of war who helped the Germans in non-combat roles. And many anti-Bolsheviks and nationalists from the USSR fought in their own Wehrmacht units, known as the Eastern Legions. Most of Vlasov's Russian Liberation Army was captured near Prague in 1945. Its men were sent to the Gulag. Vlasov and other officers were hanged as traitors. The Red Army had failed to break the Leningrad siege in the spring of 1942. Now, the road of life across Lake Ladoga began to melt. On just one day, the 20th of April, about 80 trucks were lost through the thinning ice. The road of life was closed to heavy vehicles. The Russians waited anxiously for the lake to open to shipping. They knew that when it did, ships and ports would come under heavy air and artillery attack. The severe winter meant it wasn't until the 22nd of May that the lake was clear of drifting ice. The first ships made their crossings, evacuating civilians and bringing in supplies. 
Soviet air defences proved highly effective. Only 1% of incoming supplies were lost to German air attack. The Germans sent for Italian MAS torpedo boats, which had proved effective in the Mediterranean, and Siebel armed ferries, which had been designed for the invasion of England. But despite grand expectations, Axis naval forces failed to make an impact. Russian tugs and barges had an extremely shallow draft, so torpedoes passed harmlessly underneath them. Their naval bases and ships were hit hard by the Red Army Air Force. Axis naval operations were abandoned. It remained critical to break the siege of Leningrad. The road of life, by water or ice, brought in the bare minimum to keep the city fed and the troops supplied with fuel and ammunition. Six months later, in November 1942, the front commanders, General Zhukov and Marshal Voroshilov, began to plan Operation Iskra. It was decided to attack once more at the bottleneck, where the German encirclement was thinnest. Units of the Volkov Front would attack from without, as troops of the Leningrad Front attacked from within. The artillery barrage began at dawn on the 12th of January 1943. As the last shells whistled overhead, the assault began. But everywhere, the Red Army ran into fierce resistance from well-entrenched German troops. T-34s could only crawl across what was effectively a heavily cratered peat bog. They were easy pickings for the German anti-tank guns. But the simultaneous attack on both fronts began to bear fruit. After two days, just two kilometers separated the Soviet troops. These final meters proved the hardest. Soviet tanks were knocked out or got stuck in the bog. It was up to the infantry to storm the German positions. General Fedyaninsky, now deputy front commander, repeatedly visited the front line to urge his men on. He ordered attacks around the clock. There was to be no let-up for the German defenders. The German tactic, as before, was to hold key positions along the transport network. Work settlements number one and number five on the only road between the lake and the rail terminus were turned into fortresses. If the Red Army could just cut the road, the German defense was doomed. Von Kuchler had to decide whether to hold on or withdraw from the bottleneck. He opted to hold on. <laughs> Under unrelenting assault from both sides, the German defences began to crumble. The Red Army, sustaining massive losses all the way, fought through the intricate German defences. At the last moment, German units at Schlieselberg made a dash for safety, but not many made it. At midnight on the 18th of January 1943, Yuri Levitan, the voice of Soviet wartime radio, was able to announce, after seven days of fighting, troops of the Volkov and Leningrad fronts met on the 18th of January and raised the siege of Leningrad. In just three weeks, a railway was built across the cratered landscape of the bottleneck. It was just five kilometers from the German lines and under constant shell fire. Leningrad was still on the front line but at last it was getting enough food and fuel. The Red Army lacked the strength to push the Germans back any further. The reserves of German Army Group North had arrived and were dug in on the high ground. German defences were traditionally built around the MG-34 or the MG-42 machine gun. The rest of the infantry were effectively there to support the machine gun team. By autumn 1943, 
the Red Army had developed tactics for attacking German infantry. Soviet rifle platoons, supported by artillery and mortars, aimed to wipe out enemy machine gun positions in the first few minutes of the assault. The remaining rifle-armed Germans would be seriously outgunned by Soviet troops armed with submachine guns. But from late 1943, the Germans began to change the balance once more with the introduction of the MP-43. Now, if the infantry squad's machine gun team was knocked out, a squad armed with the new MP-43s could still provide heavy, accurate fire against enemy attackers. Hitler himself gave the new weapon its name, Sturmgewehr, the assault rifle. It wasn't until the beginning of 1944 that the Stavka launched the operation that would finally end the siege of Leningrad. By then, German Army Group North had had nearly two years to dig in on the outskirts of the city. The Stavka planned to begin the operation at the Oranian-bound bridgehead, which had stubbornly held out against the Germans thanks to the heavy guns of its coastal fort. From here, the Red Army would launch itself against the flank of German Army Group North. Leading the attack would be General Fedianinsky at the head of the Second Shock Army, which had been secretly redeployed to the bridgehead under the cover of darkness. By attacking from the coast, the massive firepower of the Baltic fleet could be used to support the assault, with more than a hundred heavy naval guns available for the operation. They included the guns of the battleship Mara, refloated after being sunk by Stukas in 1941, and the enormous coastal guns of the Krasnaya Gorka fort. The assault began on the 14th of January 1944. Soviet newspapers and radio carried no reports about the operation, but the people of Leningrad could hear the distant thunder of the bombardment. They knew what it meant, that the final offensive was underway, the one that would end the siege once and for all. No one doubted its success. The attack from Oranienbaum caught Army Group North by surprise. In the face of an overwhelming Soviet assault, German defenses collapsed. A week later, Soviet troops, laden with captured trophies, met at the town of Ropsha. German Army Group North's retreat became a rout. The front line raced away from Leningrad. The rumble of guns receded into the distance. At long last, silence descended over the city of Leningrad. According to official reports, 642,000 civilians died during the siege of Leningrad. But many deaths never made it into an official report. The real total was probably nearer one million. 3% were caused by bombs and shells, 97% by starvation. About 1.8 million people were evacuated from Leningrad during the war. By 1945, the city's population was just one-fifth of what it had been at the start of the war. This was the longest siege of a large city in World War II and the costliest siege in history. Army Group North was bogged down in the forests and swamps around Leningrad for more than two years. It comprised one-fifth of German strength on the Eastern Front. But pinned outside Leningrad, it was unable to influence the war's decisive battles, all of which were fought on other fronts. Far to the south, in the vast open expanse between Kharkov and the Volga River, the Red Army would have to learn to fight another kind of war, highly mobile armoured warfare. And it was here in the south in 1942 that the world would learn the name of another Soviet city, Stalingrad.
Red Army was pulling back across the Volga. Suddenly, enormous explosions ripped through the city behind them. The ammunition and fuel dumps in Rajev were being blown up to prevent them falling into enemy hands. Everywhere, there was confusion. The roads were crowded with retreating soldiers. No one knew where it would end. It seemed the whole front was collapsing. It was October 1941. The Germans had launched Operation Typhoon, the battle for Moscow. The German army was in Rajev, just hours behind the Soviets. An investigation into the conduct of Soviet commanders at Rajev cleared them of wrongdoing. There had been no way to get the ammunition out. The Luftwaffe had already destroyed all transport connections to the city. The Red Army ammunition dumps were at Rajev because the city lay at the heart of the rail network. Both sides depended on ammunition, food and fuel by the train load. It made Rajev a valuable prize. Red Army units retreating from Rojev were reorganized into the Kalinin Front. Their new commander was Colonel General Ivan Stepanovich Konyev. Konyev was the son of Russian peasants and became a conscript of the Tsarist Army in 1916. By 1941, he'd risen to senior command and was put in charge of a front, the Soviet equivalent of an army group. However, his forces became encircled in the opening phase of Operation Typhoon. Konyev's conduct was investigated by the State Defense Committee, led by Molotov and Voroshilov. Konyev's predecessor, General Pavlov, had been shot following a similar investigation. But Konyev was saved by Zhukov's intervention. Zhukov knew any general could have a bad day. And shooting competent officers with the enemy at the gates of the capital was counterproductive. That winter, outside Moscow, the Red Army launched a massive counterattack. The German 9th Army was forced to retreat from Kalinin back to Rojev. Hitler's response was to sack Army Group Center's commander, Fedor von Bock. He was given just a few hours to brief his successor, Field Marshal von Kluger. Von Bock painted a bleak picture. He warned von Kluger that he believed the enemy was preparing a powerful strike against both flanks of Army Group Center. Gunther von Kluger had been promoted field marshal the previous year, following his success in the Battle of France. He came from a Prussian family with a long tradition of military service. In 1944, he would take his own life, following the failure of the army plot to assassinate Hitler. Von Bock's warning proved accurate. As Zhukov attacked from the east, Konyev's 39th Army broke through the German lines west of Rajev, threatening Army Group Center's supply lines. The Soviet 29th Army followed through the breach, threatening Rajev itself. The Germans clung on desperately. Heinrich Harper, a medic in the German 6th Infantry Division, described the chaos. We got reinforcements from construction companies and rear units. Many didn't know anything about handling weapons. They were cannon fodder thrown into the battle. While we changed positions after firing, the newcomers always shot from the same spot. 
One burst from a Russian machine gun was all it took. In 12 hours, from 130 new men, 26 were left. Konyev's counterattack encircled the German 23rd Corps near Olenina. But Zhukov's advance became bogged down in fighting around Yuknov. Only Bilov's cavalry corps broke through to Vyazma. Because of the almost total destruction of Red Army tank units in the first weeks of the war, by late 1941, the Soviets were forced to look elsewhere for fast-moving offensive units. They turned to their cavalry. The cavalry was used to exploit breakthroughs and attack enemy lines of communication. Each cavalry corps included one tank brigade, anti-tank guns and mortars. The cavalry were, in effect, mobile infantry. Horses got them there, but then the men dismounted to fight and the horses were led to the rear. Mounted cavalry charges were for the newsreels. Later in the war, the Red Army created cavalry mechanized groups containing cavalry, tanks, self-propelled guns and rocket artillery. These formations were powerful and highly mobile. On the 16th of January, General Strauss asked to be relieved as commander of the German 9th Army. His replacement was Walter Model. Model now turned the tables on the Soviets. First, he broke through to the isolated 23rd Corps. Then he cut off the Soviet 29th Army. Konyev launched ferocious counterattacks in a bid to rescue his trapped units. But Model successfully parried one blow after another. The Soviets failed to break through. Konyev ordered the encircled men to save themselves. On the 17th of February, a small airborne force was parachuted in to guide the troops back through the lines. 5,200 men of the 29th Army made it back. 14,000 did not. The Soviet plan to cut the smolensk vyazma highway, thereby cutting off German Army Group Center, had ended in a bloody failure. The losses were extraordinary, but casualty claims remain controversial. The Soviets admitted to a staggering 341,000 casualties on the Kalinin front. The Western Front suffered an additional 105,000 casualties, while German Army Group Center sustained an estimated 150,000 casualties. Summer 1942. The drone of a light aircraft could be heard over the forest and the occasional crack of a rifle. Field Marshal von Kluger was indulging in his new hobby, fox hunting from the air. It was a dangerous sport. Partisans and stranded Red Army soldiers hid in the forest. Model had recently been wounded by a lucky shot. After the winter fighting, many Soviet units were cut off behind the German front line. The front here had become a confusing patchwork of pockets and salients. The largest salient projected into the forests around the town of Zhukovsky. It contained parts of the Soviet 39th Army and 11th Cavalry Corps. They were supplied along a narrow corridor through enemy lines. Artillery officer Mikhail Lukinov described conditions. There weren't many of us, and no one was in good shape. All the horses had died. The sick and wounded were taken out on foot, and some of us envied them. The Stavka was not willing to give up any of its hard-won ground, no matter how exposed it left the troops. 
And now, disaster loomed. On the 2nd of July, the Germans launched Operation Seidlitz. Within three days, they had closed the corridor at the village of Pushkari. It meant the encirclement of the 39th Army, the 11th Cavalry Corps, and also parts of the 41st and 22nd Armies. Attempts to break out lasted for several days. Polyakov, a signals officer from a guard's rifle division, described the atmosphere. At headquarters, there was a sense of calm foreboding. You could sense people thinking, we've done all we can. Now duty demands we go to the very end. But while his troops fought bravely on, 39th Army Commander General Maslenikov was evacuated by air. His injured deputy, General Ivan Bogdanov, was also flown out, but died of his wounds. 18,000 soldiers escaped the trap. More than 60,000 did not. Operation Seidlitz gave the Rzhev bulge its definitive shape. At its tip, the city of Rzhev and the junction of two rail arteries, one running east-west from Moscow to Veliki Luki, the other running north-south from Torzhok to Vyazma. German control of Rzhev prevented the Soviets moving men and supplies between the two flanks. But if Rzhev fell, the Red Army would be able to launch powerful offensives on both flanks. They would trap and destroy German forces in the salient. What's more, the German lines here were only 150 kilometers from the Soviet capital. It was imperative that Soviet forces drive the enemy as far from Moscow as possible. In July 1942, the Wehrmacht launched a new offensive in southern Russia to capture the Caucasus oil fields. The Red Army retreated towards Rostov and Stalingrad. Stalin issued his famous Order Number 227, not a step back. At the Rzhev salient, the fighting had settled into a routine of bombardments and small-scale raids. For the Eastern Front, this was what passed for a quiet patch. But it was the calm before the storm. The Soviets were preparing something big. B-4 guns, dubbed Stalin sledgehammers, had arrived at the front. The B-4 was a Soviet 203mm heavy howitzer. It was a fearsome weapon, used for smashing enemy fortifications and strong points. B-4 batteries were under the direct command of the Stavka Strategic Reserve, this meant that wherever they showed up, something big was being planned. The explosion of a 100 kilogram B-4 shell would instantly catch the Germans' attention. So to keep the presence of the heavy guns secret, gunners carried out their ranging fire with light howitzers. The results were then recalculated for the B-4s. But that wasn't all the Soviets were hiding. The new M30 rocket launcher was about to make its operational debut. M30s were similar to the famous Katyusha truck-mounted rocket launchers, but this version carried a heavier 300mm rocket with a bulbous warhead which meant the launcher had to be installed directly into the ground. Each M30 could be loaded with four or later eight rockets. It was a crude but devastating weapon, nicknamed Pounding Ivan by the troops. Each rocket had a range of 2.8 kilometers, 
Later in the war, an M31 rocket was developed with a range of more than four kilometers. It was fired from a car-mounted launcher known as Andriusha. The front line was quiet when Leonid Sandilov, chief of staff of the 20th Army, went to visit. On a clear day, you could see German guards changing shifts, smoke coming from dugouts, and soldiers bailing out their trenches with buckets. In the evenings, you could hear them playing their harmonicas. These routines were carefully observed by Red Army staff officers disguised as common soldiers. This sector, near the Derja River, had been chosen by the Stavka High Command for an ambitious operation. The orders from the Stavka were to seize control of the cities of Rezhev and Zubtsov, and then to advance to fortify the lines of the Volga and Vazuza rivers. The attack was to be made by two armies of the Kalinin Front and two armies of the Western Front. It would commence on the 28th of July, 1942. But the Germans were preparing their own offensive. The Germans planned to attack at Sukinishki, where there was a bulge in the front. Operation Whirlwind would be the classic German pincer move. Two blows from north and south to encircle Soviet troops in the bulge. Summer rainstorms turned roads into swamps. The Western Front's attack had to be delayed, but Konyev's Kalinin Front went ahead without them on the 30th of July. Its troops had been given two days to capture Rezhev. General Khladnikov, the Kalinin Front's artillery commander, reported the effects of his barrage. Two of the forward positions of the enemy's main defensive line were destroyed. The forces occupying them were almost completely wiped out. But Modo used the German 6th Infantry Division to plug any gaps that appeared in the line. Battles raged for days over villages and landmarks. To the north of Rezhev, Polonino village and Hill 200 were the focus of bitter fighting. A battalion commander from the 6th Infantry Division tried to describe the experience. Our trenches were under constant artillery and mortar fire. It's hard to imagine the sheer number of guns, the indescribable sound of the rockets. The wounded drag themselves to the rear. They say it's all bad in the front line. The Russians destroy our guns and are leveling our positions. But still, the Soviet infantry failed to break through. Soviet infantry tactics weren't helping. In 1942, Red Army doctrine stated that infantry should be drawn up in two echelons. For a division, this meant two regiments in the first echelon and one behind. Their battalions and companies were arranged in the same way. It allowed a division to move quickly to exploit a successful attack. It also meant that in a rifle division, only eight out of 27 companies were in the front line. Attacks were weakened, and units in the rear were exposed to shells and bombs long before they'd even engaged the enemy. In the bloody fighting around Rezhev, the Red Army would learn many painful lessons.
The 4th of August, 1942. The dawn silence was about to be broken by a deafening cannonade. Stalin's sledgehammers had joined the battle. Then, the Katyushas joined in. Five days late, Zhukov's Western Front had joined the battle. As Zhukov's troops advanced, they liberated their first Russian village. At Pegoroloi Gorodisha, they learned firsthand about the brutality of Nazi occupation. Jews had been murdered. Russians starved, or transported to the Reich as forced labor. From a population of 3,076, only 905 remained. In two days of slow and costly advances, the 20th Army reached the Vazuza and Gajak rivers. Now, it had to storm across them, take Sitchevka, and so cut the vital vyazma rozhev rail line. Modol hurriedly redeployed the five divisions, three of them armored, that had been earmarked for Operation Whirlwind. The attacking Red Army units were decimated. Zhukov was forced onto the defensive. He turned his attention to the village of Kamanovo on his left flank. It was a virtual fortress, protected by the Yalze River in front and impenetrable swamps on both flanks. For the Soviet infantry, it meant more suicidal frontal assaults. On the 21st of August, the Kalinin Front finally took Polonino and advanced to the outskirts of Rzhev. The Western Front managed to outflank Kamanovo. The village fell on the 23rd of August. Modol demanded that von Kluger release three more divisions to help shore up 9th Army's position. He got them. With these reinforcements and his skillful handling of the tactical situation, Modal was able to fight the Soviet offensive to a standstill. Red Army gains had fallen far short of expectations. Stalin now telephoned Zhukov at Western Front headquarters. He told him, you must report to the Stavka as soon as possible. Think carefully about who will take over from you there. Stalin was sending Zhukov south to oversee the defense of Stalingrad. Zhukov had named Ivan Konyev as his successor at Western Front headquarters. Konyev immediately ordered a new strategy. There would be no more attempts to cut the railway at Sitchevka. Instead, Konyev would concentrate all his resources on driving the Germans out of Rozhev. New offensives were launched in late August. Konyev seemed on the brink of victory. But once more, Modal received reinforcements in the nick of time.
they included the elite Großdeutschland Motorized Infantry Division. This unit exemplified the superior equipment, tactics and training still possessed by the German army. In October, the Soviets were forced to abandon their offensive. The Rezhev sector began to quieten down. That summer, Modal's 9th Army had lost 60,000 men. Soviet casualties were 314,000 men, more than five times as many. Red Army soldiers called it the Rezhev meat grinder. Alexander Bodner was in the midst of it. We'd never attacked in the summer before that, and we didn't know how to attack the summer German. I was a kilometer behind the front, and suddenly I saw a field covered with our dead. Young boys with guard badges, wearing brand new uniforms. The German machine gunner was just mowing them down. We were still learning how to fight from the Germans, right up until Stalingrad. But after Stalingrad, we had nothing to learn. We knew everything. The Russian poet, Alexander Trifonovich Tvardovsky, gave a voice to the dead. I was killed near Rezhev, in a nameless bog, in Fifth Company, on the left flank, in a cruel air raid. I did not hear the explosions and did not see the flash. Down to an abyss from a cliff, no start, no end. And in this whole world, till the end of its days, neither patches nor badges from my tunic you'll find. November 1942. At a Red Army Air Force base near Moscow, air crew rushed to inspect a brand new arrival. This sleek new twin engine bomber was the Tupolev Tu 2. The Tu 2 was a high speed bomber with a crew of four. It was armed with two 20 millimeter cannon three defensive machine guns, and could carry more than three tons of bombs. The designer, Andrei Nikolaevich Tupolev, worked for the aviation design bureau known as OKB-29. They were based at 24 Radio Street, Moscow, where they were closely supervised by the NKVD secret police. Most Soviet wartime designers and engineers worked under similar supervision by the authorities, some whilst under actual arrest. The Germans still held Rezhev and the crucial rail hub. It made it difficult to resupply the Kalinin front for a fresh assault. So the Stavka allocated it more transport aircraft to get supplies in by air. It was all part of the build-up to a new offensive, codenamed Operation Mars. In November 1942, the Red Army planned to encircle German forces at Stalingrad in Operation Uranus. Mars would be a simultaneous hammer blow at Rezhev that would prevent the Wehrmacht sending reinforcements south. Zhukov, who had been in the south acting as the Stavka's representative on the Stalingrad front, would return north to command Operation Mars personally. The offensive would be carried out by Konyev's Western Front and the Kalinin Front, now commanded by General Maxim Pokayev. Zhukov would oversee them both. 
the Red Army would attack with 660,000 men and 2,000 tanks. It was clear that Zhukov hoped for a significant breakthrough. On the first day of the operation, a harsh wind blew from the southwest, bringing heavy grey clouds. Wet snow fell from the sky. Visibility was down to 20 yards. Zhukov and Konyev had placed great emphasis on close air support, but nothing could fly in this weather. There was no question of postponing the attack. On the west side of the Rezhev salient, one Soviet mechanized corps broke through the positions of a Luftwaffe field division, while Katukov's third mechanized corps advanced along the Luchesi Valley. Model and von Kluger committed all their forces to the battle. Supreme High Command reserves were now en route to Army Group Center from Smolensk. From the east of the salient, Soviet tanks and cavalry briefly cut the railway line to Rezhev. But with the help of an armoured train, the Germans threw them back. The Red Army sent wave after wave into the attack. But the German defences were well organised and held by well-armed, experienced troops. Soviet losses were enormous. But the German high command foresaw disaster. If defences around Belia crumbled, the whole salient could be cut off and destroyed. The fighting in the Lucchesi Valley would prove critical. Here, the Germans finally managed to contain the Soviet advance. Far to the south, Field Marshal von Manstein was preparing an offensive to rescue German forces trapped at Stalingrad. It was codenamed Operation Winter Storm. But there were serious concerns that it lacked the strength to break through to Stalingrad. When von Manstein asked for more divisions, he was told no. The strategic reserve had already been committed at Rezhev. As Operation Mars continued, German infantry fought a bloody struggle in freezing conditions for a handful of vital highways and railway lines. Elite German units who fought here would remember these months as the worst of the entire war. Katukov's third mechanized corps was just two kilometers short of cutting the highway to Rezhev. He was down from 270 tanks to just 70. But Operation Mars could go no further. By the 20th of December, the offensive had ground to a halt. The Red Army was still outmatched by the Wehrmacht. Although in some arenas, such as sniping, the Soviets were highly proficient, they still lacked crucial capabilities. Many lives were being wasted in repeated frontal attacks on German strongpoints. Their tanks and infantry still hadn't learned to work together effectively. The Red Army often lacked good intelligence of enemy forces. One captured Soviet officer told the Germans he'd been shocked when their reserves arrived. A German intelligence report picked up this point. The enemy wasn't counting on these troops appearing. No German reserve forces are marked on any of the Soviet maps we've recovered. Soviet statistics put casualties for Operation Mars at 216,000. They may have been much higher. German 9th Army casualties 
were 53,000. Von Kluge, commander of Army Group Center, was awarded the Oak Leaf Cluster to his Knight's Cross. But in secret, the field marshal was already plotting against Hitler. In July 1944, von Kluge was in France commanding the Western Front when von Stauffenberg tried to blow up the Führer at his headquarters in East Prussia. When it became clear the plot had failed, von Kluge took a cyanide pill. He was succeeded by his former subordinate, Walter Model, who would also later commit suicide to avoid Soviet war crimes charges. There were no medals for the Red Army commanders. Konyev was relieved of command, but he was soon back in favor. He later led the first Ukrainian front into Germany and Berlin. The commander of the Kalinin front, Maxim Pokayev, was reassigned to the Far East, where he remained for the rest of the war. Operation Mars was a bloody defeat for the Red Army, and it was a personal failure for Marshal Zhukov. For these reasons, the events were largely ignored by Soviet historians and are hardly known in the West. But despite the enormous casualties, the offensive did achieve something. Army Group Center's reserves had been pinned down at Rezhev. It meant they had not been available to assist von Manstein's rescue operation at Stalingrad. General Model's 9th Army had suffered heavy casualties too. These were experienced officers and men that Germany would struggle to replace. In January 1943, Veliki Luki was liberated, a town 250 kilometers west of Rezhev. The loss of this important transport hub hampered German supply and put the Rojev salient in an even more precarious situation. On the 26th of January, 1943, von Kluge requested permission to withdraw from the Rojev salient. Five days later, Paulus surrendered at Stalingrad. Hitler, suddenly anxious to avoid another encirclement, gave von Kluge permission to retreat. 9th Army would be vulnerable as it withdrew from the salient, so its staff had begun planning the retreat even before Hitler's permission came through. The result was codenamed Buffalo, a massive operation to move 365,000 men to new prepared positions 100 kilometers to the rear. As the Germans prepared to withdraw, they launched a large-scale anti-partisan operation. They rounded up Red Army stragglers and many innocent civilians too. All faced swift and summary punishment. A corporal from the 4th Panzer Division described how such operations were conducted. Our patrol arrested an old man and six-year-old boy carrying potatoes and salt. They claimed they were going fishing, but they were obviously delivering food to the partisans. We didn't detain them for too long. We sent them on their way to paradise. In the East, such crimes had become commonplace. Now, as the Germans retreated, Modell gave orders to deport all males of working age confiscate all food supplies, poison wells, and burn villages. For these actions, he would be declared a war criminal by the USSR. The German retreat began on the 1st of March, 1943. Engineers waited to blow the Volga Bridge after the last unit had crossed. Hitler had demanded to hear the explosion for himself. It was carried by telephone line back to Führer headquarters. Across no man's land, a Russian medic noticed something was up. A strange silence filled the air. Not a sound, neither from the German side nor ours. 
Slowly, our men left their trenches. More and more of those daredevils with every minute. Then I heard a cry. Fritz has run away. The German withdrawal was conducted in stages. In their wake, they left landmines and booby traps. Modal's scorched earth policy spared nothing. When the Red Army liberated Viasma, they found total devastation. Every building had been demolished or gutted. Every telegraph pole had been cut down. Every railway point smashed. Even oil drums had been riddled with bullets. German soldiers spoke of having left Rejev undefeated. But the reality was that they were retreating to avoid a second Stalingrad. The battles of Rajev saw some of the most ferocious, futile bloodletting of the entire war. Red Army casualties were estimated at 1.2 million. The only recompense was that the Germans too had suffered appallingly. On the 3rd of April 1943, Modell was awarded the swords to his Knight's Cross. He was also told to prepare his 9th Army for a new offensive. Operation Citadel. The general had no illusions about the prospects for this new offensive. His forces, although nominally large, contained many units worn down and exhausted by the long winter fighting. Now, they were to be thrown into the white heat of the Battle of Kursk. Early on the morning of the 19th of June, 1942, an unarmed German liaison plane glided to Earth near Red Army positions. There was no trail of smoke or obvious reason for its crash landing. When Soviet troops later captured the aircraft, they found a single bullet hole through its petrol tank. The pilot was killed in the shootout that followed before he could destroy his briefcase, which contained top secret documents. Red Army soldiers grabbed the prize and brought it back to their trenches. The dead German was Major Reichel, head of operations for the German 23rd Panzer Division. He was carrying plans for a forthcoming operation codenamed Case Blue. The offensive was part of Hitler's plan to capture the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus region. Major Reichel's documents revealed just a small part of the operation. 
and there was always the risk that they were planted by the Germans to deliberately mislead the enemy. After examining the captured papers, Stalin advised caution. It is safe to assume that similar plans have been developed for all the other fronts as well, he wrote. But Case Blue was for real. It was launched by the Wehrmacht on the 28th of June, 1942. Case Blue called for German Army Group South to split into two parts. Army Group A was to attack the Caucasus region and seize the Soviet oil fields. Army Group B, led by Paulus's 6th Army, was to advance eastwards towards the Volga River and Stalingrad, covering the advance into the Caucasus. The German columns dashed towards Voronezh, Stalingrad and Rostov-on-Don. Despite the warnings, the Red Army's southern sector hadn't received nearly enough reinforcements to withstand the impact. Soon, the Soviets were in full retreat. During a meeting of the Stavka, the Soviet high command, Stalin turned to front commander Timoshenko and demanded, why does the front command not know where its troops are? As far as I recall, there were 14 divisions in those armies. That's over 100,000 soldiers. Timoshenko was removed from command within days. Vasily Gordov became the new front commander. But a new commander was not enough to salvage the situation. The army's retreat continued as one population center after another fell to the Nazis. Soviet soldiers surrendered in growing numbers. Many of them went across to the enemy, becoming the so-called Hevi. The term Hevi came from the German Hilfswilliger, meaning those willing to help. It referred to Soviet citizens, including ex-soldiers, who volunteered to help the German armed forces. They usually served in support roles, such as drivers, medical orderlies, or cooks. As the Red Army retreat continued, Stalin issued his famous Order No. 227. It gave birth to the famous slogan, not a step back. The order read, all talk about us having plenty of room in which to retreat endlessly, about our territory being vast, our country being large and rich, our population numerous, and there always being bread in abundance. All this talk must be eliminated. We will not tolerate any commander or commissar who allows their unit to leave its positions without authorization. Panic mongers and cowards must be exterminated on the spot. So-called blocking detachments were created. These units had orders to fire on their own men if they tried to retreat. Many approved of the order. It should have been issued earlier, one Red Army soldier wrote. If it had, we wouldn't have given up our winter positions. Many thought the order would prove impossible to enforce. The blocking detachments were rarely more than a few hundred strong and often made up of the worst soldiers in the unit. The four blocking detachments of the 62nd Army totaled 650 men. They were expected to enforce a no-retreat order on an army of 56,000 men. In reality, blocking detachments were only good for rounding up malingerers and sending them back to the front. But new slogans and blocking detachments were not going to stop the Wehrmacht. In crowded railway stations across the Soviet Empire, new recruits were ordered aboard their railway transports. From all corners of the land, troop trains rolled towards the River Don. Meanwhile, German troops were continuing their advance on Stalingrad. The 6th Army had almost reached the Don, but its commander was uneasy. Friedrich Paulus had served as chief of staff in various army divisions since 1935. He'd helped to plan Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the USSR. When Field Marshal von Reichenau, commander of the 6th Army, died of natural causes, 
Paulus was given command. Paulus's superiors described him as clever and talented, but questions remained about his decisiveness. With his staff officer background, Paulus had more the air of a civil servant than a general. He was not lionized by his men, as his predecessor von Reichenau had been. It was Paulus's lot to be constantly compared to von Reichenau, much to his irritation. The Sixth Army consisted of 270,000 men, 3,400 guns and mortars, and 350 tanks, supported by 1,100 aircraft. The Soviet Stalingrad Front could muster 300,000 troops, 5,500 guns, 230 tanks, and 1,000 aircraft. Although the Red Army had a numerical superiority, its forces had to cover a front of more than 500 kilometers. Paulus, in contrast, could gather his forces into a single fist, ready to smash east towards Stalingrad and the Volga. The Germans began their advance across the Don steppe. Here, the Don River, running north to south, comes very close to the River Volga before turning southwest to form a long bend. Within that bend, the Soviet armies dug in. The steep Don riverbank, between 25 and 30 meters high, made retreat difficult. A German breakthrough here could leave Soviet troops trapped on the wrong side of the river. For the Red Army, to stand and fight was the only option. The German offensive at the Don Bend began on the 17th of July, 1942. The Germans anticipated a rapid victory against an enemy they had defeated many times already. But stubborn resistance caused the fighting to drag on for many more days than expected. This holdup threatened the success of the entire German summer offensive. If Paulus's army didn't reach Stalingrad, Army Group A, moving into the Caucasus, could easily become cut off by Soviet counterattacks. Fourth Panzer Army, under General Hoth, now swung around to threaten Stalingrad from the south. The city, named after Stalin, was becoming the center of attention. Soon, all the eyes of the world would be upon it. By the end of August 1942, the German Sixth Army had wiped out Soviet resistance west of the Don. Red Army survivors were retreating to the eastern bank of the Great River. The Germans were now only 60 kilometers from Stalingrad. Meanwhile, General Hoth tanks were approaching from the south. Hoth's 150-kilometer drive across the steppe allowed him to unexpectedly burst onto the enemy's flank. Soviet troops in this area were part of the Southeastern Front, commanded by General Yerimenka. Near a small railway station, southwest of Stalingrad, they greeted advancing German tanks with volley fire from Katyusha rocket launchers. Yerimenko reported to the Stavka High Command, pilots whom I sent to reconnoiter the battlefield reported that the whole area is on fire. Every bit of it was burning. I conclude that the Katyushas made a lot of trouble there. Hoth's offensive was stopped in its tracks. This success led to Yerimenko's promotion. Soon, he was coordinating the actions of the southeastern and Stalingrad fronts in the defense of the city. Meanwhile, General Paulus's 6th Army was preparing to cross the River Don. Early on the morning of the 21st of August, more than 200 German assault boats were launched onto the waters of the Don.
but the soldiers of the Stalingrad front were ready. The Germans were met with heavy fire. Dozens of boats were sunk. But the Germans got ashore and established a beachhead on the east bank of the Don. Soon a pontoon bridge was up and reinforcements flooded across. The next stop was Stalingrad. Stalingrad, known as Tsaritsyn before the revolution, was one of the most beautiful and well-planned cities in pre-war Russia. New factories attracted many young people to the city. In 15 years, its population grew from 85,000 to 450,000 people. The embankment, with its cafes, cinemas and public gardens, was considered the most elegant along the whole of the Volga. The population of Stalingrad had not been evacuated promptly. Only about 100,000, a fifth, had been evacuated by August. At noon on the 23rd of August, panzers of the 6th Army rolled towards Stalingrad. Above them roared the might of Air Fleet 4, saluting the soldiers with their sirens. They were en route to Stalingrad to unleash the heaviest bombing campaign yet seen on the Eastern Front. When the air raid sirens sounded, many people assumed it was a test. Only when the sky became dark with planes and anti-aircraft batteries opened fire did people rush to the shelters. Bombs rained down on the city. Approximately 80% of buildings were destroyed in the first day of bombing. Most of Stalingrad's suburbs were built of wood. Inside the city itself, there were oil storage facilities and timber yards. The city was parched by the August sun. German incendiary bombs caused the whole city to flare up like gunpowder. Rivers of burning oil and petrol flowed towards the Volga. First the surface of the water, and then the ships caught fire. German Air Fleet 4, commanded by General von Richthofen, flew 1,500 missions on the 23rd of August. Its aircraft dropped 1,000 tons of bombs and lost only three aircraft. On that single day, an estimated 40,000 people died in Stalingrad. Most of the survivors fled the city. But some chose to stay and share the city's fate. At about 4 p.m., Paulus's tanks reached the Volga. Approaching Stalingrad from the north, all the Germans could see through their binoculars was fire and smoke. It seemed nothing could prevent the Germans from entering the burning city. And yet, their attempt to take Stalingrad in one swift assault was bloodily repulsed. What's more, infantry and tanks of the Stalingrad front launched a series of counterattacks from the north. Two reserve armies had also reached Stalingrad. They were joined by the two foremost strategists of the Red Army, Marshal Zhukov and Marshal Vasilevsky. Zhukov told Stalin, our swift strike caused the enemy troops to turn their forces away from Stalingrad and direct them against our grouping. This eased the situation in Stalingrad, which otherwise would have fallen to the enemy. A lull of several days followed the initial attack. Stalingrad was half encircled. The 62nd and 64th armies inside the city were cut off from the Stalingrad front. They could only be reinforced and supplied across the Volga River. But the German position was also far from ideal, having to fend off counterattacks from the north and from within Stalingrad itself. It had become clear that the Red Army could never be forced out of the ruins of the city, as long as they received reinforcements and supplies. The original plan for Case Blue had paid little attention to the capture of Stalingrad. 
Paulus's new orders were to capture the city, destroy the river crossings, and then take up a defensive position. From Stalingrad, he would protect the flank of German forces advancing into the Caucasus. The taking of Stalingrad was regarded as a matter of a few weeks by the German general staff. But Paulus was less gung-ho when he arrived to meet Hitler in his headquarters near Vinitsa in Ukraine. His Sixth Army was far from the force it had been just two months before. It had suffered heavy casualties in the struggle at the Don. And Paulus now had to send his best divisions to defend a left flank that stretched all the way from the Don to the Volga. When Hitler asked him when he would take Stalingrad, Paulus answered, I cannot predict the final date in view of the state of our troops as well as the strength of Russian resistance. On the contrary, I must ask for reinforcement by at least three good divisions. Paulus's army got its reinforcements. Now, Hitler expected Stalingrad to be taken without delay. The 62nd Army was the only defence and hope for the city. It had already been reduced to about one-sixth of its normal strength. There were only about 50 tanks left. Damaged tanks, immobilised but still able to fire, were dug in and turned into fixed gun emplacements. But the city would not hold out for long without substantial reinforcement. On the 9th of September, General Rodimtsev's 13th Guards Rifle Division was dispatched to the city. Three days later, General Vasily Ivanovich Chuikov was put in command of the 62nd Army. At the outbreak of the Russian Revolution, Chuikov was a 17-year-old naval cadet at Kronstadt. By 19, he was commanding a regiment in the Russian Civil War and was twice decorated with the Order of the Red Banner. Chuikov arrived at the 62nd Army's headquarters on the 14th of September. The same day, the Germans began an all-out assault on the city. The German assault on Stalingrad found a weak point in the Soviet defences, where the 112th Soviet Rifle Division had once stood. Its regiments had been reduced from 2,500 soldiers each to less than 100. Its artillery consisted of one howitzer and one gun of 1902 vintage. The Germans broke through the decimated division and captured the high ground of Mamayev Kurgan. Then they reached the Volga, hoping to seize the central river crossing. If they had succeeded, Stalingrad's fate would have been sealed that same day. Chuikov threw every available man into the battle. He had to buy time for Radimtsev's division to cross the river. Every man able to fire a gun was dispatched to the front line. With the river at their backs and Chuikov's declaration that there is no land for us across the Volga, every man knew this was a fight to the death. By now, the Germans had gained control of the southern part of the city and had split Chuikov's 62nd Army from General Shumilov's 64th Army. The German capture of the city's huge grain elevator was seen as a turning point. Paulus personally chose the grain elevator as the emblem for his soldier's victory badge. But German victory plans were a little premature. The Rodimtsev division prepared to cross the river by night. They had equipped themselves for street fighting, ditching long rifles in favor of submachine guns and anti-tank rifles. When German observers spotted movement on the river, they called in artillery fire, smashing boats and men and causing many to drown. The soldiers who reached the shore were instantly plunged into battle. The Germans occupied the high bank and had a perfect view of Soviet soldiers as they landed. The fighting was soon hand-to-hand. -hand. Men used bayonets, rifle butts and entrenching tools. 
In brutal, bloody fighting, the Soviets recaptured the embankment and Mill 4, which overlooked the river crossings. With the capture of this position, the river crossings were finally secure once more. Rodimtsev succeeded in forcing the Germans back and recapturing the railway station. His men regained Mameyev Kurgan on the 19th of September. The same day, the Stavka High Command ordered an attack by the Stalingrad Front to link up with the city's defenders. It was repulsed by the Germans, but much needed German manpower was drawn away from the fighting in the city. Fighting in the city raged for two weeks with hardly any respite. On the 27th of September, Paulus launched another assault. Chuikov's task was to hold the city and its industrial centers, but the city was consuming his men at a terrifying rate. Those who survived for any length of time learned new tactics for this ruined urban landscape. Ironically, it was the Germans, by bombing the city to rubble, that had done most to undermine their own tactics. Tanks, the German army's shock weapon, quickly got stuck in the mountains of broken bricks, while from around every corner, they were pelted with Molotov cocktails. German bomb aimers were finding it more and more difficult to spot targets in the city. From the air, it was almost impossible to distinguish between Germans and Russians. Nor were the Heinkels very accurate, scattering their bombs over a path of several hundred meters. To further negate German air superiority, Chuikov ordered his men to advance as close as possible to the enemy lines. The distance between Red Army and German positions was reduced to as little as 10 meters. This made it impossible for Heinkels to bomb the enemy without also hitting their own troops. The Germans turned to their Junkers 87 dive bombers. These aircraft were far more accurate than the level bombers. In the Battle of Stalingrad, German dive bombers and their crews operated at the very limit of their endurance. One German pilot flew 228 missions in just three months at Stalingrad. The same number he'd flown in his previous three years of service. On Chuikov's orders, the powerful long-range artillery of the 62nd Army remained on the east bank of the Volga, where it was less exposed to German air raids. Artillery spotters remained in the city, often working from the top floors of buildings. When they found a good target, such as German troops massing for an assault, the spotter would use radio or telephone to direct artillery fire onto their position. The city became an ideal landscape for snipers from both sides. It became almost impossible to move around the city except on all fours. Chuvikov had ordered all commanding officers to join their men on the front line in order to boost morale. He also ordered the formation of assault teams from the infantry companies. These were much more efficient tactical units for the savage street fighting that had developed. An assault team consisted of 20 to 30 of the most experienced soldiers. Their prime weapons were submachine guns, grenades, knives and sharpened entrenching tools. Where possible, the group was supported by a light, mobile anti-tank gun, a tank, anti-tank riflemen, or flamethrower teams. It was up to the assault teams to take on the most hazardous of all operations, storming enemy-held buildings. A favorite tactic was to blow a hole in a side wall with the anti-tank gun. Several grenades were thrown in, the soldiers charging in in the wake of the blasts. Basements were cleared with flamethrowers and more grenades. Before entering a room, a soldier would throw a grenade in first, then come in spraying from his submachine gun. Some buildings were contested floor by floor. Soviet assault teams could be on the ground floor, with German defenders above them, and more Soviet troops fighting their way down from the upper floors. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting became common in these battles. It was an arena in which Red Army soldiers seemed to hold a psychological edge over the Germans. The Russian preference for sharp-edged entrenching tools terrified them. 
individual buildings turned into fortresses, with covering fire from the surrounding buildings and streets. On the evening of the 27th of September, Sergeant Yakov Pavlov was ordered to lead a patrol to the Consumer Union building, a hundred meters in front of the Red Army lines. The building was an ideal observation point. Pavlov's men fought their way through the building. When the Germans realized their loss, they launched a furious counterattack and were met with heavy fire. The shattered wreck of the Consumer Union building soon had a new name. Official reports and orders all began to call it Pavlov's house. Underground passages were dug, connecting the house with a neighboring factory and block of flats. This allowed reinforcements to reach the house under cover. Loopholes were made to provide firing positions, and the approaches were sown with mines. In one of the flats, Russian soldiers found a gramophone that had been left behind, but only one record was still intact. They played it constantly, music floating eerily across the ruins during lulls in the fighting, heard by friend and foe alike as the desperate struggle for Pavlov's house went on. Chuikov's 62nd Army headquarters had moved to an open area near some huge oil storage tanks. When German spotters found it, the shells began to fall. Both sides had assumed the storage tanks were empty. When they began to explode into enormous fireballs, it was a nasty shock for everyone. Rivers of burning oil gushed towards Chuikov's headquarters. By a miracle, they escaped, but their telephone lines were incinerated. Chuikov was cut off in this hellish trap for three days. General Yerimenka on the east bank of the Volga didn't know where Chuikov's headquarters were or whether the general was alive or dead. At last, a message arrived from Chuikov. It read, we are at the spot where the fire and smoke are thickest. While 62nd Army headquarters looked for a new home, the Germans were building the pressure on the city's defenders. Into the cauldron was thrown Major General Viktor Zuludoyev's airborne division. On the 14th of October, the Germans launched yet another offensive. This time the goal was the tractor factory. Zuludoyev's division was tasked to hold the position against an attack by three German infantry divisions and two panzer divisions. The division commander fought with a submachine gun in his hands, side by side with his paratroopers. A fresh division was arriving at the river crossing to reinforce them, but Zaludoev's men had to hold out until they got there. The Germans next attacked the Barricadi gun factory. Only volley firing from Katyusha's on the far bank stopped their advance. But elsewhere on the front, the Germans had already reached the Volga, splitting the 62nd Army in half. Nobody, not even Chuikov, believed Stalingrad could be held for much longer. On the 16th of October, with the battle raging just 300 meters from his command post, Ludnikov's 138th Rifle Division crossed the river and went straight into action near the Barricadi factory. At huge cost, the Germans were repulsed once more. From his own headquarters, Adolf Hitler raged at the failure to take Stalingrad. The BBC said that Stalingrad had swallowed up Hitler's army. Poland, it continued, was occupied in 28 days. During this same time period, the Germans only managed to occupy a few buildings in Stalingrad. France was occupied in 38 days, but in the same time period, the Germans have only managed to cross the street in Stalingrad. The Germans called the fighting in Stalingrad the Rat War. Soldiers fought at ranges of 10 or 20 meters. The soldier who was the fiercest, most cunning, 
courageous, determined to win at any cost. This was the soldier that would win this fight. Eleventh of November. The Germans reached the Volga near the Barricade factory, encircled Ludnikov's division and split the 62nd Army into three parts. The 138th Division, or as it became known, Ludnikov's Island, clung onto an isolated position 200 metres from the Volga. The river crossings used to ferry Soviet troops and supplies into the city were under constant fire. Now, the Volga began to freeze, and boats could no longer reach the city. The Red Army Air Force was called in. An obsolete biplane bomber, the U-2, would attempt resupply by air. Sacks of food and ammunition were strapped onto the aircraft's wing. The ropes could be quickly untied to let the cargo crash to earth. One pilot recalled, the navigator had a sort of reins. He pulled them and the load fell to earth rather randomly. However, vodka was parachuted. We used to slow down and shout, Ivan, vodka's coming. But such basic methods of resupply could never meet all the needs of the city's defenders. Winter was coming. The Germans believed that their front line, stretching from the Baltic to the Volga, was secure. Their allies, the Hungarians, Romanians and Italians, were responsible for holding the line in the Don region. The German Army High Command didn't seriously consider the possibility of a Soviet offensive in this region. The Red Army was thought to be on the brink of collapse. But as early as September, Red Army generals had been working on a plan that's goal was nothing less than the complete destruction of the German 6th Army. Soviet forces were to attack towards the town of Kalash. Armies of the Stalingrad Front were to attack simultaneously to complete the encirclement of the Germans. The operation was codenamed Uranus. Three separate fronts were involved. The Don, the Southeastern, and Stalingrad. The operation was planned in complete secrecy. It was time to turn the tables on the German army. On the night of the 18th of November, the eve of the assault, a snowstorm dramatically reduced visibility. Stalin himself had noted, if the bombing preparation is insufficient, the operation will fail. It was completely impossible to fly in these conditions. The bombing raids were cancelled. But it was too late to postpone Uranus. In the southern zone, troops had already crossed the Volga. On the morning of the 19th of November, at 10 minutes to 9, the roar of thousands of guns was only eclipsed by the screams of Katyusha rocket fire. The shelling was done almost blindly through the snowstorm, but the Romanian troops scattered under the first blows of the Red Army. The German 48th Panzer Corps tried to launch a counterattack. They met the attacking Soviet forces head-on near the village of Ust Medveditsky. An enormous tank battle raged for more than a day. At its end, the German Panzer Corps lay crushed. One of its divisions had been hindered by an unlikely foe. While the division had been in reserve with its vehicle standing idle, field mice had got inside the vehicles and gnawed through the electrical wiring. This humble ally of the Red Army had put dozens of tanks out of action. The Red Army assault south of Stalingrad began the next day. The poorly trained and ill-equipped Romanian 4th Army scattered in the face of a massed Soviet tank assault. Troops from two Soviet fronts were approaching from north and south to meet at the River Don. The severe weather slowed their advance. No local guides could be found in the villages, all of which lay abandoned. At dusk on the 22nd of November, a detachment of two motorized infantry companies, five tanks and one armored vehicle, approached the bridge near the town of Kalash. The capture of this bridge was critical to the success of the whole operation. 
The German guards on the bridge couldn't believe enemy tanks could be so far behind the front line. By the time they realized their mistake, it was too late. The capture of the bridge allowed the Red Army to move large numbers of troops across the Don to link up with Yerimenka's tanks coming from the south. On the fourth day of Operation Uranus, units of the Stalingrad Front met troops of the southeastern front near the town of Sovetsky. The trap was sprung. Paulus's 6th Army was surrounded. But the act of encirclement alone wasn't enough to guarantee victory. There was no panic amongst the German forces that were now cut off. Hitler told Paulus, the army can rely on my taking every step to provide it with everything it needs and to end its blockade. The surrounded German troops were ordered to hold their positions and wait for rescue. But when a meeting was convened of the 6th Army Corps commanders, most wanted to attempt a breakout. It was General Erwin Janek who gave vent to what many were thinking. Reichenau wouldn't have hung about. Paulus instantly retorted, I'm not Reichenau. Paulus prevailed. Sixth Army would take up defensive positions and await a relief attempt from the outside. Field Marshal von Manstein was given the job of rescuing Sixth Army from its predicament. He quickly gathered all available forces for the offensive, which was to be led by four panzer divisions. The operation was codenamed Winter Storm. Not for nothing was Van Manstein regarded as the best operational mind in the Third Reich. He won the first round of the fight, launching his attack not in the obvious place where the German lines were closest together, but from the southwest. Von Manstein's panzers burst through the perimeter of the Soviet encirclement. The Red Army had been caught off guard. Stalin, alarmed that the prey might be about to escape the trap, immediately ordered Soviet reserves to counter this new threat. But troop movements across this frozen, devastated landscape were no simple task. One unit reported that the trains could not keep up steam. Motor transport was useless for lack of fuel. Communications with units moving on foot was difficult. For the time being, von Manstein's attack would have to be resisted by whatever troops lay in its path. These scattered and often isolated Red Army units fought desperately to keep the Germans at bay. The whole course of the Battle of Stalingrad lay in the balance. General Schulz, von Manstein's chief of staff, tried to persuade Paulus to fight his way out of Stalingrad, towards von Manstein's forces. The earlier your attack starts, the better, Schulz told him. We cannot wait. But Paulus was no longer sure his troops were capable of fighting their way out. He grew increasingly pessimistic as von Manstein's troops were first stopped and then forced into retreat. Hitler had hoped that the Luftwaffe could keep Paulus's men resupplied from the air. But it was unfeasible. Paulus and the 6th Army were doomed. The operation to eradicate German resistance in Stalingrad was codenamed Ring. Before it began, Paulus received an ultimatum demanding his surrender. It was declined on Hitler's orders. The Red Army also appealed directly to ordinary German soldiers to surrender. Red Army Air Force pilot Lee Schenko had the unenviable job of flying his U-2 at low altitude over the front lines, while his navigator, of Shisha, read an ultimatum to the German soldiers through a loudspeaker. They often came under heavy fire from the ground. Lee Schenko would climb out of range and repeat the whole process somewhere else 15 minutes later. Some German soldiers believed they would get food and warmth if they surrendered. Others feared reprisals. Many were scared to disobey orders. Military discipline was maintained within Stalingrad. Deserters and thieves were still shot wherever they were caught.
Operation Ring began on the 10th of January with an intense artillery bombardment. The German pocket was about 60 by 40 kilometers. Now the Germans were driven east to the Volga and into Stalingrad. Four days into the operation, the Germans were forced to abandon their main airfield at Pitomnik. This was a disaster. Fights broke out over places on the last German aircraft to leave. The wounded were forgotten. The most deserving were elbowed aside. The only supplies that reached Paulus's army now arrived by parachute. Many soldiers had fallen into complete apathy, numbed by cold and hunger, only brought to life by the sound of a transport aircraft overhead. Food had become their only concern. On the 24th of January, Paulus sent a radio message to Hitler, which ended with the words, the army requests permission to surrender immediately in order to save the lives of the remaining troops. The Führer was adamant. I forbid capitulation, he replied. The army will hold its positions until the last soldier and the last ditch. The Soviet advance had split the German pocket into two parts. The southern part was trapped in the heart of the city. The northern lay in the factory district. Paulus's headquarters was in the southern pocket. The suffering of his men finally forced him to act. He surrendered on the morning of the 31st of January with his staff. The northern group under Lieutenant General Karl Strecker fought on briefly. After a massive Soviet artillery pounding, they too laid down their arms on the 2nd of February, 1943. The final surrender at Stalingrad resulted in 91,000 German soldiers being taken prisoner. They had destroyed 6,000 guns and mortars, 1,000 German tanks, and more than 60,000 assorted vehicles. The disaster that had overtaken Paulus's army and two Romanian armies stunned Germany. It was their first major defeat at Soviet hands. On the Eastern Front, the Stavka High Command launched a full-scale offensive that routed Italian and Hungarian armies along the Don River. German forces began a headlong retreat from the Caucasus to avoid being cut off. Hitler would never reach the oil fields of Baku. All of Germany's conquests in the South that summer were reversed. The Soviet winter offensive stopped only in March 1943. Amongst the many towns and cities liberated by the Red Army was the city of Kursk. It was there that the war's next great battle would be fought. In a guardhouse in southern Russia, two men in Red Army uniforms talked casually to each other in German. A third man, wearing the uniform of a German combat engineer, listened in closely. 
They were men of the Brandenburg Regiment, an elite German special forces unit that often dressed in enemy uniform to carry out its missions. They had just prevented Russian engineers from destroying the dam on the river Manich. They thought the operation had been successfully completed, but suddenly a stranger appeared in the doorway. The unknown soldier blew up the Vesilovskoya Reservoir Dam on the 27th of July, 1942. It caused a sudden and dramatic rise in the water level downriver and placed a major obstacle in the path of the German advance. The river Manich had been transformed from a 40 meter wide river to a huge lake four kilometers across. German tanks that would have driven straight across the dam now had to be ferried across the lake one by one. It bought some much needed time for the retreating Red Army. But this was only a small local victory. Three days previously, German Army Group A had captured Rostov on Don, the gateway to the Caucasus. The main German attack came from that direction, further to the west. The only good news was that the German 4th Panzer Army would soon be redirected from the Caucasus to support the attack on Stalingrad. The same day the dam was blown, Stalin received a report from the commander of the North Caucasus Front, Marshal Semyon Mikhailovich Budyonyi. He recommended an immediate withdrawal of his forces to the line of the Terek River and the Caucasus Mountains. After the recent Soviet defeats in the Crimea, at Kharkov, and in the Donbas, the Germans possessed a significant numerical advantage over the Soviets in the Caucasus. But Yonyi believed the only way to stabilize the situation was an immediate withdrawal south. The next day, Stalin signed the famous Order Number 227, not a step back. At the same time, he approved Budyonyi's plan of retreat. It seemed a contradiction, but in the Caucasus, military logic dictated just one course of action. The Terek River and the Caucasus Mountains comprised a formidable natural defense. The troops would withdraw to this line immediately before the Germans could encircle and destroy them. All Soviet reserves were being sent to help defend Stalingrad, where one of the decisive battles of the war was unfolding. There were no troops to spare for the North Caucasus Front, and so Budyonyi's troops began to dig in along the Terek. The Great German Summer Offensive of 1942 was underway. Army Group B was advancing on Stalingrad, from where it could protect the northern flank of Army Group A, bound for the Soviet oil fields of the Caucasus. Before the war, 70% of all Soviet oil came from the Baku oil fields of the Caucasus. About a quarter came from the area around Grozny and Makop. Their capture would be a disaster and leave the Red Army without fuel. Hitler believed the war would be decided by the control of oil supplies. He was obsessed by oil and had even studied how it was drilled and refined. As Case Blue began, Army Group A breached Soviet defenses and began a rapid advance towards these vital oil fields. Von Kleist's first Panzer Army led the way. In 1941, Von Kleist had commanded the first Panzer Group in Ukraine. In the first week of the war, he had won a giant four-day tank battle at Brody. Now, he had been entrusted with the capture of the Caucasus oil fields. 
Marshal Budionyi, by contrast, had experienced only defeat. Now, he oversaw his forces' retreat to the mountains. The Caucasus Mountains stretch 1,300 kilometers from the Caspian to the Black Sea. The range is divided into three parts. The Eastern Caucasus runs from the Abshiron Peninsula to Mount Kazbek, the Central Caucasus from Kazbek to Mount Elbrus, and the Western Caucasus from Elbrus to Anapa. Snow and ice cover the highest peaks all year round, and to reach Grozny, one must also cross the fast-flowing Terek River. Von Kleist planned to advance straight to Odzonikidze and follow the old Georgian military road straight to Tbilisi. He would ignore the mountain passes of the Western Caucasus in order to concentrate his forces. But Hitler rejected this plan, and the 49th Mountain Corps was diverted to the Western Caucasus. Hitler was adding another objective to Army Group A's ambitious list of goals. He now also demanded the capture of Soviet naval bases on the Black Sea coast. But Yonyi had very few tanks at his disposal. But because of his static positions, he did have the advantage in heavy artillery. He was also supported by powerful air units. The summer of 1942 saw an important change in the organization of the Red Army Air Force. Air armies were now assigned to Red Army fronts. It was a similar system to the one used by the Luftwaffe. It meant Air Force command was now more centralized, allowing concerted action. Previously, Soviet air units had been parceled out into small, ineffective formations. Soviet air strength in the Caucasus comprised the naval aviation of the Black Sea Fleet, the 5th Air Army under Lieutenant General Guryenov, and the 4th Air Army under Major General Vershinin. Konstantin Andreevich Vershinin began his military career in the infantry during the Russian Civil War. He only learned to fly in his 30s after he was transferred to the Air Force Academy. Initially, he wasn't enthusiastic about the Air Force, but his infantry background helped him to appreciate how air power could be used to support ground troops. In August 1942, the survival of Budionyi's front depended on Vershinin's pilots. They constantly harried the advancing German columns with bombs and rockets. was also the eyes of the retreating Red Army. Reconnaissance aircraft tracked the southern progress of von Kleist's panzer army. Following in the footsteps of the retreating Soviet troops came soldiers of the German 1st and 4th Mountain Divisions. Wir müssen diesen Berg besteigen. Der Abendwind sind wir da. Geht alle hinter andere. Folgt mir, Firma. These men were mountain warfare specialists from the Austrian Tyrol and the Bavarian Alps. They traveled with climbing gear, pack animals, and specialized equipment, including lightweight artillery that could be disassembled and carried in sections on the backs of mules. The mountain infantry were ordered to fight their way through the mountain passes west of Elbrus and advance on Tbilisi. They only had a few weeks to get through the mountains before winter weather made them impassable. If they did break through, here and to the west, they could also capture the last Soviet naval bases on the Black Sea. The local Soviet commanders believed the mountains posed such a formidable obstacle that the passes only needed to be held by small detachments. But they had not counted on the expertise of the German mountain divisions.
The German mountain troops began their advance through the Western Caucasus Mountains on the 15th of August. They planned a bold flanking movement of the Klukov Pass. Two squads, armed with machine guns and mortars, climbed for hours. The Soviet defenders suddenly found the enemy was behind them. Poor communications added to the crisis. Soviet headquarters only found out about the battle two days after it happened. Reserves were immediately sent in, including NKVD troops and cadets from the Sukumi Military Academy. The Stavka High Command radioed an urgent warning. The enemy has specially trained mountain troops and will use every road and path in the Caucasus Mountains to reach the South Caucasus. Commanders who believe the mountains to be an impassable obstacle are gravely mistaken. Only a skillfully prepared and well-defended line is impassable. But the warning had come too late for the defenders of the Klukov Pass. Soviet reserves reached the Klukov Pass a week after the initial attack. By then, the Germans were already on the southern slopes. Though they were prevented from advancing any further, they could not be dislodged. The Germans, meanwhile, had sent a detachment to Mount Elbrus, the highest peak in the Caucasus. On the 18th of August, they reached the refuge of 11 tourist camp. At 4,130 metres above sea level, the Refuge of Eleven has been described as the highest hotel in the world. The first wooden shelter was erected in 1932. Six years later, a three-storey shelter, coated in metal and resembling an airship, was built in its place. From this shelter, the Germans set off for the summit. On the 21st of August, soldiers of the German 1st Mountain Division raised the swastika flag over Mount Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe. It was a propaganda triumph, though Hitler himself was said to have been furious at what he regarded as a mere stunt. Meanwhile, in Moscow, events in the Caucasus were causing serious alarm. The feared head of the NKVD secret police, Lavrenti Beria, flew personally to Sukumi, his hometown, and sacked to the commander of the 46th Army, General Sagatskov. In the eastern Caucasus, von Kleist's 1st Panzer Army had secured a toehold across the Terek River. But they encountered fierce resistance from Soviet units, which contained many local men who knew the mountains like the palm of their hand. Artillery observers on the high ground were able to direct accurate fire from Katyusha's and Howitzer's onto German pontoons across the Terek. The Germans were also confronted with a novel form of anti-tank barrier. Soviet soldiers filled ditches with oil, then set fire to them with flamethrowers. It created an impenetrable wall of fire and thick, noxious black smoke. Villages in the area of Malgobek changed hands several times. It was not until the Germans secretly moved the 13th Panzer Division south across the Terek that they were able to secure the area. They were reinforced by the SS Motorized Division, Viking. 
On the 27th of September, the Germans captured El Kertovo, but were forced back onto the defensive the very next day. Meanwhile, Luftwaffe units in the Caucasus had been sent north to Stalingrad, giving the Soviet Air Force a free hand. Vashinin's aircraft targeted the German pontoon bridges across the Terek. Vashinin always emphasized to his men the importance of supporting the ground forces. We exist for them, he told his pilots, not the other way around. It was difficult to get tanks from factories in Russia to the troops in the Caucasus. But one of the Allied Lend-Lease supply routes came up through the Caucasus from Iran. As a result, many Soviet tanks on this front were British and American models. By October 1942, the Caucasus front had a total of 300 tanks. British and American types made up 42%. T-34 medium tanks made up 20% and heavy KV tanks just 2%. The remaining 36% were various types of Soviet light tank. The American M3 Stuart and the British Valentine were inferior to the T-34 and most German tanks. But they were an improvement on the Soviet light tanks, such as the T-26 and the BT-7, which were poorly armoured and seriously undergunned. Vashinin's 4th Air Army also received Lend-Lease equipment. Its pilots were among the first to master the American twin-engine Boston bomber. They particularly liked its navigational instruments, which made it safer than most aircraft to fly through the mountains in unpredictable weather. Another aircraft that thrived in the mountains was the I-153 Seagull biplane. Low speeds and superb maneuverability made it an effective fighter bomber amid the ravines and passes. Rocket attacks by low-flying seagulls were a common sight in these high-altitude battles. On the ground, special NKVD units with Alpine training had been formed. They carried the fight back to the Germans with their own deep, outflanking manoeuvres. Their gear was a strange mix of pre-war sportswear, military uniform and captured German kit. Painstaking reconnaissance was the bedrock of these units' operations. In early September, one of these units was able to turn the tables on the Germans in the Klukov Pass, the scene of their earlier defeat. Soviet mountain troops spotted a long caravan of German soldiers and pack animals heading up to the pass. They were a long way off, beyond rifle range. Just then, three aircraft marked with the Red Star zoomed overhead. Gusev, a section commander of engineers, described what happened. Our pilots weren't only skilled, they also knew the mountains. First they attacked the convoy itself, but the results weren't great. So then they bombed the slopes above the road. Huge, great stone blocks fell down towards Hitler's convoy. The slope disappeared in a thick cloud of dust. And when it cleared, we saw the convoy had been devastated. By September 1942, a stalemate had been reached in the mountain passes of the Caucasus.
German mountain infantry couldn't build on their initial success and break through to the coast. But nor were Soviet forces strong enough to recapture the high passes they lost in August. On the 28th of September, one of the most unusual battles of the Second World War took place at more than 4,000 meters above sea level. The Soviets had formed a special NKVD detachment, about 100 strong, to recapture the refuge of the 11 near the summit of Mount Elborus. They were led by Lieutenant Gregorians and armed with machine guns, mortars and sniper rifles. The German mountain troops were stunned by the audacity of the attack, but they quickly rallied. Machine gun fire echoed across the mountains for several hours. Slowly, the tide of battle turned against Lieutenant Gregorians and his men. Only four men from his detachment made it back alive. The lieutenant's body was one of many that littered the mountain slope. A few days later, the temperature in the mountains plummeted. Soon, both sides were losing more men to frostbite and avalanches than they did from combat. It was impossible to fight in such conditions there would be no German breakthrough in the mountains in 1942. In the Caucasus, the Germans found some support from nationalists and anti-communists amongst the local population. The strong history of nationalism in the Caucasus made it fertile recruiting ground for the Wehrmacht. They had captured many conscripts from Georgia, Chechnya, Armenia and Azerbaijan, some of whom were prepared to fight against the Soviet Union. They were formed into the so-called Eastern Legions. But many of these units turned out to be deeply unreliable. In October, the 23rd Panzer Division was informed that a battalion of Georgian volunteers planned to go over to the Soviet side. The Germans immediately made arrangements to disarm the unit and take it off the front line. After a shootout with the Germans, some of the Georgians did manage to slip over to the Soviet lines. The episode was symptomatic of the variable military worth of the Eastern Legions. The German bridgehead across the Terek River was of continuing concern to the Soviet front command. In November, it was decided to eliminate this foothold with an overwhelming infantry and tank assault. But before it could begin, Von Kleist, using the last of his fuel and ammunition reserves, launched his own assault. He had decided to try and fight his way through to Udzunikidze along a new route, which lay through the towns of Baksan and Nalchik.
Tanks of the 1st Panzer Army, supported by airstrikes, made a rapid advance. The Germans, it seemed, had rediscovered the Blitzkrieg spirit. Soon they had reached the outskirts of Odzonikidze, but their success was short-lived. Forces from the South Caucasus Front were sent to crush the Terek bridgehead. Two German panzer divisions were surrounded near the village of Gizel. The Germans were forced to abandon their vehicles and heavy weapons and fight their way out on foot. For the Germans, reaching Tbilisi was now out of the question. In 2007, President Putin would award both Malgobek and Odzonikidze, today known as Vladikavkaz, the title of City of Military Glory for their wartime heroism. In November, the encirclement of 6th Army at Stalingrad turned the campaign on its head. If the Germans did not immediately evacuate the Caucasus, the Red Army might reach Rostov and cut off the entire Army Group A. On the 22nd of November, von Kleist was promoted to command of Army Group A. He immediately ordered the 1st Panzer Army to withdraw to Rostov, while 17th Army retreated to the Kuban bridgehead. The only way to keep the Kuban bridgehead supplied was by air. It would have been impossible if 6th Army had still been holding out at Stalingrad. But their surrender freed up enough Luftwaffe transport aircraft to establish an air bridge to Kuban. On the 13th of March, Army Group A received new orders from the Army High Command. Hold the Kuban bridgehead and the Crimea at all costs. Von Kleist made his own report to the Army High Command about the value of the Kuban bridgehead. Advantages of the position. A considerable number of Russian forces are tied up. The enemy Black Sea Fleet is unable to conduct offensive operations. The defense of the Crimea is facilitated. In the spring of 1943, most of the Eastern Front was quiet as both sides geared up for the Battle of Kursk. But at Kuban, the fighting rumbled on. The Shinin ordered the construction of an Air Force command post near the front line. The battlefield was small here. Air raids and fighter patrols could be observed from the ground and information relayed back to the squadrons. Dogfights above the Kuban bridgehead frequently involved 30 to 40 aircraft on each side. Vashinin had demanded that his fighters keep enemy bombers away from their infantry lines at all costs. The air battle over Kuban became one of the most famous of the Eastern Front. Under unrelenting pressure from the Red Army, the Kuban bridgehead finally began to buckle in August 1943. The Germans were outflanked by Soviet advances to the north and by amphibious landings at Novorossiysk. In October, the 17th Army was evacuated to the Crimea. Hitler's quest for oil had proved to be a disaster. Батарея, гранатой заряд уменьшили. Батарея, гранатой заряд уменьшили. От 
A Soviet artillery officer studied enemy positions on the Perekop Isthmus, the gateway to the Crimea. Ориентир. Одинокая акация. Вправо 5 зон. Дистанция 1400 метров. He was looking for targets for the 280 millimeter mortars. Their 200 kilogram shells could smash through the thickest of walls. Preparations for the Crimea offensive were underway. The Red Army's advance through Ukraine had isolated German and Romanian forces in the peninsula. But only three narrow strips of land connect the Crimea to the mainland. At Perekop, the isthmus is just 14 kilometers wide. There would be no room to maneuver. German and Romanian troops of the 17th Army had had five months to fortify the Perekop Isthmus. Machine gun crews stood ready to mow down advancing Soviet infantry. Howitzers were hidden in the valleys. Romanian dictator Marshal Antonescu wanted Hitler to evacuate the Crimea, where seven Romanian divisions were stationed. But the Fuhrer feared the Soviets would use Crimean airfields to bomb the Romanian oil fields. Germany's chrome supplies from Turkey would also be threatened. Admiral Dönitz assured Hitler that if required, the Navy could evacuate 17th Army by sea. But he was counting on the Germans holding on to the port of Odessa. And on the 10th of April 1944, Odessa fell to the Red Army. Ten days earlier, Hitler had fired von Kleist from command of Army Group A. His replacement was Colonel General Ferdinand Schoener. After arriving in the Crimea, Schoener reported back to Hitler, telling him the situation was stable and the Crimea could hold out for many months. On the 8th of April 1944, at Perekop, Sivash and Kerch, the Soviet guns roared into life. Timber gun emplacements were turned into matchwood. Buildings were reduced to rubble. Finally, uniformed men sprang up from the Red Army trenches. Shouts of Ura, the Russian battle cry, could be heard, and the squeal of tank tracks. The Germans raced from their dugouts to their fighting positions. Concealed guns opened fire. It was an old trick. A Soviet forward artillery observer was meticulously noting the muzzle flashes and sending their coordinates back to the batteries by telephone. <laughs> Soviet artillery pummeled the German positions that had just given themselves away. The dummies were cut to ribbons, but they had served their purpose. Now, the soldiers took them down and prepared for the real attack. They were supported by T-34s of the Second Guards Army. Amongst them, the feared OT-34 flamethrower tanks. The Red Army onslaught proved irresistible. The assault was supported by amphibious landings that outflanked the German defences at Perekop. 
The commander of the 17th Army, General Janneke, received permission to retreat. The Germans began a swift withdrawal towards Sevastopol, where Hitler expected them to hold out for many months, as the Soviets had in 1942. The evacuation of German and Romanian troops from Sevastopol began. The transports would be highly exposed. But after losing a battleship and two destroyers to air attack the previous year, the Stavka ordered the big ships of the Black Sea Fleet to stay out of range of the Luftwaffe. Soviet submarines had also suffered heavy losses it would primarily fall to the Air Force to prevent the evacuation. By 1944, Navy pilots of the Black Sea Fleet had mastered a lethal new form of attack. It was known as skip bombing. Skip bombing attacks had to be made at high speed and low altitude. When the bomb was released, it would skip like a pebble across the surface of a lake and strike the side of the ship. Meanwhile, the pilot climbed hard to avoid the ship's superstructure. Skip bombing had several advantages over aerial torpedo attacks. Firstly, it was effective against ships with very shallow drafts, like landing craft. Secondly, a ship could spot a torpedo and dodge it with evasive action but the bomb was on them in just seconds. Thirdly, torpedoes were expensive and in high demand. By comparison, bombs were plentiful and cheap. Boston bombers proved the most effective skip bombers, but the new tactic was also successfully employed by Lavoshkin 5 fighters, Ilyushin 2s and Ilyushin 4s. Units of the 4th Ukrainian Front pursued the enemy to the gates of Sevastopol. The heavy artillery was brought up in preparation for a long siege. On the 5th of May 1944, after a 90-minute barrage, the Soviet infantry began their assault. In 1941, the Red Army had held Sevastopol for nine months against the Germans. But this time, it would not be such a drawn-out affair. Sevastopol's northern shore fell to the Red Army within three days, putting the harbour in range of Soviet artillery. German ships arriving from the Romanian port of Constanta had to run a gauntlet of air attacks and shelling at the landing stages. Admiral Ojebrzyski, commander of the Black Sea Fleet, requested permission to send his cruisers to attack the German and Romanian transports. But the Stavka refused. The big warships were not to be exposed to air attack. This was a job for the submarines and the Air Force. In the small hours of the 10th of May, the German transport ships Tortilla and Teja arrived off Sevastopol. It was too dangerous for them to approach the harbour, so the ships anchored two miles offshore, while 10,000 soldiers were ferried out to them in assault boats from the southwestern docks of Kyrsonis. As the embarkation was underway, more than 20 Ilyushin II Sturmoviks appeared overhead. The Tortilla was hit by three bombs and sank in minutes. The second transport, Teja, weighed anchor and headed for the open sea, but the Soviet Air Force soon caught up with her. The Teja was hit by no fewer than six 100 kilogram bombs. She lost steering and engine power before 11 Boston bombers arrived to finish her off. Two bombs hit the Teja near the waterline. These were the fatal blows. 
The loss of both transports cost up to 8,000 lives. These were by far the greatest losses of the evacuation. In all, about two-thirds of 17th Army was evacuated, including its commander, General Almendinger, who reached Constanta by torpedo boat on the night of the 11th. General Hartmann was left in charge at Sevastopol, but without heavy weapons, there was no chance of holding off the Red Army for more than a few hours. The remnants of 17th Army were overrun the next day, the 12th of May, 1944. British war correspondent Alexander Worth visited Sebastopol when the fighting was over. Around Kasonis it was gruesome. All the area in front of the earthworks and beyond was ploughed up by thousands of shells and scorched by the fire of Katyushas. The ground was littered with thousands of German helmets, rifles, bayonets and other arms and ammunition. Nearly all the dead had been buried, but around the shattered lighthouse, dead Germans and rafts were bobbing in the water. The German 17th Army had been effectively destroyed in the Crimea. In the month-long campaign, it had suffered nearly 70,000 men killed or captured. Soviet dead and captured totaled approximately 18,000. The Wehrmacht was suffering a series of devastating defeats on the Eastern Front. After his dismissal by Hitler, Field Marshal von Kleist went into enforced retirement. At the end of the war, he was arrested by the Americans and later extradited to Yugoslavia. There, he was sentenced to 15 years for war crimes. But he was also wanted in the Soviet Union. In 1948, Marshal Tito agreed to extradite von Kleist to the USSR. In 1952, the military collegium of the Supreme Court of the USSR sentenced him to 25 years. Von Kleist died in a Soviet prisoner of war camp from ill health two years later. After the liberation of the Crimea, the 4th Air Army was sent to Belorussia. There, its squadrons would support Operation Bagration as the war in the East turned decisively against Nazi Germany. They would pursue the Wehrmacht across the battlefields of East Prussia and Pomerania and on to the very streets of Berlin. First, the Soviets called it the elephant because of a drawing on its turret. But soon they learned its real name, the tiger. They'd captured one near Leningrad and brought it to a tank testing facility for trials. The results were alarming. The tiger's front armor was impervious to a Soviet T-34 even at a range of just 200 meters. Only heavy howitzers could destroy this beast. 
but that was on a firing range. At a gloomy meeting of the Stavka High Command, Marshal of Artillery Nikolai Voronov told Stalin, we have no guns able to successfully fight against these tanks. It was April 1943. Along the entire front, the Red Army prepared to meet what they called the Summer Germans. In both the previous summers, the Wehrmacht's Blitzkrieg had proved almost unstoppable. Now, these new German tanks caused fresh concern. Would the Red Army once more be swept aside by the German summer offensive? Soviet engineers worked frantically on new tank and anti-tank gun designs. Few would be ready in time. Meanwhile, the Stavka made plans to meet the inevitable German offensive. All eyes were drawn to the city of Kursk. Here, the Red Army's central front occupied a large bulge, or salient, in the front line. It was an obvious place to attack. The Soviet general staff expected the Germans to attack simultaneously from north and south, to cut off the troops inside the salient. To meet this threat, the Red Army began to construct several defensive lines within the salient. The Stavka planned to let the Germans wear themselves out, attacking these defences, before launching their own counteroffensive. Soviet intelligence was soon able to confirm the Stavka's intuition. On the 12th of April 1943, Stalin was handed secret German plans for Operation Citadel. It was the code name for the Wehrmacht's summer offensive in the east. The information came from an agent codenamed Werther. His real identity remains a mystery, but it's assumed he was an officer within OKW, the German Armed Forces High Command. His reports were sent to Moscow via Rudolf Roessler, who headed the Lucy spy ring based in Switzerland. The plans for Operation Citadel exactly confirmed what the Stavka had already guessed. The Germans planned to pinch out the Kursk salient with two simultaneous attacks. They will be made by von Kluger's Army Group Center from the north and by Manstein's Army Group South in the south. At the beginning of May, the Stavka was able to warn its commanders that, according to our intelligence, the enemy plans to attack along the Oriel Kursk line, the Belgrad Obian line, or along both lines simultaneously. In May, Hitler held a planning meeting to discuss the early phases of Operation Citadel. However, many generals voiced concern. Field Marshal von Kluger, commanding Army Group Center, openly opposed the Führer. General Model, meanwhile, presented air reconnaissance photos. It was his 9th Army that was to assault the Kursk salient from the north. Modal pointed to the signs of heavy Soviet defences being prepared in this sector. Walter Modal would earn the nickname the Führer's Fireman, because later in the war he was frequently sent by Hitler to try and salvage desperate situations. Modal was a fervent Nazi, renowned for his loyalty to the Führer. In 1945, when his army group was encircled by the Americans, he shot himself rather than face surrender. Modal was one of a very small number of generals whose opinion the Führer respected. Modal was known as a genius of defence, but he and his 9th Army had less experience of large-scale offensive actions. Some thought that Modal was trying to get the entire operation cancelled, allowing him to fight a defensive battle against the Red Army. Guderian was another who expressed doubts about Operation Citadel. As Inspector General of Armoured Troops, he knew that the Panzer Divisions were not ready for such a massive operation. For him, the whole thing was too much of a risk. The war had already taken a massive toll on the Wehrmacht. If Citadel was a success, it would allow them to retain the initiative on the Eastern Front. But if it failed, it would be disastrous. The Führer agreed to postpone the operation by one month, declaring, there can be no failure. 
The delay would allow the Germans to deploy more of their latest armoured vehicles. These included the heavy Tiger tanks, the new Panzer V Panthers, and the massive Ferdinand tank destroyers. The Luftwaffe was also receiving new ground attack aircraft, such as a fighter bomber variant of the Fokker Wolf 190. New variants of the Junkers 87 dive bomber were armed with two 37mm cannon. They fired tungsten core ammunition against the thin top armour of Soviet tanks and proved to be highly effective. Squadrons of new Henschel ground attack aircraft were also arriving in the Kursk area. The HS-129 was also a specialised tank destroyer. But the delay also gave the Red Army more time to strengthen their defences. Three heavily fortified lines were constructed, with minefields, trenches and gun emplacements. But the lack of effective anti-tank guns was still a serious concern. The Red Army hoped that new defensive tactics would overcome this shortcoming. Previously, anti-tank guns had been distributed evenly along the front. But combat experience proved they were more effective grouped together. Anti-tank strong points became the foundation for the defence of the Kursk salient. Each strong point contained up to 20 anti-tank guns and dozens of anti-tank rifles. The guns were well entrenched and covered all directions. The distance between neighbouring strong points was 600 to 800 metres. If German tanks tried to pass between two strong points, they would expose their weaker side armour to the Soviet anti-tank guns. It took many weeks of back-breaking labour to build the strong points and anti-tank ditches. Mikhail Badijin, an anti-tank gunner, recalled, we had to dig out about 30 cubic metres of earth to bed in a 45mm anti-tank gun. We did more digging than most people will do in their entire lives. The Red Army dug 4,200 kilometres of trenches along the Voronezh front alone. If they'd been dug in a straight line, they'd have stretched from Moscow to Madrid. The Central Front had dug another 5,000 kilometres of trenches. 2,000 kilometres of roads were built, 686 bridges, and 300,000 wagon loads of supplies and equipment were delivered to the Kursk salient. The Kursk salient was now the most heavily fortified position in the history of warfare. Launched against it from the south would be the 445,000 men and 1,500 tanks of Army Group South. They faced the Voronezh Front, commanded by General Vatutin, with 626,000 men and 1,700 tanks. In the north, the attack would be conducted by von Kluger's Army Group Centre, with 332,000 men and 1,000 tanks. Facing them, the Soviet Central Front, commanded by General Rokossovsky, with 712,000 men and 1,800 tanks. In addition, more Soviet troops were gathered into a strategic reserve named the Steppe Front, under General Ivan Konyev. Rokossovsky's situation in the north was relatively strong. He knew the German tank assault would have to come from somewhere along a 90-kilometre gap in the forests. Vatutin's troops, however, were on the wide-open steppe. There was nothing to restrict the enemy's movement. They might attack anywhere. General Nikolai Vatutin was considered one of the Red Army's most talented commanders. His peasant origins and communist fervour made him a favourite of Joseph Stalin. He was a theoretician and highly respected by his adversaries. German generals nicknamed him the Grand Master. Vatutin would not survive the war. He was killed in an ambush by Ukrainian nationalists in February 1944. General Vatutin's Voronezh Front was about to face one of the most powerful military assaults in history. Vatutin, by nature an attacker, 
would be called on to conduct the greatest defensive battle of all time. As the Red Army prepared for battle, the engineers got to work. A dense minefield was laid around each strong point. The second and third lines weren't mined so heavily. Instead, they were assigned mobile engineer units in trucks and horse-drawn wagons. Their task was to lay minefields on the fly, in the very path of advancing enemy tanks. A German general wrote, the speed at which they could lay a minefield was astonishing. The Russians planted more than 30,000 mines in just two or three days. Meanwhile, Red Army recruits were being trained to overcome their fear of tanks. They were sent into trenches and run over by their own tanks. They called it ironing. They were also trained to throw anti-tank grenades and Molotov cocktails. And in the evening, they even read pamphlets on how to destroy German tanks. The Red Army scoured its artillery units for the most accurate gun layers. The best became anti-tank gunners with improved pay and rations. They trained hard until they could pick out the weak points of a tank and score a bullseye on the gun. Batteries of powerful 85mm anti-aircraft guns were assigned to key sectors, with orders only to engage enemy tanks. Four regiments were armed with German anti-tank guns captured at Stalingrad. The Red Army Air Force also received new anti-tank weapons. They had been attacking with one big 50-kilogram bomb, but it was difficult to score a direct hit on a moving target from the air. The new bomblets weighed only 1.5 kilograms, but could penetrate up to 100 millimetres of armour. Since tanks have much thinner armour on top, this was easily enough to knock out any German panzer. 48 bomblets were packed into one container. A Sturmovic ground attack aircraft could carry four such containers. It was enough to devastate an entire tank column along a path of 200 metres. As the wait for the German assault to begin dragged on, some Soviet commanders became increasingly uneasy. Batutin repeatedly urged the Stavka to attack first. We must seize the moment, he said. The enemy is not attacking, autumn is coming, and all our planning will have been in vain. Let us stop digging and launch our attack first. But the response was always the same, wait. Meanwhile, a German map was recovered, which accurately plotted all Soviet positions as spotted by their air reconnaissance. Many Soviet units were forced to move. This time, they paid more attention to camouflage from the air. For the third time, the Stavka issued a warning to the troops that the German attack was imminent. But by now, false alarms were beginning to play on the nerves of frontline troops. Lev Maliking, a scout with the 222nd Guards Rifle Regiment, wrote, It was clearly believed that the Germans would attack soon. All units in our division were on high alert. We were ordered by Division Intelligence to take a German prisoner for interrogation at any cost. That night, they captured a German engineer who'd been clearing mines in no man's land. Under interrogation, he began to speak freely. German troops have been put on full alert, he told them. They will begin to attack in the direction of Kursk on the 5th of July at 2 a.m. European time. 
there will be an additional assault from Belgorod. The hour was not far off. The Red Army planned a nasty surprise for the Germans. Just as they massed for the attack, the Soviets would hit them with a massive artillery bombardment. The night sky was lit up with the blast from hundreds of guns. Not all of the German assembly areas were guessed correctly, but the deluge of shells and rockets found many targets. Other German units found it impossible to advance into this wall of fire. Lieutenant Roshenko, navigator of an Ilyushin 4 bomber, recalled, from a long way off, we could see that something unimaginable had begun along the front line. Both sides were firing intensely. As soon as the Soviet guns fell silent, the air was filled with the scream of German shells. This barrage was intended to soften up Red Army defences ahead of the assault. The scout, Lev Maliking, remembered, the sound of explosions made us leap from our plank beds in our dugouts, grab our submachine guns and race into our trenches. Fire, smoke and falling earth were everywhere. The enemy bombardment lasted more than an hour. At last it ended, and the Hitlerites began their attack under the cover of smoke shells. Tank divisions, air fleets, infantry units, all the military might that had been assembled around Kursk over the course of several months was now set in motion. The largest tank engagement of all time and one of the greatest battles in history had begun. July 1943, the long-awaited German offensive at Kursk had begun. Radio-controlled tankettes led the way, sent ahead to clear paths through the Soviet minefields. Their heavy-toothed metal rollers detonated all the mines in their path. Others laid powerful explosive charges that could clear a large area with a single blast. These machines cleared the way for the Ferdinand tank destroyers, but it wasn't always easy to spot the safe lane across a field churned up by countless explosions. Many Ferdinands lost their way and were disabled by anti-tank mines. By the end of the first day, half of the mighty Ferdinands were out of action. Most had been immobilized by damage to their tracks and wheels. In the south, heavy Soviet shelling hampered German attempts to clear the minefields. Many Tigers and Panthers soon had their wheels and tracks shattered by anti-tank mines. The Germans also ran into 500 kilometers of anti-tank ditches. The ditches had to be collapsed by accurate dive bomber attacks before the tanks could pass. The famous German Blitzkrieg had been reduced to a crawl. German units became caught in a labyrinth of Soviet defences. As soon as they suppressed one strong point, they came under fire from its neighbour. General Friedrich von Melentin wrote, the Russians were excellent at camouflage. No minefield or anti-tank strongpoint was detected before the first tank was blown up by a mine or the first Russian anti-tank gun opened fire. However, German experience and firepower soon began to tell. They began to concentrate all their effort against a few narrow sectors of the front. German panzer units attacked in a V formation. Its tip was formed by the heavy Tiger tanks, which took out Soviet anti-tank guns at long range. Medium and light tanks followed. When the Germans had succeeded in smashing a hole through the defences, 
they rushed to exploit it. Army Group South was supported by almost 400 aircraft on the first day of the battle. They rained bombs onto the Soviet strongpoints. They also bombed minefields to clear lanes for the advancing panzers. It took 17 hours for the elite 2nd SS Panzer Corps to breach the first line of Soviet defences. General Vatutin responded by sending in Katakov's first tank army. Katakov recalled a report from one of his brigade commanders. Berda began his report. The enemy was attacking his position incessantly from 50 to 100 tanks at a time. Tigers and Panthers came first. Dealing with them is difficult, sir, he said. You shoot at them, but the shells only ricochet. So what's the outcome? Losses, terrible losses, sir, about 60% of the brigade. A Soviet T-34 tank had to get within 500 metres of a Tiger and then fire at its thin side armour. The German Tigers and Panthers, meanwhile, could penetrate the T-34's front armour from a range of two kilometres. The huge losses sustained by the first tank army forced Katakov to share his concerns with General Vatutin but there was no change of orders. As he prepared for another suicidal assault, the phone rang at his headquarters. It was Stalin. He asked Katakov to speak his mind about possible courses of action. Katakov proposed digging in the tanks and letting the enemy come into close range before opening fire. Stalin was silent for a while. All right, he said at last, you will stop the counterattack. Katakov's tanks took up defensive positions alongside the artillery and infantry. But when General Kravchenko's 5th Stalingrad Guards Tank Corps was threatened with encirclement, Colonel Nikiforov arrived at his headquarters with special orders from the army commander. He would shoot Kravchenko if he did not order an immediate counterattack. Kravchenko's counterattack ran straight into the heavy tanks of two SS Panzer divisions. With half of his vehicles destroyed, he was barely able to fight his way out of an encirclement with the remnants of his corps. Meanwhile, in the northern sector, General Rokossovsky also ordered an armoured counterattack. On the second morning of the battle, near the village of Olkovatka, General Rodin's 2nd Tank Army was ordered to attack. The counterattack failed to dislodge Modal's panzer divisions. Later in the day, they attacked once more through heavy thunderstorms. Advancing against powerful and accurate German gunnery, the Soviet tank divisions took horrific losses in men and machines. But they did manage to blunt Modal's advance. The second tank army went on the defensive. When a fresh German panzer division renewed the attack, it ran straight into the camouflaged Soviet tanks. The ruined train station at Ponnery became the focus of heavy fighting. The Germans gathered their surviving Ferdinand and Brumbar self-propelled guns into a task force and attempted to storm it. German units managed to get behind the Soviet troops holding the station. But now they found themselves in one of the Red Army's pre-prepared fire pockets. It was here that Sergeant Mikhail Fermin, a gun layer of the 159th Guards Artillery Regiment, was awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union for destroying seven tanks. He continued firing 
even when wounded. The fire pocket was a tactic used by Soviet anti-tank guns working together to lure German tanks into an ambush. Some guns would act as bait, opening fire at long range and drawing the enemy tanks towards them. Once in range, camouflaged anti-tank batteries on their flanks would open fire. At a range of 200 to 300 metres, there was a good chance of a kill. Modal's 9th Army had failed to achieve a breakthrough at either Olkavatka or Ponary. By the fifth day of the battle, the northern offensive was running out of steam. Rokossovsky had accomplished his task of exhausting the enemy. Now it was time to think of attack. On the telephone to Stalin and Zhukov, he was given the date, the 12th of July. While the enemy had been held in the north, in the south, the battle was entering its most critical phase. Here, the Germans had more room for manoeuvre across the open steppe. And despite heavy tank losses, they had broken through the first two Soviet defensive lines. The Red Army rushed reinforcements to the area of the enemy breakthrough. The Germans had 200 Panthers at the start of the battle. After five days of fighting, they were down to just 16. The new Soviet anti-tank aerial bombs were an unpleasant surprise for the Germans. Just one hit could destroy a tank. But the Waffen SS Panzer divisions leading the charge were experienced, determined and tactically skillful. Strong point by strong point, they fought their way into the heart of the Soviet defences. The breakthrough into open country appeared imminent. One Soviet operations report stated, the circumstances that allowed the enemy's tanks to advance were these. As our tanks and trucks retreated, they were pursued so closely by the enemy that it was impossible to lay anti-tank mines on the roads to hold them up. One communist youth member serving with the 287th Guards Rifle Regiment wrote later, on the night of the 11th of July, we reached the Oktyabrsky collective farm. We were told there will be a battle tomorrow. Dig trenches. They will be either your fortress or your grave. To prevent a German breakthrough, the Stavka used its strategic reserve to reinforce the Voronezh front. More than 400 tanks, hundreds of other vehicles and thousands of infantry were on the move through the arid heat of the Russian steppe. Boris Nazarov, the loader in a self-propelled gun, recalled, We were on the move all night and all the next day. We had all our hatch covers open, but it was still unbearably hot inside. The commander forbade us to lean out of the hatches, so inside we were practically naked. Ratutin planned to use these reserves to deliver his long-awaited counter-attack. General Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army was due to take up positions near the village of Prokhorovka. This was to be the base for its assault. But the 2nd SS Panzer Corps had already reached Prokhorovka. Here, they were poised to break through the last Soviet defences. They had only been held here by a miracle. As tanks of the SS Panzer Division Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler had rushed forward, they'd been hit by enfilading Soviet artillery fire from the far bank of the Puschel River. Concern about their exposed flanks would delay the Germans just long enough. The Leibstandarte Division took up defensive positions, waiting for the SS Division Tortenkopf to cross the Puschel and secure the flank.
Meanwhile, Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army was approaching Prokhorovka. The Soviet tanks maintained strict radio silence. Their approach remained unknown to the Germans. But when the sun rose, German air reconnaissance soon spotted the multitude of vehicles and alerted their own troops by shooting violet flares. The 5th Guards tank army was due to attack on a narrow front between the Pashel River and the railway. The front was further restricted by an impassable ravine. The Soviet tank brigades would need to form up in columns to attack through this narrow gap. Soviet tanks usually attacked en masse across a wide front. When an enemy gun fired, several tanks immediately answered back. Attacking on such a small frontage would be a severe handicap for the Soviets. But there was no hope of the orders being changed. Shortly after dawn, the 5th Guards tank army launched its assault. Helmut Becker, commanding a regiment of the SS Division Totenkopf, wrote, I saw clouds of dust on the horizon. Soon, out of these clouds, Russian tanks began to appear. The Russians have sent in their reserve, I said to our chief of staff, and realized that we had lost the Battle of Kursk. But events at Prokhorovka were far from a foregone conclusion. As the Soviet tanks rounded the wide ravine, they were funneled into a narrow channel where they made easy targets for the German gunners. Tank after tank was hit, bursting into flames or being torn apart in massive explosions. Tank commander Brukov remembered, tanks were ablaze everywhere. Powerful explosions sent five-ton turrets flying 20 meters into the air. Some explosions were so powerful that an entire tank was blown into a pile of scrap metal. As the tank battle raged around Prokhorovka, the thick black smoke from countless burning vehicles turned day into night. Soviet losses were terrifying, more than 300 tanks in a single day. In the pulverizing engagement, neither side emerged as a clear victor. But the implications for the Wehrmacht were obvious. Paul Hauser, commander of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, immediately began to withdraw from Prokhorovka. Operation Citadel had failed. There had been no breakthrough. That same day, two Soviet fronts launched an offensive against the northern face of the Kursk salient. The operation was codenamed Kutusov. The goal of the operation was to destroy German forces around Oriol, including Model's 9th Army, leading the German offensive. Powerful artillery bombardment signaled the start of the operation. It was so effective that the initial Soviet advance was almost unopposed. But as the advance continued, the Germans began to fight back. Model realized the threat. Units engaged in the Kursk offensive were hurriedly redeployed to reinforce his defenses. He directed the Luftwaffe to attack Soviet tank formations advancing from the north. The famous Stuka ace, Hans Ulrich Rudel, led the attack. He wrote, My aircraft was armed with anti-tank guns. Other Junkers armed with bombs followed me. I destroyed four tanks in the first attack. By that evening, my score was up to 12. To cover Modal's retreat, German pilots flew several sorties a day. 
Rudel Stuka was shot down near the town of Bolkov. He made a forced landing, but was back in the air in a fresh aircraft two hours later. The Soviets began to repel our airborne anti-tank attacks quite successfully, he wrote. This was because they learned to bring up their anti-aircraft guns alongside their lead tanks. Soviet fighters were also in action. It was over Kursk that Ivan Korzydob, the Soviet Union's top-scoring fighter ace, brought down his first enemy aircraft. Ivan Korzydob was a triple hero of the Soviet Union by the age of 25. He wasn't shot down once in the entire war. He flew 330 missions and brought down 64 enemy aircraft, including one ME-262 jet. It's rumoured that his victories included two American P-51 Mustangs, which had attacked his unfamiliar aircraft in the belief it was German. Meanwhile, down below, Soviet tank reserves had arrived to bolster the offensive. Tanker Nikolai Zheleznov was in the thick of the fighting. He recalled, the German defences on the outskirts of the village consisted of anti-tank guns and dug-in tanks. I destroyed two guns and one tank during this engagement. I shot at it twice and it went dead. It was due to our driver, not me, that we crushed the two guns. I just told him over the tank radio, Misha, to the right, a gun. After we ran over its carriage, I noticed another one about 10 metres away. Crush the other one too, or it will turn round and hit our stern. The Red Army failed to encircle the German troops around Oriol, but Modal was forced into retreat. Eventually, he was able to regroup and dig in at the Rojev line. By the 5th of August, the Red Army had mopped up the last pockets of German resistance in Oriol. Vatutin's assault against Army Group South took much longer to materialise. It was a full three weeks before the Voronezh Front had regathered sufficient strength. But on the 3rd of August, Operation Polkovodets Rumyantsev was finally launched towards Belgorod and Kharkov. The SS Panzer divisions had been redeployed to the Donetsk Basin. Therefore, the German line was considerably weakened. Achieving a rapid breakthrough, Katakov's 1st Tank Army and Rodmistrov's 5th Guards Tank Army advanced swiftly towards their objectives. On the third day of the offensive, Red Army forces liberated the city of Belgorod. On the 5th of August, the roar of guns was heard in Moscow. The salutes, the first to be fired in Russia's great patriotic war, honoured the liberators of Oriel and Belgorod. The Soviet troops now advanced on Kharkov. On the fourth day of the operation, lead units of Katakov's 1st Tank Army broke into the town of Bogodukov and crossed the Poltava-Kharkov railway branch. It was there that they were hit by von Manstein's counterattack. He had scrambled together all the reserves he could muster and thrown them into a desperate battle to hold Kharkov. The Soviet vanguard was forced to fall back to Bogodukov. Meanwhile, Konyev's step front was advancing directly on Kharkov. The Germans had turned the city into a fortress. A frontal attack would be disastrous. And so, 5th Guards Tank Army was ordered to make a flanking manoeuvre to threaten Kharkov's defenders with encirclement and force them to retreat. But now, Rotmistrov's old friends, the SS Panzer Divisions Das Reich and Tortenkopf, returned from the south and immediately attacked near Bogodukov. At one stage, General Rotmistrov received two contradictory orders. One from Vatutin, demanding he defend Bogodukov, another from Konyev, demanding his troops storm Kharkov. It triggered a heated discussion at Rotmistrov's headquarters, involving the army commander, his chief of staff, and the military council led by Major General Grishin. 
You have to come to some decision, sir, Grishin told Rotmestrov, to which he replied, I've decided to hold my positions until the situation is clear. But, sir, we could be put on trial and shot for this delay, Grishin said anxiously. If we leave our positions and the Germans capture Bogodukov, we will certainly be shot. It would expose the entire left flank of the Voronezh front to enemy attack. Fortunately for him, Rod Mistrov's decision proved to be the correct one. His army played a crucial part in repelling the German counterattack around Bogodukov. Soon, Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army was also able to support Konyev's troops by advancing on Kharkov from the west. The Germans' only line of retreat was in imminent danger of being cut off. Hitler demanded that Manstein hold Kharkov at all costs. This would mean the encirclement of the whole of Army Detachment Kempf. Manstein was not prepared to risk another Stalingrad. On the afternoon of the 22nd of August, Soviet air reconnaissance reported that the Germans were pulling out of Kharkov. Konyev launched an immediate assault. The city was liberated by noon the following day. It was a triumphant finale to the Red Army's great victory at Kursk. General Guderian wrote in his diary, with the failure of the Citadel Offensive, we suffered a decisive defeat. Needless to say, the Russians exploited their victory to the full. There would be no respite on the Eastern Front. From now on, the enemy was in undisputed possession of the initiative. Operation Citadel was the last large-scale German offensive in the East. Now the Wehrmacht began a long retreat. In their wake, they left a devastated country. Hundreds of Russian and Ukrainian villages were burnt to the ground. Crops were destroyed. Bridges and railway stations were blown up. Any villagers capable of work were shipped to Germany to be used as forced labor. The Soviet troops were marching to liberate Ukraine. Here, on the banks of the Dnieper River, the War of Liberation would begin. <laughs>